Hey, Renato, are you ready to give board operations the host? Yes, thank you. Done, sir. Thank you, sir. Supervisor Hans office checking in. We can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Kelly. Sorry. Did you want to test your video? Sure. Let's see. I see your that works. sign. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs>
Can I uh, do a video check for uh, Dr. Scorza? And Sierra. And Sierra, please. Uh, we, we can see you. Do you want to do a sound check? Yeah, thank you.
Good morning. This is a sound check for Abby Land. Yes, good morning. How are you? Doing, doing great. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Good morning. This is a sound check for Amy Bodick. Good morning. How are you? Hello, good morning, Amy. Doing great. Thank you very much. Um, Excuse me, Dr. Scorza, can you please test out your video? Uh, getting me, it's my letter. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, maybe it's gas. Is it F? Maybe gas? Let's try that. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Mr. John Sierra, would you mind testing out your video? Perfect. Video's on. Thank you. This is a sound check for Kim Lamori. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Is this Francisco? Yes, it is. Hi, Kim. Hi, Francisco. How are you? This is Kim. Great, great. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute you okay. back. Thank okay. Okay. So you you will come back on here and tell me when I need to speak, right? Correct. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Hello, good morning. This is a sound check for Beth Palmer. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, good morning, Beth. Hi. Okay, I'm going to go put you back on mute and then we'll call you when it's your time to speak. Okay. Thank you. I, thank you. This is a sound check for Kurt Florin. Can you hear me? Good morning, I'm here. Good morning, thank you. This is a sound check for the Spanish translation line. Good morning, this is the Spanish interpreter. Sound check is good, thank you. Great, thank you. Sound check for the AT&T moderator. Can you hear me? I hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. This is a sound check for Steve Berger. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Great, thank you.
Good morning, it looks like Scotty is beaming us all in slowly. And I've got feedback here, yeah, that's my fault. There. Good now? Excellent, good morning everyone and welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors being held remotely today, Tuesday, March 15th, 2022. We'll now take roll to confirm attendance. Supervisor Solis? Here. Supervisor Kuehl? Here. Supervisor Hahn? Here. Supervisor Barger? Here. Tisha Davenport, Chief Executive Officer? Present. Rodrigo Castro Silva, County Council? I'm here. Celia Zavala, Executive Officer of the Board? Here. Next, I hope you all will join me uh, in our Pledge of Allegiance. Colleague, please stand and place your hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you all. As indicated on the posted agenda, We'll be taking telephonic public comments separately for regular agenda items and for the public hearing items during today's meeting. Again, separately for the regular agenda items and for the public hearing items. The Executive Office of the Board received over 600 written comments for today's meeting, and as those written comments were received, all of them were available to the supervisor's staff for, their, for the supervisors for their consideration, consistent with the Brown Act requirements. We'll continue to receive public comments throughout the meeting, which will become part of the official record. Executive Officer, please call the agenda. Madam Chair. Uh, Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, yes, I just wanted to uh, ask uh, you to clarify for people that are testifying that, because to them it's all public hearing items, if you know what I mean, that the ones we mean by public hearing items are uh, items two, three, four, and five. Is, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, great. Thank well, I appreciate you so much. that clarification. Yes, that's correct. So, uh, Executive Officer, if you go ahead and call the agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Today's agenda will begin on page two, set matter one. Set matter one is a report by the Chief Executive Officer and appropriate department heads as necessary on the status of the American Rescue Plan funding and consideration of necessary action. This item will be held for discussion. On page three, public hearings, items two through six. On item six, Supervisor Kill requests that this item be continued to June 28, 2022, as indicated on the posted agenda. The remaining items would be held for hearing. On page six, consent calendar, Board of Supervisors, items seven through 29. On item seven, this includes an addition as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item nine, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be continued to April 5, 2022, this item relates to item 40. On item uh, 10, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be held. Also, this includes consideration of an amendment as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 13, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be held. On item 14, Supervisor Kiel requests that this item be held. Also, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 17, Supervisor Hahn requests that this item be held. Also, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 19, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 20, Supervisor Barger and Supervisor Hahn would like to revise their motion to update directive number two to authorize the Director of Mental Health to establish a countywide maximum allowance for therapeutic foster care. On item 24, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 26, Supervisor Solis requests that this item be held. On page 20, administrative matters, items 30 through 58. On item 30, Supervisor Kuehl requests that this item be held. 
On item 39, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be held. On item 40, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be continued to April 5, 2022. This item relates to item 9. On item 44, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be held. On item 45, Supervisor Barger requests her vote to be recorded as no. On page 34, this includes miscellaneous additions to the agenda, which were posted more than 72 hours in advance of the meeting as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 56A, Supervisor Barger requests that this item be held. On item 56B, Supervisor Solis requests that this item be held. On item 56D, Supervisor Mitchell is abstaining from the vote. On page 35, ordinance for introductions, items 59 through 61. On item 59, Supervisor Barger requests her vote to be recorded as no. This item relates to item 61. On item 61, Supervisor Barger requests her vote to be recorded as no. On page 36, separate matter. On page 37, special district agendas. This is the agenda for the sanitation district number 27 and the new Hall Ranch uh, Sanitation District. On page 38, this is, the Los this is the agenda for the Los Angeles County Development Authority. Item 1D is a recommendation to adopt a resolution authorizing and approving the issuance and sale of the Los Angeles County Development Authority General Revenue Bonds 2022 series on a tax exempt basis in an amount not to exceed 33 million to refinance lease revenue bonds that were previously issued to finance development, acquisition, and construction of the LACTA Headquarters Administrative Building and to finance certain capital improvements to the LACTA Headquarters Administrative Building. On page 39, this is the agenda for the Regional Park and Open Space District. On page 40, this is the agenda for the Regional Financing Authority. Item 1R is a recommendation to adopt a resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of the Regional Finance Authority Lease Revenue Ref Refunding Bonds Series 2022 Vermont Manchester Social Service Refunding Project located at 8300-8400 South Vermont Avenue in the City of Los Angeles on a tax-exempt basis with an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $70 million to refinance the bonds. The requests for continuances through 1R are before you. Thank you very much. Moved by Supervisor Barger and seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve these items, and such will be the order. On page 42, notices of closed session. That completes the reading of the agenda, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We'll now take public comments for all agenda items, excluding public hearing items two through six. Executive officer, please read the call-in information that was provided on the agenda and explain the speaking rules to those members of the public who are calling in to address the board. As indicated on the agenda, members of the public wishing to offer public comment should call 877-226-8163 and use participant code number 1336503. To repeat, please call 877-226-8163 and use participant code number 1336503. Do not call that number if you only want to listen to the meeting. To listen only, please call 877-873-8017 one seven and follow the instructions to members of the public calling in when it's your turn to speak please state your name and which agenda items you wish to speak on we will allocate 90 minutes for public comment on all of the regular items excluding public hearing items two through six you will have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more agenda items in addition, those who would like to address the board with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum total up to three minutes. We will continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the record. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. 
if you're not speaking on a topic or if we cannot tell if you're speaking on an agenda item, you will get one warning from county council or the chair. If you do not immediately or clearly get, off, get on topic or if you stray off topic again, you will forfeit the rest of your time and the chair will move to the next speaker. Please note that if you're also listening to the board meeting on a computer or speaker phone, you will need to turn down the volume on those devices as soon as the moderator calls on you. If you don't, do not turn down the volume, there will be an echo. Moderator, may we have the first speaker, please. As a reminder, to address the board, if you've not already done so, please press one then zero at this time. Do not press one and zero a second time or you will be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la Junta, si uno la ha hecho, presione 1 luego 0 en este momento. No presione 1 y luego 0 por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Our first participant will come from the line of Melissa Camacho Chung. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, this is Melissa Camacho Chung from the ACLU Southern California. I'll be speaking on agenda item 49 and general public comment. Today, the board will approve $199,000 to go to the family of Christopher Nash, who died at Century Regional Detention Facility in 2019. Sheriff's personnel put Mr. Nash into a detox cell when he arrived at CRDF. He did not eat and laid down on the floor of the cell. He was in medical distress, dying of a drug overdose, and yet custodial staff did not recognize or respond to the danger until it was too late. Mr. Nash should be alive today. Tragically, the root causes identified in his death are not being sufficiently addressed by the Sheriff's Department two years now after Mr. Nash's death. The Summary Corrective Action Plan says that two of the reasons Mr. Nash died were number one, deputies did not conduct their safety checks, and number two, a delay in recognizing Mr. Nash was in distress. In 2021, according to reporting by the OIG, 10 people who died in custody were discovered unresponsive during safety checks, and another 12 people who died were discovered unresponsive or already in the midst of emergency and medical emergency by custodial staff. How many of these deaths could have been prevented, like Mr. Nash's death, if custodial staff were not complacent in safety checks and were responsive to people's medical needs before they were found unresponsive or in full-blown medical emergencies. The jails are places of death. How many more payments will this county make to family members whose loved ones died because LASD could not be bothered with their care? This board must fully fund pretrial services so that people like Mr. Nash can receive substance abuse treatment pretrial instead of dying in our jails. Earlier this month, OIG also told this board that overcrowding and Sheriff Villanueva's dismantling of the discipline system are part of what is causing this crisis of death. What will this board do? This board must set a deadline for closing the central jail, not eventually, but by March, 2023. The board must also find a way to hold the sheriff accountable for failures of leadership and discipline for misconduct in the jail. Thank you very much. Thank you, next speaker, please. Next speaker will come from line of Eric Previn. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Thank you. Yes, I will uh, address several items and a general public comment. And then I'll have to call back, I guess, for the public hearings, but thank you. The, the, the other case, the Brian Pickett's kid uh, had excessive force used and were settling for $3.8 million. I mean, Jesus, and, and at 450000 to fight before that. So double it up and we're over $4 million. Very, very upsetting. Um, however, it is Women's History Month, and that is something that's worth celebrating. I want to thank the board for eventually, after I traipsed around the county, the Women's and Girls Initiative being recognized today, went to their meeting, went to every meeting I could think of to say, no, no, do not ship women who've been incarcerated, who've had run-ins with the law in Los Angeles to a public health hazard where Valley Fever ran around. I, so finally you stopped, thank you. But the other companion piece to that, when I was a fighter for criminal justice before they all got co-opted and promoted, you know, I'm really against the use of tasers. And I see that today you've got 150 tasers at $4,000 a taser. First of all, um, 
no disrespect to Arnie Berghoff or the gang over at England or Kanabi and Allen, but are you effing kidding me? That is a lot of money. And for devices that do not work. I don't know if you've read the Reuters and all the, there's been enormous literature about how Axon, our friends with the body cams, uh, sell these things, but they continue to promote death. What they do, for the record, and great idea to use them on young, strong people who will, they'll bounce off, they'll go crazy, and then they'll prime themselves for a shooting. This is the worst idea I've ever seen. And if you do, I'm just going to tell you, I will write about this one. If you do this, if you approve these tools of violence. They don't work. They don't. 50,000 volts into a human being. Uh, anybody listening? Or are you cheating among yourself? Terrible, terrible way to go. Don't do it. Don't do it. Okay. 18.7 million seems like a fair price to redo the sheriff's dock down at the Marina del Rey for the boats. But I just want to make sure that Caruso is paying his share. I noted that we gave him a kind of a grant because... Uh, Excuse me, your time has pandemic. expired. Next speaker, please. No, no, my general public come. I'm sorry? No, you're, you're cutting me off short, I believe. Next speaker, please. My apologies. Next, we go to the line of Kent Mendoza. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, hear yes me? we can. Please begin. Okay. Good morning. My name is Kent Mendoza. I'm with the anti recidivism Coalition. I'm here to speak in support of item 10 in opposition of item 56A and provide general public comment. Thank you, Supervisor Sheila Q and Holly Mitchell for motion 10, which will explore this thing in Camp Kilpatrick and Scott and Kirby as secure treatment facilities in LA County. I would just say that enough is enough. We must stop wasting time and start moving things forward. All of this is way overdue. Kids who should have been receiving care, support, and services that can start beginning to address their needs and their trauma and ultimately uh, create better, uh, and just their, their development are stuck in a room with no, no toilet and no programming at Bird Day in our juvenile home. We have worked so hard these past years, showing up to meetings, sharing a vulnerable stories of trauma, uh, not caring whether those stories can be used against us, and the county has invested resources in the process. It would be a shame if the, the county doesn't follow through on the promise that you made of care first, jails last. We shouldn't be investing in new jails. We shouldn't be trying to think about creating anything that is uh, relating to punishment or incarceration. We should move forward with this plan and begin to implement the many other components of due justice reimagined, such as infusing and piloting credible messages throughout all of the camps in LA County. As far as promotion 56A, the county must reject this plate whatsoever. When I saw these probation renderings and the presentations, how they wanted to make very day in our juvenile hall, it literally reminded me of the first day I was in Central Juvenile Hall when I first got locked up. You know, when I first entered the incarceration, incarceration in LA County, it looked just like that rendering presentation. And over time, because they started caught up, getting caught up and getting into many DOJ settlements, all this stuff happening, they go back into getting checked. It's just a cycle of repetitions of punishments, and we just got to reject this place. Uh, the bill should not allow this department to continue to drag this process and, and, and make DJJ within Barry J. and Iron Juvenile Hall. This place is literally the worst that you could ever think of. Just imagine being in, 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 in a jail cell for many hours and having to use the restroom and having to knock and then having to just use the card because you just cannot no longer hold. Or when you go to court, when they wake you up so early at 4 a.m. and they say, you know, you're shackled up from waist to the bottom, to, uh, all of your whole body, and you're put in a cage to go to court. And then, now you're in, in, in men's central jail uh, where you shouldn't even be. Why are we even putting kids in this process? So it's, you know, this is a dehumanizing place. Uh, it's, it's, it's disappointing that we're even thinking about making this place a, a, a any type of uh, place for young people. It has no possibility of uh, providing a, or it's, it's not a, a capable of providing uh, rich services for this population. It's not. It doesn't have the the, the, the physical uh, structure to even do this. It's very uh, confined. It's so small. There's no room for none of this stuff. You know, we want to really invest in young people. We need to be investing in the competencies and their growth and their development, and this requires a healthy environment, a healthy place where they can blossom and be reminded that they do have the potential to become the best versions of themselves. And when you look around in the Bird Jane Night of Juvenile Hall, and as a kid, 
I don't think about that when you're in Virginia. I don't think kids are thinking that they can become great lawyers, attorneys, educators, and great people that can do good things Excuse for their me. communities. Your time How has you expired. Think about Next speaker, please. Next to go to the line of Leah Zeller Ordez. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Thank you. Um, I'm speaking on item number 10, item number 56A, and general public comment. Good morning, supervisors. Uh, this is Leah Zeidler Dawes with UCLA Law's Criminal Justice Program. I am also a lifelong resident of District 5. I wanna thank Supervisors Mitchell and Kuehl for your motion that continues to uplift the vision for a care first, jails last approach in LA County. And that also continues to push forth the transformative and groundbreaking work of youth justice reimagined. Young people need to be sent to Kilpatrick immediately and a timeline for turning uh, Campus Scott into a secure youth treatment facility must begin. The youth who are waiting on us to agree on a plan have waited far too long to access care, support, and healing programs that will support their transition to successful adulthood. I am really disappointed that there is a competing motion from my district today that's rooted in nimbyism, fear, and racism. There is no reimagining Barry J. Barry J is a children's prison. The culture of that facility is punishment, shame, harm, and that cannot be transformed or reformed. You cannot transform a place where urine-soaked walls, OC spray, and treating young people like they aren't human beings is the status quo. The discussion of an appropriate SYTF site has gone on long enough. We need to stop listening to Santa Clarita residents. We've heard their arguments. No 707Bs in my community, even though Scott has historically housed youth with 707B offenses for long before this, quote, and I'm doing air quotes, my property values and other things that are demonizing children, these NIMBY arguments boil down to the resurrection of concepts of super predator youth that are outdated, historically inaccurate, and rooted in racism and fear. Please listen to the experts, the Youth Justice Workgroup, the JJRBG, the Probation Oversight Commission, the numerous consultants, and the youth who have been housed at Barry J. There have been numerous reports that have been produced that all say that Barry J is not suitable for young people. No to Barry J. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Next speaker will come from line of Wendelin Julian. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning, supervisors. This is Wendell and Julian, executive director of the Los Angeles County Probation Oversight Commission. I'm speaking today in favor of item 56C and on general public comment. 56C recommends a feasibility study to be conducted regarding the closure of Central Juvenile Hall. I'm speaking for myself today as the commission has not yet directly weighed in on this issue. However, the motion directly supports the goals of the commission. The Probation Oversight Commission was created as a result of the Probation Reform Implementation Team, the PRITS work that recommended 98 reform priorities passed by this board, which include shutting down older facilities, continuing to reduce the number of youth placed in facilities, the need for a complete overhaul of Central Juvenile Hall, and the need to replace our older facilities with alternatives set in communities, including smaller therapeutic settings with education and rehabilitation as their focus. Youth Justice Reimagined specifically incorporates this goal as well. In 2021, the commission completed a strategic operating plan that narrowed these recommendations to nine overall priorities to directly support this motion, to properly inspect juvenile halls and camps, and report the findings to this board and BSCC, and to continue to reduce the number of youth incarcerated in LA County. In 2021, the commission inspected Central. Commissioner's inspections noted significant concerns about the facility, the speed at which work orders are completed, concerns about a lack of programming. Commissioners reviewed 40 grievances. Most were marked granted, meaning the outcome was in the youth's favor, driving concern about services being denied and matters being mismanaged. Commissioners also noted that some units were in very poor condition, including observations of graffiti, paint chipping, plumbing and water damage issues, and mold. A technician on site confirmed moisture in, in walls and extensive damage that has existed for years. I support this motion as a move to, in the right direction for the county towards the goals of youth justice reimagined, a future where people are not incarcerated in jails but treated with the care they need. This motion reflects an opportunity to seize the moment. Thank you. 
Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Next speaker will come to line of Edith Macias. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, um, I'm speaking on item 10 in favor, 56 opposed, and general public comment, please. Um, hello, my name is Edith Macias, and I'm with the Arts for Healing and Justice Network and the U uh, Los Angeles Youth Uprising Coalition. I strongly support a future where all youth are free, supported, loved, and cared for, and a future where we no longer have to have these conversations to decide whether or not young people deserve to be free. They do, all of them. I'm here to state my support on agenda item 10, to use Kilpatrick and Scott as permanent secure youth track facilities because the report back by the probation oversight commissioners during their inspection of Barry J was absolutely horrible, a thing of nightmares. Young people shouldn't have to endure that abuse not shackles, not confinement, not hunger, not pepper spray, not unsanitary conditions. Board members, it really comes down to fighting with the oppressors or the oppressed, which is also why I'm here to state my absolute op opposition to item 56A. Lastly, I'd like to remind the board and everyone here that youth are redeemable, not disposable. I urge the board to support Youth Justice Reimagine, saying no to Barry J, so that we may see a future where young people are fully supported and free. Barry J has to go. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? As a reminder, to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press one, then zero at this time. Now press one and zero a second time, or you'll be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la Junta, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione 1 y luego 0 en este momento. No presione 1 y luego 0 por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Our next participant will come from line of Michael Webb. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Uh, good morning. My name is Michael Webb. I'm the city attorney for the city of Redondo Beach, and I'm here to speak in favor of item number 17 and general public comment. Uh, the CARES Act motion that uh, uh, the resolution that Supervisor Hahn and Barger um, have made is similar in concept to a pilot program in Redondo Beach. It is a program set up for those individuals suffering homelessness who have committed crimes. Our, our pilot program is focused at uh, bringing the um, justice system to the community in a very supportive, non-threatening way to an area where the unhoused individuals are already spending their time. The goal is to set those individuals up for success by removing the obstacles that prevent them from becoming housed. In my 30 years in the criminal justice system, it's the only time that I can remember where everyone's goals, the community, the unhoused individuals, prosecutors, defense attorneys, everyone involved, the goal is the same, getting the cases dismissed uh, upon uh, and getting the individuals permanently housed. It's important and it, it, it it works because of the partnership with the LA County Superior Court, the PDE, the Alternate Public Defender, Part Department of Mental Health, the Sheriff's Office who provides security, multi-housing navigation uh, navigators from various um, different programs. With Supervisor Han's support, this program has expanded to other areas of LA such as Long Beach, Torrance, and uh, Hermosa Beach. The CARES Act could provide a framework that could um, potentially be even more successful, but it will be very important that there is adequate resources. There needs to be more mental health resources, more drug addiction resources, and the details will be crucial. And that's why I love the motion that Supervisor Hahn Barger made in that. Excuse me, you your time has expired. Support. 
Next speaker, please. Okay. Uh, next to go the line of Roy Humphreys. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. I'll address items uh, 1048 and 58 and uh, general public comment. And as to uh, jails, jails properly run and funded uh, are a good thing and necessary thing for our society. And uh, that they have been, the criminal justice system in Los Angeles County has been criminally uh, underfunded uh, and poorly run for uh, decades. And uh, the uh, uh, supervisors of the uh, uh, Leroy Baca stage should have gone to federal penitentiary with him on that uh, issue there. And uh, I'm glad to, that you still see that uh, jails are in the system. And I've told the supervisors, you must separate the jails from the sheriff. Otherwise, you have a never-ending scenario and it will never get better. And tearing down men's jail without a, a substitute uh, aspect is criminal negligence. Uh, further, uh, we go to uh, the item of uh, uh, general comment. And Supervisor Solis, last night, uh, Ryan Serrano of your office and James Yang of uh, Public Works were made aware for the second time in three months that you have failed to secure the radar enforcement certifications for our streets and neighborhoods in Roland Heights, as noted by the CHP representative for the second time, and last night it was most explicit. You and Supervisor Hahn are responsible for this wrongful endangerment of all who travel in and through Roland Heights and should be held criminally liable for this negligence of duty of foreseeable wrongful death, dismemberment, and reckless endangerment. Of course, we, the constituents, will pay for the justified lawsuits for same. Midterms cannot come soon enough. We don't need to build another million dollar dog park, and we don't need to build another $2.5 million skateboard park. We need to cure the fundamentals. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next to go the line of Marsha McLean. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, good morning. I would like to address agenda item number 10 and public comment, please. I am Councilwoman Marsha McLean, and I have actively been listening in and speaking during the many meetings held to discuss the sites best suited for juvenile justice. And if you truly and sincerely care about what's best for the young people and their families, you will opt for the fastest, safest, and most cost-effective solution. That solution is reimagining Barry J. Nidar, which reflects the goals and intent of the county in investing in true reformative re rehabilitation programming and treatment. B.J. Nidor is recommended by your own probation department that you supposedly trust to advise you. Nidor is located near the I-5 freeway, Highway 14, Interstate 210, and Metrolink commuter trains, all of which are accessible to county staff, visiting families, and partner agencies. In conclusion, do what's best and safest for the young people you wish to rehabilitate. A dilapidated and unsafe camp, Scott, is not viable. And now for public comment. Um, I want to give a little history about Santa Clarita. Um, Santa Clarita, in cooperation with law enforcement and the courts, is committed to helping our youth stay out of the justice system. We have spent many, many dollars in programs to do that. We have a juvenile court system here, which is which um, the peers uh, decide what to do with, with offenders to keep them out of the system. Um, this business about us being NIMBY is shameful and uncalled for. And please don't let that buzzword um, color your decisions on what's best for rehabilitating our young people and keeping them safe. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we'll go to the line of Alexia Sina. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. 
you may begin. Good morning, my name is Alexia Sina. I'm with the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. I live in District 5 and I'm here to, today to speak in opposition of agenda item number 56A and in support of item number 10 to designate Campus Kilpatrick and Campus Scott as a permanent secured youth track facilities. I wanna thank these supervisors for bringing forward another important motion that continues to pave the way for a care first jails last approach in LA County. As someone, as someone who was previously incarcerated and someone who works very closely to people who were held in Barry J, it's no place to house youth. It's an unsafe, harmful facility for these youth and does not allow them to receive the rehabilitation and programming they deserve. The longer the county waits, youth will continue to be kept away from receiving the support that is crucial to their development and reentry journey. The county has continued to delay young people's hope and redemption. It's time we stop demonizing the lives of these young people and trapping them in Barry J when it's very transparent that it has continued to be rejected as an option. It's not and will never be a suitable option for a secure youth track facility. This is a jail-like facility and I hope that the Board of Supervisors will keep their promise of moving forward and investing in youth justice reimagined, not jail. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we have the next speaker, please. Next, we'll go to the line of Lynn Plembeck. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today. And whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Lynn Plembeck, Santa Clarita Organization for Planning and the Environment, agenda items 32 and 33, and public comment. Um, this project would approve a 37-unit project that are multi-million dollar homes. There's no affordable uh, housing in this project and yet you are going to destroy a mountain lion corridor and a um, location where a mountain lion was sighted. Mountain lions received protected status while they're being considered for endangered species status. You cannot do this with an NMD and an amended MND that wasn't even circulated to the public. You claim that the mitigation that will protect the mountain lions is that you will not have any construction within 500 feet of an active den during breeding season. That's not adequate to protect the mountain lion or allow the mountain lion to get to water sources or to migrate through this area. You are spending, we are spending $87 million to do an overcrossing for the mountain lions, and yet you're gonna allow destruction of their den for a 37 unit multi-million dollar house project. This is unconscionable. Please look at this, please ask that a focused EIR on the mountain lion, which was just recently discovered just last August at in this site. Please ask that uh, a focused EIR be um, provided for this so the community can weigh in and the Department of Fish and Wildlife can weigh in on the adequacy of that mitigation. It's not adequate, um, please. Um, the other thing I would like to say on public comment is I'm very disturbed by your process that you claim that you're going to review all the public comments and yet comments submitted to you in the, are not in the correspondence file. I brought this up I think a month ago. I don't understand how you can be understanding what the public is saying to you when uh, nothing is posted in the correspondence file. I, I've received numerous emails that people indeed um, uploaded in, uh, their comments to the, the correspondence file but they are not there. And uh, when there is an attachment, the attachment is Excuse often me? not uploaded. They, Your time has so expired. Thank you very much. May we have the next speaker, please? Next, we'll go to the line of Eduardo Mundo. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Eduardo Mundo. I will be addressing uh, motions 10, 56A and 56B and general public. I am retired probation 30 years and for most of my life, including uh, currently I reside in the first district. Um, 32 years ago, um, early in my career as a probation officer, this body comprised of five males at the time, none of which resided in a claustral impacted area, presided over the opening of Camp Challenger. It was built and built as a um, modern facility, state of the art. We know that over the years, it was basically a fiasco and has been in and out of news 
stories for its harmful impact on not just the community, but staff and the youth. Um, Supervisor Q and Mitchell co-authoring Motion 10 are demonstrating exceptional leadership and courage in ensuring that history is not repeated. There is a huge difference in how a institution operates when it is built for caring or built for harm. And Barry J. Nodoff is built for harm and it is beyond my imagination that anybody would consider a motion that suggests we try it again and reimagine Barry Nardoff. The architecture itself, if you put walls around people, whether the kids living in them or the staff working them, all it does is perpetuate and insulate a harmful culture. It is time to end this. I do not wanna be here 90 years old on the phone addressing the next body, the next board configuration and reminding them that they had an opportunity 30 years ago to end this. I strongly, strongly support motion 10. I strongly, strongly um, oppose motion 56A. Um, it is to, to, to even imagine 56A, you have to be a resident of an area that is not impacted. You have to be insulated somewhere nestled in the hills and never have the chance to understand the impact. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next we go to the line of Zoe Rawson. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning, Zoe Rawson with Arts for Healing and Justice Network and LA's Uprising. I'm here to speak uh, in support of 10 and opposition of 56A and for public general public comment. Um, I am somebody that truly, truly cares about youth and communities. And the reason I have expertise to share on this is because um, I'm privileged to work with them very closely and I have been for 25 years now. Mm -hmm. um, I also study public safety, I study healing, I study accountability, I study youth development. I must be authentic in order to build trust with young people and communities that are experiencing these harms. So I have expertise to speak on this. Um, I've witnessed the harm. I've walked through the harm with others. The path to healing and accountability is to respond to harm with repair. This is how healthy growth and development happens. This is how we achieve public safety. What actually takes place on a daily basis for these young people is harm, 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 harm. They're born into harm. And the community and the county has not taken responsibility for that harm. Instead, we send them to an institution of harm, systemic harm. As a community, we're responding to harm with more harm. The young people are shouldering that burden of our decision to do that throughout their lifetime. It's more harm than many of us can even imagine surviving. And, and folks that speak to them being at night or have not witnessed that because there is no way that they would advocate for this. It affects them too. There is no accountability and repair in these institutions. There is no accountability and repair how, for how we have harmed them. The path to public safety is not harm, 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 harm. It's harm, repair, harm, repair harm, repair. The path is no tonight or I'm asking the community to care for young people. This is the task before us. This is the decision. As a person who witnesses these harms, who saw young people in shackles just last week, shackles that I would not see if I didn't work in this field shackles that I've only seen in pictures used during slavery. As someone who has professional training and personal experience and has also witnessed repair, healing and transformation, I've seen it happen. 
The path is no to NIDOR. I truly care about these youth. I am moved by what Kent shares and what his experiences were. Excuse me? The Your path time has expired. And we have the next speaker, please. Is no to NIDOR. Next, we'll go to the line of Lauren Waste. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. I'm speaking to items 10 and 56A. Good morning, Chair Mitchell and members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Lorene West and I am the mayor of the city of Santa Cruz. On behalf of the city, I want to express my opposition to item 10 and express our support for Barry J. Nidorf to serve juvenile serious offenders. As item 10 recommends, Camp Scott, I would like to express that the dilapidated conditions, historical use and the closure of Camp Scott since March, 2020 offers very little, if any of the necessary amenities and infrastructure needed to adequately protect and rehabilitate, rehabilitate serious juvenile offenders. Additionally, the Board of Supervisors should defer any action on this motion until a CEQA analysis can be completed, including the environmental analysis of alternative sites. Furthermore, it would be prudent of you to act upon the recommendations made by the subject matter experts with your, within your own probation department and designate Barry J. Nidoff to serve juvenile serious offenders. We have prepared to do a forensic analysis of this in the entire process. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we have the next speaker, please. Next, we'll go to the line of Doug Howard. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning. My name is Doug Halbert, and I have the privilege of serving the people of Long Beach as its city prosecutor. I'm calling in today to lend my support to item number 17, which will help create care courts in Los Angeles County. Although the details have not been worked out yet, this is clearly a move in the right direction because it will provide additional tools and resources uh, to help some people who are suffering from specified mental illnesses. If we do this right, care courts will reduce the need for criminal prosecution. This will result in better care for those who need it, reduce the cost uh, for taxpayers, and it will make our community safer. By creating uh, care courts and directing county staff to engage in the process of initiating this new program, the county will be well positioned to maximize the benefits that I believe care courts will bring. Finally, the city of Long Beach has a, a long and strong working relationship with the county. Examples include the very successful law enforcement assisted diversion pilot program, as well as the homeless court program started recently by Janice Hahn. I believe care courts will be another example of how cities can partner with the county to improve the lives of our residents in a compassionate way Excuse me. That treats people with Your time has expired. while addressing their underlying needs. May we have Thank the next you. speaker, please? Next, we'll go to the line of Minor X. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. No, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Minor with the Arts for Hearing and Justice Network and uh, Los Angeles Youth Uprising Coalition. I'm here to speak on agenda item number 10 in favor of um agenda number item 10 and oppose on 56a i just you know want to start off by saying thank you to um supervisor mitchell and q uh for this motion and you know um i think you know uh, you you heard enough you know um like mary j has to go with it you know as a youth you know that's been through both these systems like i i can tell you that kilpatrick can work into making you know these kids more successful i myself was there and uh, i can tell you that as soon as i walked in me and the other and the other kids that walked in at the same time um you know we we said out loud like what like what is this place um it did not look nothing like a prison you know and and i feel like that's the goal you know to not um put kids in facilities that make them think that 
um, prison it pretty much is the way to go. You know, we need to change the looks of these facilities and hopefully, you know, impact the youth in a, in a good way, you know? And I just want to say that Barry J is not the way to go. Um, I myself, when I was there, I was always facing um, the compound and I never had a chance to think about how my life would be if I ever got resources or the support that I needed. So when I would look at the compound, I would just think that that was my next my next place, um, you know? So Barry J is not a good way, um, like the other gentleman said before me, um, you know, if you're strongly support for the 6A is because you've never been like in a position where, you know, like you, um, uh, I forgot what he said, but you know, um, he said something that I really, you know, I really like, you know, like, so yeah. So I just want to say that and yeah, not a, not a night off. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Next to go the line of Aline Saylor. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, good morning. Are you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please begin. Hello. Okay, thank you. I'm here to call on items 69 and 61. The amendment for administration and personal amendment. Um, I'm here to oppose those items. It is in regards of the vaccination compliance for a vaccine that is, it's not a vaccine. It's merely a treatment at this point. And it has been proven that it's not safe and effective. The county keeps ignoring natural immunity. And this rule, it's also about registration with Fulgent. I know, personally know, a few vaccinated individuals who have not submitted their information into Fulgen and who have been suspended from their work five, two different occasions for five days. This violates the federal law and the state law and the LA City Charter Law and the LA City Employee Handbook. We have to move with the science. The CDC is already recognizing natural immunity we have to defend our public servants. They work during the pandemic when there was no vaccine available. Pfizer has released because of judge order about 10,000 pages on their research. Within the first three months, over 1,200 people died due to the vaccine. We need to protect our employees. We need to base our policies on common sense. It is unfair to those employees who already had COVID to ask them to submit themselves to a vaccination that it's not safe for everyone. There are studies out there that also prove that there is a chance of having one in a thousand adverse reaction after infection and then if you get vaccination. These two measures are to take away the power of those like Alex Villanueva in order to punish people. Excuse me? Gave Your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Thank you. Next, we're going to go to the line of Deanna Swanson. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yeah, hi, my name is Deanna Swanson. I'm opposing item 10, um, Camp Scott. Um, I would like to address the, the few people that have spoken um, about the problems with Barry J. I am a Santa Clarita resident. I was a former teacher in Santa Clarita. I believe that if there are issues within that housing development right now for these juveniles, why is it not been corrected? Why do you have ju a juvenile programs that is not effective, that has so many issues that has not been corrected? instead of starting a new one somewhere else. I think you fixed what's broken already. Uh, number two, as a former teacher, I would like to ask the County Board of Supervisors if they are aware how many elementary schools, how many high schools and how many junior highs are within five miles of Camp Scott? How many new homes and how many uh, homes are currently right there that would be affected if there were to be a, a situation? You are talking about Helping the youth, I believe you should be helping the youth, but you also have to think about the youth that are affected that are in schools 
Excuse me. Within a close Your proximity time has expired. May we have the next speaker, Thank please? Thank you. Next, we'll go to the line of Gigi Vangane. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, good morning. My name is Gigi. I'm a social worker with the City of Long Beach, the City Prosecutor's Office, and I work on our homeless court program. I'm um, here today in support of item number 17, um, the care court pro, uh, proposed framework for that. Um, basically, so what I want to share, in addition to our success with having a partnership with the county and the court system and getting the folks connected to services here in Long Beach, I also have personal experience as a conservator for a relative, and I believe that the care court program um, would be able to fill a gap because as someone who I know who um, it can take often up to you know, 10, 15 years to get someone on conservatorship, this proposal, I believe, would fill that gap for individuals who um, do have a mental health issue and they need help getting the services, but their family members may not know how to navigate those services um, and they may not meet the extensive criteria to be placed on conservatorship. So I believe that um, this would allow um, not only LA County, but the entire state of California to increase the mental health resources for the community and give uh, family members and clinicians additional tools to be able to help um, some of our most vulnerable populations. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Next, we'll go to the line of Melinda Kakani. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today. Whether you're addressed on general public comment, you may begin. Hi, this is Melinda Kakani from Children's Defense Fund, California. I'm speaking in support of item 10, an absolute opposition to items 39 and 56A, and general public comment. Just as a recap, last July, Supervisors Kuehl and Mitchell attempted to ensure that our young people didn't languish in Barry J for longer than necessary. Barry J, the same place that still uses OC spray despite a directive from this board to stop, the same place that was the subject of litigation by the DOJ, because of the harm young people endured while incarcerated there, the same place that was deemed unsuitable for the confinement of youth by the Board of State and Community Corrections. The remaining three board members chose politics over the humanity of these kids. Yes, kids, even if they're 18, even when they reach 25, even if they've committed murder. Here we are again, eight months later, asking the board to do the right thing, asking the board, or at least the majority of you, to pick redemption, to pick hope, to pick healing over fear-mongering. Thank you, Supervisors Mitchell and Kuehl, for your consistent commitment to youth justice reimagined. Beyond just motions with progressive language, but by engaging with community and seeing these young people as people beyond their worst mistakes, capable of healing from their trauma and full of potential despite system design, systems designed to oppress and marginalize and further harm them. This idea, Supervisor Barger, that Barry J can be reimagined by flooding hundreds of millions of dollars into it is a complete joke. It's a prison, not just by way of the structure, but by the culture. And there isn't a single young person who's experienced that space who would say otherwise. The culture prepares young people not for a bright future filled with opportunity, with love, no. It is a culture that is rooted in control and punishment. It reads trauma, hate, fear, and your billion dollar investment won't change that. Perhaps it will impede your constituents, which is clearly your primary goal, because if it wasn't, you would have spent time engaging your constituents in what they can do to build community, not break it, to understand youth justice reimagined, not manipulate it, to care for all young people, not fear them but instead you stoked their fear. And what I find most comical is your belief that somehow probation is the expert in what these young people need. In case you forgot, you voted yes on a motion to ultimately defund and dismantle juvenile probation because it is a system that is fundamentally flawed. And this isn't a dig on individual POs who care for kids in a positive way. It's a dig on an institution that doesn't allow good probation officers to, do, to be their best. It's a dig on an institution that equates young people with their worst acts an institution that supports denying young people blankets and the right to use restrooms as a form of punishment. It's an institution that uses the Hope Center as solitary confinement for up to 14 days, we recently heard. Weird how the institution that caused so much harm can suddenly turn into experts overnight. Sounds like more politicking to me, and enough is enough. You and your constituents have forgotten that we belong to one another. We must care for one another. We must see and believe in the humanity in one another. So here's your reminder to lead with love. Be better, do better, because the harm you've caused by allowing this racist rhetoric about who these young people are and what they deserve is almost unforgivable. Also, in what world, without any sort of data analysis and proper showing for the need, do we authorize probation to purchase 150 tasers? How is that the answer? In the words of Eric Priven, don't do it. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Kenzo Sohu. 
please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please begin. Hello? Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kenzo Soe. I'm a residential advisor and policy advocate with the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. Thank you, Supervisor Kill, and I am in support of item 10 for creating an atmosphere for a care first and jail last motion. Um, and I'll be giving general public comment. Um, too many youth suffer from lack of better living and, and no opportunity to successfully re-enter society. We must have a greater want to, to remove young people out of Barry J. I am against item 56A due to the misunderstanding of what kind of support system currently incarcerated youth deserve. As a young man that lived inside the juvenile inside every juvenile hall, camp, and DJJ for six years, I endured mental trauma throughout my time in the juvenile justice system. Showing the youth we do not trust them and continue to input punishment in their lives will only break them down. In other words, we're not implementing philanthropy towards youth development. There is no way we can sit here and agree to invest into a facility that you have never been to. Let's be real. We want to help our youth, but we also want to keep them in jail. That doesn't make no sense. Let's be, what are we really fighting for? for? For everyone that is formerly incarcerated knows the pain and trauma you endure behind bars. Where is the investment for career readiness programs, job opportunities, to build income, to learn, learning to become successful and independent individuals? At the end of the day, we must realize that when you inside of a facility, you have no privacy. I can't even take a shower in private. I can't use the restroom in private. And we can't sit here and, tell, and, and think about we need to keep the youth in Barry J with that as a better, a better environment for our youth when you ain't never been there. You don't really understand because of the, who we really listening to here. We're worried about building our community, but then there's so many people that don't really want to build our community. Thank you, Supervisor, for your time. God bless y'all and everybody that was against what I said. God bless you, too. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Carrie Ann Hines. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning, my name is Carrie Ann Farrell Hines. I'm calling supporting item number 13, supporting item number 20 and general public comment. Regarding item number 13, I serve as the president of the Los Angeles County Commission for Women. I'd like to thank Chair Mitchell for this item commemorating March as Women's History Month, notably on Equal Pay Day and the entire Board of Supervisors for your consistent support of the LACCW's annual Women of the Year recognition of women exhibiting leadership in our communities and our annual event commemorating Women's History Month, which benefits the LACCW's Resilient Scholarship Program this year to be celebrated on May 9th. On item number 20, I'm the Director of Government and Strategic Affairs for Vista Del Mar Child and Family Services, which provides a trauma responsive continuum of services to empower youth families in Southern California to lead fulfilling lives and expressing support of the motion to increase the countywide maximum allowance rate. First, thank you supervisors for your work, responding to the workforce and access to care challenges that the mental health care system of care is experiencing. Second, and thank you supervisor Catherine Barger and supervisor Janice Hahn today for authoring this specific motion. The combination of the COVID public health crisis and magnification of existing economic inequities brought increased need for mental health services. And we responded by making necessary investments to become the essential workers that could provide those mental health services. However, the enduring nature of the pandemic and increased costs has taken a toll, and we are experiencing higher staff vacancy rates with compensation and burnout from intensified workload cited as the most common reasons for departure. So we meet this motion with enthusiasm and optimism as an investment in reinforcing and sustaining the mental health services system of care. The increased CMA rates will enable us to meet community needs by offering competitive salaries to low vacancies, increasing access to services, easing caseloads, and decreasing the risk of burnout. Increasing the rates will enable us to meet community needs more effectively. Finally, Instituting a policy of adjusting the CMA rates upwards annually to account for inflation and continuously increasing operating costs will provide agencies with the necessary consistency and predictability to expand programming to meet additional needs as they arise in the communities that we serve. These rate increases will enable agencies like ours to utilize our resources to retain those dedicated individuals we have trained and it is a positive first step to rebuilding the mental health workforce and system of care. 
It is an investment in our partnership with DMH, ensuring our collective ability to meet the needs of an individual and communities across LA County. Thank you so much for your support of our work and the commitment to all of our the work that we do. And I urge you to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Tamita Bochamp. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. I'm speaking on agenda item number 10, supplemental, uh, supplemental agenda item number 10, 56A and public comment. Good morning, Chairman Mitchell and County Board of Supervisors. I'd like to thank the supervisors for their careful consideration of all the SYTF locations and suggesting to utilize the Campus Kilpatrick and Camp Scott, as well as the Dorothy Kirby Center as the permanent locations for juvenile offenders. However, I do believe Supervisor Barger's motion to utilize the Barry J. Nidorf location would be best suited for the youth as they are already set up for all avenues of the needs of the youth, education, physical and mental health care, outdoor recreation, and most importantly, it is centrally located for the family and friends of those housed there, as well as the employees that would be working at that location and not just the probation officers, but teachers, counselors, and other important and necessary staff. I know there were countless hours spent reading through hundreds of pages of documentation and reports provided by all of the different participating committees and departments. I do believe your decision today will be taking the necessary first steps towards reimagining the juvenile justice system for the youth based on the Campus Kilpatrick LA model. But please keep in mind the objectives and criteria that was set forth by Cal DOJ, which then became the foundation for the JJRBG. How many millions of tax dollars will be saved by utilizing the Barry J. Nyerdorf location because it can accommodate both short and long-term housing? How many millions of taxpayer dollars will be saved by choosing the Barry J. Nyerdorf location because it is already centrally located? How many millions of taxpayers' dollars would be saved because special concessions would not be necessary for transporting the families and friends of the youth housed there for visitation? I kindly ask that you not consider the youth not just consider the youth involved, but all of the Los Angeles County residents when making your final decision. I thank you for your time and attentiveness. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is, is Anthony Robles. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address some general public comment, you may begin. Hello, my name is Anthony Robles, the Justice Coalition and the LA Youth Uprising Coalition, and I'm speaking on items 10, um, 56A, and general public comment. Um, yeah, I'm commenting in support of um, item 10, um, and would like to give thanks to Supervisors uh, Kuehl and Mitchell for bringing um, bringing important uh, motions to the table that actually help us help young people of this county not get trapped inside of horrendous conditions, um, adult-like prison settings that set, you set them up uh, to, for prison. Like uh, I believe it was Kent earlier saying that no young people in Barry J are thinking they could be lawyers, they're thinking they could be something successful in their communities after all the experiences that, that happen in um, places like this. Um, and calling against uh, item 56A, um, Barry J needs to be shut down. Um, the JJRBG, Probation Oversight Commission, all of the, the county's own bodies and own um, own people have have analyzed this place and have said that this place is not suitable for young people at all. So. It, to even think about having young people in there, even currently having young people in there, and to think about putting more young people in there, the county is even shooting itself in the foot, setting itself up for future uh, lawsuits and other abuses um, towards young people. Uh, so even if you weren't worried about the young people, your own county is probably going to take a hit from putting young people in there. Just looking at all the abuses that go on, the lawsuits that come out, um, and everything else, it's just it's a, it's a waste, even just from an economic standpoint, um, even outside of the, the human level and the humanity level, it's just an economic, uh, it's a dumb economic move in itself and just setting yourselves up for failure. Um, so, and just for my general public comment, um, I would just say um, to keep implementing, make sure that there's implementation of the YJR, um, make sure it's fully funded 
And so we can make sure that places like Barry J no longer exist and at youth development centers and other holistic, uh, healthy alternatives, and not even alternatives, just an entirely new way forward for young people in our county moves forward. We have the largest county in the country with the largest amount of young people in the country, but we have no youth development infrastructure. Instead, we have juvenile probation, we have Barry J, we have youth prisons here, and we incarcerate the most young people in the country. Um, and we have a $1 billion probation budget with over 50% of it going to juvenile probation. Well, youth development hardly gets anything. So I don't think there's any excuses for the YJR implementation of the Department of Youth Development to not get the full funding and the, administra the administrative infrastructure and everything it needs to make sure that young people in LA County can thrive, um, be successful, Excuse and not me? have fears of Your being time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Eden Madrid. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, good morning. Can you guys hear me? Yes, please begin. Hi, can you guys hear me? Uh, good morning. My name is Eddie Madrid. Uh, I'm here today on behalf of Layup and ARC and my community to strongly support agenda on item 10 and in full opposition of uh, agenda, uh, agenda item F uh, 56A. Uh, I would like to start this comment by saying that we are now moving forward in the pursuit of creating change for our youth, let alone for our communities, as we continue to fail the, all these kids by housing them in the compound. I've been home for almost 14 years after serving a crime for a, after serving, um, I've been home 14 years after serving all these years for a crime that I committed at 16. And from my personal lived experience, I can honestly say that being housed in the compound caused me mental health trauma that I'm still experiencing today at 30 years old. I left in 2008. I left the compound in 2008 at a time when I was only a kid needing proper resources. Instead, I was given a 14-year sentence and I was tried as an adult and left to survive in a prison system that negatively impacted my life. And today as an adult, I, today as an adult, I know that if my parents were sitting on the board of supervisors, I would have never gone to the compound and I would have never been sentenced to serve half of my jail sentence in prison. My community is tired of this unfair system where you want to see the change and not only hear about it, but we want to see it and we want to see the implementation of it. We want, we, and as we go back and forth over these matters, we have to keep in mind that these kids are still there and we're okay with that. You know, that, that's not what we want. Our, our future needs to like really be put into perspective and we need to hold everybody accountable. Not only the probation part, but everybody that has a, that has an input in this, please close Barry J, uh, BJ, Barry J night off and create change, not damage. If our Board of Supervisors and our county is okay with housing these children in these dehumanizing facilities, then we must ask ourselves, what is our future leading to? Because it's not care first. We need to invest in our county, but we also need to invest in our future so that the county can provide our youth that proper future. It's not okay to be in a jail cell at two in the morning trying to be, and the cop is asleep and he's not gonna let you out. And in the morning, you have an altercation with them because of it, and then you're, looked as a bad guy because you were trying to pee. That's not fair. That's, that's unfair. And if treating housing our kids like dogs in a cage without a pisser is okay with you, then, then where are our voices? Are you guys going to hear us? Are you guys not going to hear us? Like, what's going on? Like, please hold accountability. Let every Excuse me? You free Your time account. has expired. Create. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Kevin Acebo. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today, whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Honorable Chair and Supervisors, good morning. My name is Kevin Acebo, a member of the LA County Mental Health Commission from the 4th District, speaking in favor of item 17 and general comment. Uh, many thanks to Supervisor Hahn and Barger for making sure that LA County plays a role in developing the CARE Court model. This board, long before CARE Court was introduced, has worked hard and continues to work to deal with a mental health system that wasn't working. It has addressed a mental health crisis where people with severe mental illness and or substance abuse disorders too often cycled through our jails, hospitals, and the streets. Care Court is another opportunity for Los Angeles County to get people the help they need. Care Court is a new framework to provide individuals with mental health and substance abuse disorders the care and services they need to get healthy. It provides individuals with a clinically appropriate community-based and court-ordered care plan consisting of culturally and linguistically competent county mental health and substance abuse disorder treatment centers. 
LA County can expand on its efforts to provide a people-centered model of prevention and support for our most vulnerable unhoused neighbors. Care Court, along with other board initiatives, is a community approach to preventing justice involvement by connecting people to services over a 24-month period. The Mental Health Commission in the, in the coming months align, align with the board's fiscal year 22-23 budget process looks forward to providing input on the county's local care court plan and related mental health issues that strengthens the board's past and ongoing efforts to provide a stable community-based continuum of behavioral health care for our residents and addressing outstanding ethnic and geographic disparities, bed shortages, need for emergency response teams, and community-based integrated services within the, within the county's mental health delivery system. Thank you for your time. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Gary Dipple. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address some general public comment. You may begin. Thank you. This is Terry Dipple, Executive Director of the Las Virginas Malibu Council of Governments, uh, speaking regarding item 10. The Las Virginas Malibu Council of Governments voted today to oppose item 10 and support the substitute motion by Supervisor Barker to maintain the juvenile youth at uh, Barry J. Nydorf Center. Thank you very much. Our next participant is Patricia Costellas. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Patricia Costellas and LCSW and the CEO of the Guidance Center. We are a nonprofit county contracted mental health provider serving children and families in districts two and four. Notably, we are the only provider serving children on Catalina Island. I'm calling to provide general public comment on item 20, a motion to increase the county-wide maximum allowance rate. I wanna thank the Board of Supervisors for their attention to the workforce and access to care crisis facing the mental health system. Special thanks to Supervisors Barger and Hahn for authoring the motion. Contract agencies like the Guidance Center serve the lowest income and highest need children in the county, predominantly from disenfranchised families of color. Our staff do the hardest level clinical work, full service partnership and specialized foster care, going into homes, parks, and schools in communities blighted by violence and poverty. Currently, an astounding 22% of guidance center children report having thoughts of suicide at intake. The county rate system has always meant that contract providers are forced to pay their staff 20 to $30,000 less than clinicians make at directly operated clinics, school districts, and Kaiser, although we serve the hardest clients in the riskiest settings. We have a two-tiered system where services provided to our most troubled and lowest income children, mostly children of color, are valued at a lower rate. Excuse Despite me. Despite this, Your prior time has to expired. the pandemic, we were May able we have the next speaker, barely please? to hold our own. Our next participant is Dean Walrath. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, I'm commenting on items number 32 and 33 and also general public comment. I'm Dean Walrath, um, Executive Director and Attorney from Advocates for the Environment, which is a local public interest law firm. I represent a community organization called Advocating responsible communities that opposes the project. Um, I've sent three letters with CEQA and other legal issues, and I won't repeat those here, but there's several significant defects in the mitigated negative declaration for this project. For many reasons, including climate change, preservation of open space, um, uh, increased wildfires, we shouldn't be building in open space outside the existing urban boundaries, um, especially in a very high fire severity zone like the one where the project is proposed to be built. Um, the project also, it's on what's now open space, important open space. It in interferes with wildlife corridors um, like 
as shown by, for example, the mountain lion who was captured on a camera, a video camera in the middle of the night, right, right in the middle of an important junction of streets on the project site. Um, obviously, building the project is going to close off that corridor um, and interfere with not only just mountain lions, but other um, wildlife that would go through there. So a project smack in the middle of open space um, it, it will also interfere with like open space plans and utilization of it out there. It's right next to a county SEA uh, and will interfere with trails that are planned and existing in the area. Wildfires are really important uh, about the project. There's a single point of ingress and egress. Uh, what the project does is it extends a small street called Magnolia Lane, which is already crowded, and a bottleneck for evacuation if there's a fire or other disaster. So um, adding 37 houses there just increases that, um, you know, the traffic that would have to go out in a, in a bottleneck in this high fire zone. Uh, so there's with wildfire, there's not only that issue of evacuation, but there's increased risk to the houses in the project. They're in this high fire zone. We shouldn't be building there at all, um, but we uh, haven't really put a policy in place to prevent that. But there's also an increased likelihood when you put a project in a place like that of causing fires in the area. Finally, on general public comment, the recent IPCC reports from Working Group 1 and 2, um, the most came out in December and February, and these are the, the most authoritative sources of current information uh, from scientists all over the world about climate change. And they say there are going to be increased droughts, floods, and fires. And we're already seeing that. We're living Excuse in me. a world of Your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Sophia Christo. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Sophia Christo and I'm a youth advocate with the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. I'm here today to speak in opposition of item 56A and support item 10. As a youth who was incarcerated at the young age of 14, going back and forth from Barry J to LP for adult court hearings, I know firsthand that the compound is no place for our youth. It never was and never will be, and honestly, at this point, it shouldn't even be part of the conversation. Care first, jails last, doesn't align with what the compound is in any way, shape, or form. We seek a new secure track for our youth that will actually provide them with the tools and care they need, not a facility that looks like a prison embedded with trauma and horror stories of youth that have been there and some that still are. Changing the name and making a few slight adjustments doesn't change what the compound represents or the negative impact it has on our youth. Nothing about the compound supports our youth or our vision of youth justice reimagined. Barry J should have never been an option to consider for our, secure, for our secure track in the first place and definitely shouldn't be today. Therefore, I am in strong support of item 10 by Supervisors Mitchell and Kuehl to designate Camp Kilpatrick and Camp Scott as the permanent secure youth track. It is time for the board to take action and make sure these youths that have been stuck in the compound don't remain there for a second longer. I urge the board to fully and truly support our youth by saying no to Barry J. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Anthony Arenas. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Hi, I'd like to speak on item 10, item 39 and general comment. <clears throat> For item 10, uh, this motion supports the vision of the youth justice reimagined, which has called for ending youth incarceration and prioritizing trauma responsive care, access to community-based resources and services, and restorative justice practices to ensure that every young person in LA receives care instead of facing punishment. This motion represents an important step towards achieving this vision by shifting the focus towards restorative justice and trauma-informed care for young people who need it the most. So the board must approve the locations of these secure facilities as soon as possible. Every day that young people experience jails instead of care is dangerous for their safety and well-being, and the board cannot waste more time while real lives are at stake. Uh, for item 39, less lethal does not mean tasers are not dangerous. Tasers have the potential to severely injure their victims. Tasers cause abrasions, lacerations, strained organs and joints, excruciating pain, 
uh, and heart and cardiac problems, among others. Tasers are dangerous weapons, and probation has no reason to use them. Tasers are also capable of killing people, particularly people with a history of psychiatric disease or those who have had certain drugs in their system. Historically, police and probation have disproportionately used tasers and other weapons against these groups of people. That means we are armoring, arming probation with weapons that can still carry a significant risk of death for the people whom tasers are the most often deployed against. And for general comment, I want to uh, speak on the OIG report and in custody death. As a reminder, in 2021, 55 people died in LA County Jail more than one person per week, more than any year since at least 2005. COVID is not the sole reason for the skyrocketing death rate. Eight people died of COVID in 2021. If we remove these eight people from the death toll, 47 would still be the highest number of in custody deaths since at least 2005. The jails are deadly and deaths are only increasing under this board's watch. Earlier this month, the board of the, of the inspector general told this board that overcrowding and Sheriff Villanueva's dismantling of the discipline system are part of what's causing this crisis. What will this board do? The board must set a deadline for closing Men's Central Jail, not eventually, but by March 2023. The board must find a way to hold the sheriff accountable for failures of leadership and discipline for misconduct in the jails. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Topher Mathers. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, I'm speaking on agenda item number 14. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Topher Mathers, and I'm the Policy Specialist with Active Sandra Valley. Active TV supports Supervisor Cool and Mitchell's call for the county to explore equitable ways to promote building electrification in unincorporated areas of LA County. While cars and trucks continue to be the main contributor of harmful emissions, by 2031, gas burning appliances will surpass that of uh, passenger cars in this regard. The health consequences of gas appliances and homes is well documented. By some estimates, building electrification in California will result in elimination of nearly 90 million metric tons of CO2 emissions through 2045. That is like taking 20 million cars off the road. An equity focused building decarbonization ordinance. We'll get the county one step closer to ensuring cleaner air for all residents. We urge the board to pass this important ordinance today. Thank you for your leadership on this issue. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Next, we'll go to the line of Jeff Barber. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. Just dropped. Next, we're going to go to the line of Rolando Chavez. These dates, regular agenda items you wish to address today, and whether you're going to address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Rolando Chavez, and I am with Ultimate Health Services. I am speaking on item number 24 today. On behalf of Ultimate Health Services, I want to thank the Board of Supervisors, especially Supervisors Lee and Kuehl, on bringing this forward. For part, for the, and for the partnership and support to federally qualified health centers as we continue to protect our communities from the impact of COVID-19. Ultimate supports the motion requesting CMS reimbursement for federally qualified health centers, uh, COVID-19 vaccination administration. FGCs have played a vital role in protecting our communities and have hosted a wide range of vaccination clinics in our hardest to reach re uh, residents and our hardest to hit communities. At Ultimate, we have provided over 250,000 shots in our clinics, in our pay sites, and our communities to keep our patients safe. We thank the Board of Supervisors for their support to, a, to an expedient release of the building guidance to, uh, so critical funding and resources can begin flowing to our safety net providers. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Next, we'll go to the line of Joy Ori. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, I'm Joy Ori, and we'll address items 10, 56A, and general public comment. I support youth justice reimagined and implementing the LA model in a practical manner. I echo the testimony of Lorraine West and Marcia McLean, elected officials of the city of Santa Clarita. Opposition to Nidorf is well organized, but is focused on past practices and experiences. 
The probation department's proposal brings change for the better to Barry J as the most suitable permanent SYTF. Barry J can be reimagined into a high quality facility. There's plenty of space for capacity needs without impacting current services. It's centrally located, which is critical for DJJ families and service providers. Proceeding with Barry J is the most fiscally prudent solution. Considering Camp Scott does not make sense, the location just is not suitable. Reimagined, Scott can provide a capacity of only 40. That's just 27% of what is needed. Why spend more taxpayer dollars on facilities that don't meet capacity requirements? The probation department and their service providers are the experts in the field of care. Listen to them, support their proposal. How can the county pass up the opportunity to do what is right for both the incarcerated population's rehabilitation and the community at large? It's time to embrace the potential of change and move forward in a responsible manner. I prevail upon each of you to vote no on item 10 as the county would be ignoring its own site selection process and its own probation experts. Vote yes on item 56. The focus is not about what Barry J has been. The focus is about what Barry J can become to serve the full complement of the DJJ population. Make it happen. There is no acceptable excuse or rationalization not to. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Next will go to the line of Crystal Jones. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Greetings, Board of Supervisors. Thank you. I will be addressing item number 13, proclaiming Women's History Month for year 2022. I, Crystal Jones, a woman-owned Black parent consumer, entrepreneur, ECE educator, and new advocate, standing in agreement, the need to uplift the value in honor of the recommendation for uplifting and highlighting the urgency and the needed equity for women-owned Black businesses, minority businesses, and to be guided, invested in, supported, and heard. Proclaiming and uplifting our desire and need to not only survive, but to re be revived, to thrive with strong partnerships, sharing available resources, and enhancing equity and justice. Thank you in advance for helping us in advance to advocate together and thrive forward. I support this proclamation and honor of all women owned businesses wanting to thrive and not only barely survive, fighting on purpose barriers. Thank Excuse you. Excuse me, your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Next, we'll go to the line of Dan Kegel. He states regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, I am uh, in, speaking in support of agenda item 14 and also I have a public general public comment. I'm a resident of the city of LA and I support Supervisor Cool's motion for equitable decarbonization of buildings. Every new building with a natural gas line makes climate change worse. Happily, the state's analysis at localenergycodes.com, which I highly recommend, shows that all electric multifamily buildings are cheaper to build and have lower utility bills. This is a case where we can have our cake and eat it too. New electric, new all electric homes are cleaner, safer, and cheaper. When the county updates its building codes on January 1st as required by state law, it should include a reach code that requires or strongly encourages all electric construction. Now to general comment. As a new coronavirus wave is hitting uh, Europe and several US cities, it is vital that the county maintain its vaccination requirement for county employees and begin requiring boosters. The vaccine is safe and effective and reduces risk of infection, hospitalization, and death significantly, even for people who have already recovered from coronavirus. Dropping the vaccination requirement would put the county's workforce at risk during a likely future wave of coronavirus here in Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. 
Next, we'll go to the line of Chris Wilson. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Chris Wilson, representing the Los Angeles County Board of, I'm sorry, Los Angeles County Business Federation. I'll be speaking in support of item number 19. I first want to thank Supervisors Barger and Hans for bringing this important item forward. Uh, as you know, during these uncharted times, it is important more than ever to help and provide relief to small businesses and property owners who have been negatively impacted by the pandemic-related emergency orders. BizFed believes that the severity of the COVID-19 pandemic requires equitable treatment of responsible property owners to sustain investments in maintaining and expanding affordable housing stock. Once again, thank you, Supervisors, for bringing this important motion forward, and we look forward to working with you on similar and related items. Thank you so much. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Next, we'll go to the line of Michael Zellman. Please state the regular agenda items you wish to address today and whether you're addressing in general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. My name is Dr. Michael Zellman. I'm a licensed psychologist and vice president of Inky Health Services, a nonprofit DMH mental health provider. I'm calling in support of item 20 and to provide general public comment. Thank you to the entire Board of Supervisors for your ongoing support of the community mental health system and your attention to the behavioral health workforce and access to care challenges faced by county mental health system. Thank you, Supervisor Barber and Supervisor Janice Hahn for authoring the motion. Two years after the pandemic started, healthcare providers are still grappling with staffing shortages that have only gotten worse with new variants. Across the county and country, healthcare workers suffering from stress and burnout are leaving their roles, while some quit to take higher paying positions in other industries. Since last summer, we have lost over 25% of our workforce and are projected to serve a thousand fewer clients than in the previous fiscal year. Countywide, behavioral health staffing is down 20 to 30 percent. Positions that we could fill in a few weeks before the pandemic are unfilled for eight months or more. With increased cost of gas, food, and housing, many people will struggle to be able to afford to live on a clean mental health paycheck. Our system is no longer competitive in the labor market because our hands are tied by the many years where there were no increases in the CMA. The CMA has not kept pace with inflation and the cost of running a business in California. 75% of the agency budgets go to staffing. We want to retain and recruit a dedicated and caring workforce to serve our community needs. We need an increase to our rates to be able to pay competitive wages. <coughs> Excuse me, 65% of the agencies serving DMH are operating off of credit lines. My agency is lean with historic rates well below the CMA. With increased cost related to the pandemic and inflation, including technology investments for telehealth to expand access to care, and the concurrent workforce losses I mentioned, we're operating well over the current CMA using credit lines to operate. A 10.4% increase this fiscal year next means keeping clients open, behavioral health staff employed, communities served. To remain financially viable, let alone competitive, we need annual increases to the CMA to account for the continuous increased cost of operating. If we want healthy communities, we need a fiscally healthy system of care and a stable, dedicated workforce. This increase is a positive step to rebuild the county behavioral health system. I look forward to our ongoing partnership with DMH to meet the needs of individuals, families, and communities across Los Angeles County. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Next, we'll go to the line of Tammy Mitsumori Miller. Please state the regular agenda items you wish to address today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. My name is Tammy Mitsumori Miller, and I am the Chief Clinical Officer at Foothill Family Service, a mental health and social service agency serving the communities of Service Area 3. I am providing general public comment on item 20, a motion to increase the countywide maximum allowance rates. I would like to start by first expressing my appreciation to Supervisor Barger and Supervisor Hahn for authoring this motion and my gratitude to the entire Board of Supervisors for their ongoing support and response to the many challenges we face within the mental health service delivery system at this time. This fiscal year has been particularly challenging with the pandemic continuing to wreak havoc across our communities. Foothill, like other agencies, has faced critical workforce shortages and rising costs of doing business that has strained our agency's infrastructure and ability to serve clients at a time when the need for mental health services is growing exponentially. Our staff are stretched thin and feeling the overwhelming burden of trying to serve the many clients who come to us daily seeking services, even while we remain short-staffed. The 10.4% CMA increase will provide Foothill with the ability to recruit qualified staff at competitive salaries, to retain our existing highly trained clinicians, and ensure we are readily available for those who need our help. 
as stated in the motion with the cost of delivering mental health services expected to continue to climb having a process to adjust the CMA rates up annually will be key to ensuring our system of care remains strong and intact to meet the ongoing mental health needs of our communities. We look forward to partnering with DMH to maintain a care system that provides timely, accessible, quality care Excuse to me. many residents. Your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Next we go to the line of Blythe Mailing. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and what you'll address on general public comment. Hi, good morning. My name is Blythe Cotton Malling, and I'm the Chief Development Officer for Wayfinder Family Services. I'm calling in to provide public comment on item number 20, a motion to increase the countywide maximum allowance rates. We are a human service organization that provides services to foster youth and children and youth with disabilities. Our life-changing services include critically needed mental health services. I'd like to thank the entire Board of Supervisors for your attention and response to the workforce and access to care challenges currently faced by the mental health system of care. I would like to commend Supervisor Berger and Supervisor Hahn for authoring this motion. The stresses of the pandemic has, have caused more acute mental health needs in children and parents in our programs. As you all know, the pandemic has caused a nationwide mental health crisis for children and youth and the impacts are especially bad for low-income Black and Latino children who make up most of Wayfinder's clients. Our families have experienced losses of jobs and income, rising food and housing insecurity, and sustained chronic stress, which severely impacts children's mental health. At the same time, we, like most other providers, are experiencing workforce challenges and rising costs of doing business. The impact of the 10.4% CMA rate increase will help Wayfinder. It'll help restore our ability to meet community needs, rebuild the mental health workforce and system of care, and compensate us for the current cost of providing care. Excuse me. It's critical. Your time has expired. Yeah. May we have the next Thank speaker, please? Thank you so please? much. Thank you. Next, we'll go to the line of Davina Kahangdash. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today. And what you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning. My name is Davina Krangadosh. I work for Jewish Family Service LA, the oldest and one of the largest social service organizations in LA. I'm calling today to provide public comment on item number 20, a motion to increase the countywide maximum allowance rate. I would like to thank the entire Board of Supervisors for their attention and response to the workforce and access to care challenges currently faced by the mental health system of care. I would also like to thank Supervisor Barger and Supervisor Hahn for authoring this motion. JFS LA's mental health services provide comprehensive outpatient mental health care to low income individuals. In 2021, our mental health staff has served over 400 individuals each month. Services are provided in person in our offices, in clients' homes and via telehealth. Our multilingual clinical team of social workers, MFTs, and psychiatrists speak Russian, Farsi, and Spanish. In this last physical year, we have seen challenges in access to care and workforce. Increasing the countywide maximum allowance rate will support our agency's ability to meet our community's needs. It will help rebuild the mental health workforce and system of care and compensate the agency for the current cost of providing care. Excuse Adjusting me, the CMA your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Thank you. Next, we'll go to the line of Alfred Reza. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, supervisors. This is Alfred Reza, a longtime resident of Los Angeles County. I'm addressing my disfavor of agenda items number 59 and 61 with general comments. Addressing agenda item number 61 first, correct me if I'm wrong, but this ordinance for introduction amending county code title five expressly delegating the board of supervisors authority to the director of personnel who sits over 110,000 county employees and her subordinates to whom she delegates this authority to discipline county employees over non-compliance of the COVID-19 vaccination policy is a little late. 
This agenda item 59, these agenda items 59 and 61 are equivalent to an admission from the Board of Supervisors that the board never expressly delegated their authority under the COVID-19 mandate as required by law. And therefore, the hundreds or perhaps thousands of county employee disciplines to date have been unlawful. This has opened up the county to significant liability, possibly in the hundreds of millions of dollars over violations of individual rights under the California Constitution explicit right to privacy and California labor laws. This is not fixable by agenda items 59 or 61. Of course, the same logic applies to agenda items 59 for those who are appointed to the positions in the unclassified service. The Board of Supervisors to this present day continue to not have properly delegated their authority. Let me repeat, they have not properly delegated their authority to anyone at the county under this policy. Therefore, these county employee discipline actions under COVID-19 vaccination policy are unlawful and remain unlawful to date. I urge you to reconsider your position on this matter and reverse all previous disciplines and put a halt to future county employee disciplines under the COVID-19 vaccination policy, which stands to affect over 18,000 county employees who have declined compliance to this dangerous uh, policy and continue to expose the county to significant legal and financial liability. I urge you to vote down agenda items number 59 and 61. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Next, we'll go to the line of Nicole Brown. Please state the regular agenda items you wish to address today, and whether you're addressing on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, good morning. I'd like to um, address item 1056A in general public comment. Um, good morning, uh, Board of Supervisors. My name is Nicole Brown. I'm the Policy Manager at the Urban Peace Institute and part of the Los Angeles Youth Uprising Coalition. I want to start by expressing my support for Agenda Item 10 and thank Supervisors Mitchell and Kuehl for your continued leadership and your continued support of the vision of Youth Justice Reimagined. This issue we have been dealing with around the closure of DJJ really for the better part of a year. Um, and last July, Supervisors Barger, Hahn, and Solis voted to continue to extend the process. They asked for more time. And well, you got that more time. The JJRBG did all the work you asked for again. And the consultants did the work. And Barry J. Nidorf was ruled unfeasible for a permanent SYTF. What was supposed to be two months has now been eight months, despite the fact that that day Kilpatrick was designated the temporary SYTF and youth continue to languish in the compound, to, uh, which is very harmful for them. We need to make a decision. The decision cannot be Barry J. And we need to move forward with our efforts and our attention to quality programming for these young people. This includes credible messengers in the camps and halls to make more safe and positive environments. And on item 56A, I'm here to express my adamant um, disapproval um, of this item um, and say forever no to Barry J. For the course of this year, we have had to say this over and over again. And because of the absolute obstructionism of the probation union and NIMBYs from places like Santa Clarita, who are full of misconceptions about these young people and their families, we are here to say this again. Forever no to Barry J. So, so many other bodies and experts have said this. The consultants you hired, DLR, ruled it unfeasible. The JJRBG ruled it unfeasible as a permanent SYTS. The Department of Justice and the BSCC have ruled it unfit for the, uh, for the confinement of young people. And the Probation Oversight Commission heard horrible reports and endorsed item 10 um, because of we heard about lockdowns for 23 hours a day. We heard of young women being denied basic access to hygiene when they're on their menstruation cycle. We heard of maggots in the food. This is against everything that you all say that you stand for. And um, the idea of being able to reimagine Barry J is really just nonsensical, honestly. It's a co-opting of language and I find it insulting to all the people who have been fighting for decades to change and fix the harms of our criminal justice system and mass incarceration. Um, furthermore, I believe that, and I have looked 
extensively at probation's budget and the county budgeting cycle, I believe that will cost even more to try to, quote, reimagine Barry J. And, Thank you. Um, Your time has expired. And Colleagues, uh, we've exceeded 90 minutes, and so our time for public comments has ended. We want to thank uh, everyone who called in to speak. If you are unable to provide your comments, you may submit written comments as indicated on the agenda, and we'll continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the record. And to the member of the public who called in, acknowledging this was your second call with regard to the portal, I know that staff in the executive office spoke to you last time to make sure that you are following the appropriate process in terms of getting your public comment submitted. Uh, we are continuing to work on that. Again, it doesn't upload instantaneously. It takes a while once you submit it um, for staff to be able to navigate through all of the emails and get them uploaded into our public portal. So it's not instant, um, but we are aware. We hope that staff communicated with you in terms of the appropriate way to get your documents uploaded. But We've been in communication, and thank you for your comment. Executive officer, please indicate the agenda item numbers on which we will be voting. Thank you, Madam Chair. The following items are before you. 7 and 8, 11 and 12, 15 and 16, 19, 20 as revised, 21 through 25, 27 through 29, 31 through 38, 41 through 43, 45 with Supervisor Barger voting no, 46 through 55, 56 C, 56D with Supervisor Mitchell abstaining from the vote, 56 E and 56 F, 59 with Supervisor Barger voting no, 60, 61 with Supervisor Barger voting no, 62, SD1, 1, 1D and 2D, 1P and 1R. Moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Supervisor Solis to approve these items. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Before we take public comment on the public hearing items, the executive officer will read the short title of each public hearing item. Executive officer, please swear in those who plan to testify before the board on public hearing items. For those who plan to testify before the board on the public hearing items, please be prepared to be sworn in. In the testimony you may give before this board, you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Item two is a hearing on the annexation of tentative subdivision territory located in the city of La Mirada to County Lighting District Maintaining Maintenance District 10045A and County Lighting District Landscaping and Lighting Act-1 and a single lot territory, territories located in the unincorporated areas of South Whittier and La Crescenta to the County Lighting Maintenance, Di Maintenance District 1687. A written departmental statement was provided and no correspondence was received. Item three is a hearing on the wheat abatement and the brush clearance referees report to abate hazardous brush, dry grass, weeds, rubbish, illegal dumping, and combustible growth or flammable vegetation on designated improved and unimproved properties in the county. No departmental statement was provided and no correspondence was received. Hearing item four is a hearing on project number 2020-003127 to authorize the proposed Florence Firestone Transit Oriented District specific plan, specified plan located in the unincorporated community of Florence Firestone, which incorporates changes to the land use, zoning, and development standards centered around the Slauson, Florence, and Firestone Rail Stations. A written departmental statement was provi provided and correspondence was received. 
Item five is a hearing on appeal of a project number 87058 to relocate four of the 13 lots from phase five to phase four and associated modification of the building pad sizes, location, grading, and adjustment of lot lines located at 26885 Mulholland Highway in the unincorporated community of Santa Monica Mountains, North Area within the Malibu Zone District. A written departmental statement was provided and correspondent was received. The appellant, Kim Lamore, will be given two minutes. Ms. Lamore, please begin. Honorable Supervisors, I'm Kim Lamore, President of the Los Virginas Homeowners Federation of the Santa Monica Mountains. We appealed this project because it is an old subdivision tract map approved more than 34 years ago that by today's protected standards and the subsequent implementation of our LCP and the North Area Plan would be prohibited in its entirety. These view shed destructive mega mansions on a scenic highway with a long and controversial history are now located directly across from and surrounded by visitors serving spectacular public parklands. Determining what is fact versus fiction has been a real hardship for the public from the onset as evidenced by changing rationale and lack of information. For example, it was approved on the basis of saving 78 trees, which has now shifted to saving just 14 trees. How does that happen from one approval body to another? Wasn't it approved under a false pretense then? No organization anywhere has spent more time fighting to protect trees than the Federation, believe me. But in our 50 year experience, developers with approved projects don't ask for changes to benefit trees, the public or the view shed. They ask for changes primarily to benefit themselves. And it only became evident yesterday that the applicant is asking to transfer these four lots from highly regulated coastal jurisdiction to the North area, but the North area plan will not apply. Instead, the county's old general plan will that was enforced in 1988. To recap, he is asking to go from a current requirement of having to obtain four coastal development permits to permitting under a 1988 county general plan with no comparison and no analysis. The Federation is grateful to the concern, Conservancy for garnering conservation easements for the vacated lots. It is a step in the right direction, but to prevent the precedent setting significant impacts this creates, we respectfully ask the board to simply add the following conditions. Think it up to the LCP and limit building site area to 10,000 square feet. Moving development rights from coastal into the NAP is a requested change and therefore should be subject to NAP regulations. Identify and tag the oak trees that are be, to be protected in perpetuity, perpetuity as previously conditioned. Excuse Thank me, Ms. Lamarck, your time has Thank expired. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lamori. We'll now hear from the applicant, Beth Palmer. Ms. Palmer, you'll be given two minutes. Please begin. Hi, I'm Beth. Hello, I'm Beth. I just want to make a few quick points. Phase five has five lots, all of which are bisected by the coastal zone. None are entirely in coastal. Under County Code Section 2244810G, if a lot straddles a coastal zone, as these do, a CDP is only required for those portions actually within the coastal zone. Three of the four lots moving into phase four already have their building pad areas outside of coastal, so a CDP is not required for the houses on these three lots, even in their current configuration. The lots are simply being made smaller. The one lot moving into phase four that has its building pad in coastal sits on the knoll. The amendment moves the house off the knoll and away from oaks. We agree to the conservation easement proposed by the Conservancy to protect the Nolan Oaks in perpetuity. Also, because this one building pad would have been in coastal, we agree to a height limit for this house of 25 feet, even in phase four. To address the concern that we're increasing development, for each of the five lots in the original phase five, whether they stay in phase five or move to phase four, we agree to limit the building size, not including equestrian facilities, to less than 10,000 square feet for each of those lots. We also agree to the agricultural easement proposed by the Conservancy. This amendment reduces the size of six lots, the four original phase five lots moving to phase four, plus two lots in phase four, which become smaller to accommodate the phase five lot moving off the knoll. The one lot that becomes larger will have both conservation and agricultural easements recording on it. The amendment also reduces grading and protects views. This amendment has been fully vetted by the county. 
In addition to being approved by a hearing officer and planning commission, it was before the subdivision committee made up of planning, public works, health, fire, and parks and rec. Each department reviewed and cleared the amendment for hearing. All of the homeowners in the project have sent in letters of support in earlier hearings and asked that we again indicate their request as well as ours, that you deny the appeal and uphold the planning commission approval with conditions as discussed. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now take public comment on the public hearing items that we've just heard the executive officer read in, items two through six only. Public hearing items two through six only at this time. Executive officer, please read the call-in information that was also provided on the agenda and explain the speaking rules to those members of the public who are calling in to address the board. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Please note that the time for public comment for regular agenda item has ended. We will only hear public hearing testimony at this time. As indicated on the agenda, members of the public wishing to offer public comment on public hearing items two through six should call 877-692-8955 and use participant code number 443-3663. To repeat, please call 877-692-8955 and use participant code number 443-3663. Do not call that number if you only want to listen to the meeting. To listen only, please call 877-873-8017 and follow the instructions. To members of the public calling in for the public hearing items 2 through 6, when it's your turn to speak, please state your name. We will allocate a total of five minutes for public hearing testimony. Each person will have one minute for one public hearing item or two minutes for two or more public hearing items. We will continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the record. When speaking on the public hearing items two through six, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you're not speaking on a topic, or if we cannot tell if you're speaking on a public hearing item, you will get one warning from county council or the chair. If you do not immediately or clearly get on topic, or if you stray off topic again, you will forfeit the rest of your time and the chair will move to the next speaker. Please note that if you're also listening to the board meeting on a computer or speaker phone, you will need to turn down the volume on those devices as soon as the moderator calls on you. If you do not turn down the volume, there will be an echo. Again, please note that the time for public comment for regular items has ended. We will hear public hearing items two through six at this time. Moderator, may we have the first speaker, please. As a reminder, to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press one then zero at this time. Do not press one and zero a second time or you'll be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la Junta, si aún no la ha hecho, presione 1 luego 0 en este momento. No presione 1 luego 0 por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Our first participant is Mary Hubbard. Please state the public hearing items you're addressing today. You may begin. This is item five. The developer's request is to move lots from the coastal zone to area governed by the North Area Plan. But late yesterday, we found out that the county's interpretation seems to be that the lots the developer is moving out of the coastal zone will not be subject to the requirements of the North Area Plan, but instead are somehow under the 1988 County Code and General Plan. That's a game changer. This is an amendment. If the track map is changed, nothing is grandfathered into a requested change. The staff report failed to make clear whether that's going to be the county's interpretation and why the county would not take this opportunity to update this portion of a 34-year-old track to NAP compliance. There's no comparison in the 412-page staff report of coastal restrictions versus NAP versus 1988 general plan requirements. There's other misinformation. The initial 1988 tract approval was for 81 homes, 78 oak trees, and 443 acres, but that is no longer the underlying approval. Years ago, 
298 acres were moved into permanent conservation, which eliminated 53 homes and most of the impacted oak trees. That conservation property was subsequently sold and is no longer part of the development project. Excuse me? You and we have Your all time been has expired. of critical... May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant will be Paul Edelman. Please state the public hearing items you're addressing today. You may begin. Item number five, Paul Edelman, Deputy Director of the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. If the conditions mentioned by the applicant on item five, the conservation easement and the agricultural easement and the 10,000 square foot limitation on the homes, on the, the new houses, the 25 foot height on the one uh, lot mentioned by the applicant, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy's concerns are addressed. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant will be Eric Previn. Please state the public hearing items you're addressing today. You may begin. I'd like to speak on several of them, three, four, and five, but I'll start with five since, every, since it's fresh on everybody's mind. So who, who is Malibu Valley Partners uh, LLC? I looked at Beth Palmer, who's the attorney who's been uh, carrying this one around for a long time. I've listened to the community members who make a very cogent case that a great chunk of the acreage uh, was sold. The effort to go back to 1988 uh, rules, it makes no sense, especially since there's now a local community for whatever it's called, an LCP. I mean, this, this requires uh, some careful thought, but you know, it's true. How does it go from 71 oaks down to four or 78 trees down to 14? I mean, I don't know, you know, I know that these developers want to, want to help the environment. That's what they're about. They're not, I know it seems like they're trying to lucratively monetize all this stuff, but it's not, that's not what's going on there. Okay. Like with Caruso out in Thousand Oaks, they, you know, sometimes things don't work out and everything has to go to the developer for a song and then they'll just have to make do once they can get everyone in there. Now it is one of the highest, hottest, you know, markets for renting or buying. It's very hard. I, I saw someone who's advertising near Barger in uh, Pasadena, a $2 million condo. What the hell is going on? So let's move on to the other items because I don't want to sour the water on that, that little picnic. Um, the, the Firestone, this is in uh, the chairman, chairwoman's uh, district, Firestone uh, project. And, you know, I want to just touch base on these metro complaints. used to be in the old days that to have, to be near a rail line or to be near, near public transit was a upset, was a positive. It was something you'd put in it, hmm, that's a plus, because we believed at that time that we would be able to you know, board the trains, board the buses, get to work, come back, go for a run, maybe take a swim. But unfortunately, uh, now we are facing, uh, unfortunately because of the terrible leadership and mismanagement, but not just that, there have been a couple of curveballs. We had the pandemic, to be fair, and, and we did have Mayor Garcetti greedily stealing all the money to make a 2028 dream come Excuse true. Me? While Your time has I'm expired. Sorry. Yeah. And we have the next speaker, please. What about my third bit? Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder to address the board, if you've not already done so, please press one then zero at this time. Now press one then zero a second time or you'll be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la Junta, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione uno y luego cero en este momento. No presione uno y luego cero por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Our next participant will come from line of Donald Harlan. Please state the public hearing items you're addressing today. You may begin. Hi, uh, Board of Supervisors, Donald Harlan. Uh, I'm calling about the agenda items uh, two, four, five, and six. Uh, agenda item number two, uh, I like uh, street lighting, that's great, but uh, I don't want you guys giving away property or claiming the property, you know, assessment of taxes. For street lighting, that's fine, but that doesn't mean that somebody's street lighting owns the property. Uh, there could be problems with that. Sorry. Uh, agenda item number four. Uh, 
rezoning property for residential uses in the area where they're building the new Metrolink, that's fine. Uh, it's just that uh, uh, they need to look real good at the uh, county assessor reports. Uh, I was a victim of uh, Oak Tree Financial Company. Uh, they did a financial crisis uh, uh, in the 1990s, I believe. Uh, in 1987, uh, all those properties I bought in 1987, they, they uh, modified illegally modified the assessor reports in 1989. So there's a lot of properties like that on today's current uh, Board of Supervisors agenda. There's a couple of properties like that uh, from the regular uh, agenda items, but this is, uh, okay, agenda item number five. Um, yeah, uh, those people over there by the uh, ocean, uh, they don't need to be rezoning the mountains. You know, the mountains belong to somebody. It says National Forest, but you know what? Somebody also owns that. Uh, you really need to ask those people that own those areas. There's no vacant or open land for you guys to do development on. Uh, those areas along the freeway, those are mostly mine. Uh, I'm really uh, concerned about what I see here at LA County, that the, that's the big problem. Uh, the uh, agenda item number six, uh, yeah, there's a big problem with, uh, like I said, uh, Oak Tree. That, there, they had a scandal in the county. Uh, they modified thousands and thousands of, assess of assessor reports, tens of billions of dollars worth in 1989. Uh, Excuse they me. They tried to steal my property. That's my Your property. Your time has they expired. Go to jail. May we have the next speaker, please? And as a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, to address the board, please press 1, then 0 at this time. Do not press one and zero a second time or you'll be removed from the queue. May we have the next speaker, please? At this time, we have no further comments in queue. Thank you very much uh, to the members of the public um, who called in. The time for speakers has ended. If you are unable to provide your comments, you may submit written comments as indicated on the agenda, and we'll continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the official record. Today, we will begin with the public hearing items two, three, four, five, followed by set matter one, then items 10, 13, 14, 17, 18, 26, 30, 39, 44, 56 A, and finishing with item 56 B, as in boy. We'll now take up public hearing item two, hearing on the annexation and levying of assessments for county lighting districts in the city of La Mirada and unincorporated areas of South Whittier and La Crescentia. Colleagues, our Public Works Director, Mark Pastrella, is available if anyone has questions. Anyone like to make remarks or have questions at this time? Seeing none, it would be appropriate to close the public hearing, direct the tabulation of the ballots, and table them until later in the meeting for tabulation results and action by the board. Such will be the order. We will now take up public hearing item three, hearing on 2022 weed abatement and brush clearance referees report. Mr. Florin, our agricultural commissioner and director of weights and measures is available if members have questions. Are there any supervisors that would like to make a remark? Seeing none, it would be appropriate to close the public hearing and vote on this item. Item three is before us. I so move. Seconded by Supervisor Kuehl to approve the item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item three is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. We'll now take up public hearing item four, hearing project number 2020-003127-27 for the Florence Firestone Transit-Oriented District Specific Plan. 
Are there, uh, um, Ms. Bodek, Director of Regional Planning is available if any members have questions. Are there anyone, is there anyone that'd like to make a comment or have a question of Ms. Bodek? Seeing none, it'd be appropriate to close the public hearing and vote on this item. Item four is before us. I so move, seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve the item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item four is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. We'll now take a public hearing item five, hearing on the appeal of project number 87058 in the unincorporated Santa Monica Mountains North Area and Santa Monica Local Coastal Program within the Malibu Zoned District. Again, Ms. Bodex available if anyone has questions. Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I do have a question of Director Bodek, um, if she is available. Um, we heard uh, a bit of testimony about this and of course heard from uh, both sides early on. So the question is, I think there's been some question as to how development at the site will be permitted. Could you explain what the approval processes will be for the homes to be built in the north area and what it would be for the one lot left in the coastal zone? What are the development guidelines that will be applied? Just to clarify. Absolutely, and thank you very much, uh, Chair Mitchell and members of the board. Uh, if you would like me on camera, let me know. I'm not sure how to do that, uh, but in the meantime, I'll just continue to talk. Go ahead. All right, so I'd like to first take a moment to talk about the Subdivision Map Act, which is really the underlying regulation that dictates uh, how we determine that a project is vested. It is incredibly challenging for uh, everyone, including staff, to understand uh, how projects that have been on the books for so long are still eligible to be developed. And the answer to that is the Subdivision Map Act, which is controlled by the state and it's part of state law and the legislature over the years has extended the life of tract maps to accommodate for recessions, pandemics, slowdowns, and including the Great Recession. Because of that, a project that was initially conceived and approved in 1988 is in fact still valid and still a legitimate project. As that is the basis, this project and this site is um, a little bit more challenging because it straddles the coastal zone. And there are in fact parcels that are within the overall project that are wholly or partially within the coastal zone and wholly and partially outside of the coastal zone. Uh, because of that, we do have two separate regulations that we have to manage and deal with in addition to the restrictions of the MAP Act. The request today is something called a minor amendment to an existing map. And that is dictated by our Title 21 within the county code. It, it allows for minor revisions. A major revision would have not gone through this process. It would have had a more significant public process but the process here was a minor revision and, and that process was legitimate. Assuming that the board moves forward today, the next step would be that all of the conditions that are placed on this tentative map must be complied with by the applicant before those maps can get recorded. Once the final maps are recorded, then they can proceed with actual permits for the construction of the improvements, in this case, the residential homes. Because some of the lots are in coastal and some of the lots are not in the coastal zone, they then take two separate paths. All of the development in the coastal zone 
will be required to go through a coastal development process hearing. It will be in our local jurisdiction, but it would be a public local coastal development permit that would be heard by the Planning Commission, could be appealed to the Board of Supervisors. For those, is those parcels that are within the North Area Plan, they would actually be reviewed under the general plan that was in effect at the time the, uh, super, the subdivision map was applied. But likewise, they also have to get permitted and reviewed by staff. So there is a whole process uh, and a, a still a public process that must go, the applicant must go through prior to even pulling a building permit for a home. So this is not the end of the road for public engagement. In fact, it's really just the beginning of it. Uh, but, but I hope that does answer questions and I appreciate you allowing me a little bit of time to explain why we consider this 34 year old map uh, to be vested. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director Bodick. I, uh, and I also wanna thank all the parties for continuing to work right up to this morning, actually, uh, working through the specifics uh, of this uh, project. Um, the, uh, without the appeal though, that had been filed by the ever vigilant Las Virginas Homeowners Federation, the participation of the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority and the willingness of the applicant, uh, we would not have arrived here today with what I think is a better project. Ultimately, I believe this map amendment will, at, will result in lessened impacts in this community and to the resources at the site. And I wanna thank Timothy Lipman on my staff who worked diligently over quite a bit of time to try to work this through. So I wanna read in the amendments that I hope this board will adopt um, on this uh, item. I therefore move that the Board of Supervisors close the public hearing, find that the board considered the previously certified final environmental impact report for track 45465 and the addendum for phases four and five of track 45465 for this project, both prepared pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act, B, find that the certified EIR and addendum reflect the independent judgment and analysis of this board. C, find that substantial evidence in light of the record shows that none of the circumstances set forth in the CEQA guidelines calling for the preparation of a subsequent EIR exist. And D, the addendum was completed in compliance with CEQA and state and county CEQA guidelines. Next, indicate the board's intent, uh, intent to approve and adopt the addendum. Next, indicate the board's intent to approve the second amendment to vesting tentative tract map number 45465, project number 87058-3, and deny the appeal subject to modifying the Regional Planning Commission's approval of the project by adding and changing the project's conditions as follows. A, for lots 9, 10, 11, and 12 of map 45465-04, the building size shall be limited to no more than 10,000 square feet. In addition, for lot 10, the maximum building height shall be limited to 25 feet. For lot one of map 45465-05, the building size shall be limited to no more than 10,000 square feet. However, this limitation shall not include any of the equestrian facilities in lot one, of map 45463-465-05. B, in the coastal zone, which will now have only one proposed development pad with this project, protect the non-pad areas as follows. One, add a condition to require a conservation easement to the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority over the Knoll area to the east of the pad site that contains at least 13 oak trees. 
prohibiting all uses on that area of the lot except fire department required fuel modification and planting and maintaining vegetation native to the Santa, Santa Monica Mountains. Two, for the remainder of the area on the lot, located east of the proposed development pad, add a condition requiring a restrictive agricultural easement to the MRCA that prohibits all uses except fire department required fuel modification, non-paved, non-hardened surface trails, post and rail fencing, equestrian barns, and planting and maintaining vegetation native to the Santa Monica Mountains. Three, the project conditions should require both of these- We're sorry, your conference is ending now. Please hang up. Continue, Supervisor that's Kuehl, pardon the interruption. That's, that's okay. I, I paid my Zoom fees and everything. Um, so the last part of the condition, the project conditions should require both of these easements be recorded prior to issuance of any building or grading permits or any of the lots in either phase four or phase five of tract 45465. And finally, to direct county council to prepare the final findings and conditions consistent with these directed changes for the board's consideration. I believe we heard a, a bit of testimony about these changes. The MRCA uh, came in in favor because they're uh, issues had been met, and I would ask the board to approve this motion as I read it in uh, to be the solution to item five. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. Any other uh, members have questions or comments? None. It would be appropriate to close the public hearing and vote on this item. Item five is before us as amended. Have that moved by Supervisor Kuehl, seconded by Supervisor Solis to approve the item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item five is a motion to deny the appeal and approve the project as amended. Is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We'll move on to set matter one, uh, the American Rescue Plan funding report that we hear every board meeting. Uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Scorza, Executive Director of um, Racial Equity, and we'll also hear from Dr. Sharon, Director of Mental Health, and uh, John Franklin Sierra, Alternative to Incarceration Initiative Executive Director. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, and good morning, Supervisors. Uh, I am D'Artagnan Scores, and today's presentation marks the seventh update in our series of regular presentations on the county's progress implementing your board's American Rescue Plan Phase 1 spinning plan. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. As is our regular practice, this slide previews the topic we intend to cover today. Um, I will address item one, a global program overview detailing the current status of projects and the design, development, and approval process. Doctors Jonathan Sharon and John Franklin Sierra will address item two, spotlighting the Alternatives to Incarceration Initiative, um, uh, Alternative Crisis Response, and a collaboration between CEO and the Department of Mental Health. Next slide. Now, here is a high-level summary of our current ARP program approval process. As of March 14th, 47 projects are in the design and development phase, which entails, again, a process to clarify the goals and outcomes of each project, its potential impact on reducing disparities caused or exacerbated by the pandemic, and how to measure that impact. And while there are, no, um, while there are currently no projects under RD or County Council approval review, uh, RD is still working directly with departments on a pipeline of project designs. A total of 36 projects have been approved for launch and implementation. Of the 47 projects in the design and development phase, RD is actively partnering and meeting with departments on 18 projects to support the design and equitable implementation of these projects. Now, while we didn't log any new projects for approval, um, this update provides details on where we are in the process. 
RD is currently reviewing four project design submissions while 14 project design submissions are undergoing revisions by departments following an additional review. Of these 18 projects, RD is now working with those program teams to further refine their design to ensure equitable implementation and results-based accountability evaluation measures. 36 projects have yet to be submitted for project design review and approval, and my team is actively following up with the departments to help strengthen their, their ability to submit. At this time, we can move on to the next slide, please. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Jonathan Sharon, Director of the Department of Mental Health, and Dr. John Franklin Sierra, who recently transitioned to the Alternative to Incarcerations Initiative, uh, who will highlight the Alternatives to Crisis Response Program, which will use our funds to launch a local 988 call center to respond to, to crisis situations, to mental health crisis situations as an alternative to 911, and to train civilian outreach workers who can follow up when needed to de-escalate emergency circumstances with provider skill to mental health crisis response. Uh, next slide, please. Dr. Sharon. Thanks a lot, Dr. Scorza. And hello, board. It's uh, very nice to be with you uh, today and uh, to talk a little bit about the fact that we're going to be using some of the American Rescue Plan funding for the Alternative Crisis Response uh, Initiative. So we have to send our thanks uh, to DC and also locally for making this uh, allocation. Um, as we know, because we talk about it um, regularly and I think have been working on this for some time, the alternative crisis response is, uh, it's really reform 101 when we think about um, all of the, the challenges we have in our street and getting people access to care. And as a clear board of supervisors and department of mental health priority, this is a way for us to mitigate bad outcomes, really to meet health and human service needs in real time in our communities and not rely upon law enforcement to do that. Um, core to the care first effort diversion, uh, both from the streets and from the jails. And if you um, follow our moniker, we like to say that the alternative crisis response will allow our communities to have someone to call, someone to respond, and somewhere to go in the context of a crisis. Um, I'd like to now hand it over to John Franklin Sierra to talk a bit about uh, the details of our progress today. Thank you, Dr. Sharon. Uh, good afternoon, supervisors. We can go to the next slide. So the ARP funding for alternative crisis response is giving LA County the opportunity to really jumpstart the expansion of ACR services. We are tracking other increased funding sources on the horizon, such as increased federal Medicaid funding, but that's not set to start until January, 2023. This ARP funding is giving us the opportunity to expand now ahead of other funding on the horizon and crucially ahead of the official launch of the 988 call center on July 16th of this year. This will really accelerate, you know, our vision for 988 as the central no wrong door point of access for all crisis services in the county. Our goals with these ARP funds and with ACRs are to reduce the involvement of law enforcement in crisis response to the minimum necessary and divert individuals in crisis away from our jails, emergency rooms, and the streets. We wanna provide quicker civilian crisis response uh, along the lines of the tempo that our communities have come to expect from emergency medical services, and also intentionally address the inequitable impact the current system has had on our communities. As Dr. Sharon mentioned, um, with someone to call, someone to respond and somewhere to go, we're looking to serve anyone anywhere in the county and at any time they're experiencing a crisis event. Next slide. Some other info, we are being data driven throughout this effort. We'll be collecting info on the volume of 911 calls we successfully divert to 988 and connected services. The average response times of our mobile crisis teams is a key performance indicator. We want to ensure successful engagement with follow-up outpatient care and social support services for individuals post-crisis and to crucially disaggregate all of the above data by race and ethnicity, gender identity, age, and geography whenever available. Key outcomes for this phase of our funding, we're finalizing contracts or we're looking to finalize contracts with a 988 crisis call center provider as well as with contracted mobile crisis outreach team or MCOT providers. 
We also want to establish dispatch technology countywide that will allow the 988 Crisis Call Center to dispatch all of the county's mobile crisis response teams for individuals who need an in-person crisis response. And also partner with that 988 Call Center, law enforcement partners, and the 911 system to divert 911 crisis calls that do not require EMS or law enforcement response to 988. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you so much uh, to both of you for your presentation today. Uh, and with that being said, board, that concludes our presentation. Thank you um, very much, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Sharon, Dr. Franklin, Sierra, and Dr. Scorza for that update. Uh, I know it seems like every board meeting I talk about how important the alternative crisis response is and that we need to prepare for uh, 988 uh, coming online. Uh, and because that's because I truly believe this is groundbreaking work that has the potential um, as uh, you said, Dr. Sharon, to um, get people the help that, that they need when they need it uh, and prevent interactions uh, between law enforcement uh, with people with mental illness that sometimes does not have the outcome that we uh, are hoping for. And I know this work is a heavy lift, so thanks to everyone involved uh, in getting our alternative crisis response system up and running. So I have a few questions about our progress. Um, one of our major goals was to expand the number of psychiatric mobile response teams and to get them to run 24 seven. Where are we on that goal? How many teams do we have right now? And how many are we planning to add? Well, uh, Supervisor Han, thank you for the question and thank you for uh, really being the tip of the spear on this effort. Uh, we right now have uh, just over 50 PMRT teams, um, and we have two, uh, actually eight teams who are working in our therapeutic transport vans that are 24-7 currently. Uh, our goal is actually to get five of those vans uh, to be 24-7 um, by the summer. Um, and, you know, in a, in a perfect world where we were able to uh, easily hire and contract out and have contract agencies hire people to do the work, including, I will add, a significant peer component, we would have, uh, you know, 100 um, PMRT teams um, within the next year. Um, we've done a lot of a, a assessment of the need um, with um, a, a contracted firm, and we're estimating actually that 150 uh, civilian teams is the sweet spot. Um, it's just going to take a while to get there, and we're going to learn along the way. Yeah, thank you. And make sure you continue to let us know what we can do to push that, because once 988 comes online, it's going to it's only going to be as good as uh, our teams on the ground. I have another question. Um, in a previous motion, uh, we directed um, your department, Dr. Sharon, to uh, collaborate with the cities and the COGS that are interested in implementing their own localized crisis response systems in partnership um, with LA County. Wondering how those partnerships are going. Uh, another great question. You know, we're looking to partner with, uh, with other cities. As you know, we have a partnership with LA City currently, as well as with the MTA. And uh, those require, uh, you know, a lot of, um, shall we say, um, crossing of I's uh, uh, crossing of T's and dotting of I's uh, in a bureaucratic way, but we've made great progress with our memoranda of understanding um, across the board. Uh, we, um, we believe actually that the MTA MOU will probably cross the finish line first, but not far behind that uh, will be um, the other cities. And it's really important that we look at this uh, as a collective and that we bring all of these jurisdictions together in a, in a concerted way, well-coordinated, which is why uh, this federal funding for a call center and connecting it to 988 is so critical. And just a quick comment about 988. We are going to expand as quickly as we can. When 988 comes live, there's likely to be more demand because we'll be getting more calls and we'll be coordinating, I think, effectively with 
911. Uh, but, you know, I don't think here or really anywhere in the country uh, these crisis systems will be at capacity for 988 in a way that we would all like. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, finally, uh, in order to successfully implement 988, we really do need the help of the state. Uh, so can you tell us what the status of Assembly Bill 988 uh, that was introduced last year to help coordinate the launch of 988 statewide? How's that going? Well, you know, I, I have to say I, I applaud this board for um, co-sponsoring that bill and uh, CEO Ledge Affairs for all the great work. Uh, there are a number of folks who are kind of pushing back against uh, the state uh, the state effort, which is hard for me to understand. Um, we believe that we will get this bill passed. And one of the great things about the bill is that it will um, – bring in ongoing funding to sustain a larger workforce. Um, and, and so we have to really, really continue to put our shoulder down on this 988 bill. And as co-sponsors, I think we're doing that. And I'm sure that the board, myself, and other key advocates will uh, make our opinion known at the state. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And again, thank you, Dr. Sharon, for your leadership on this. I, I love it that we're highlighting uh, you know, what uh, you're doing with the American Rescue Plan. It seems like this is truly uh, the perfect use of uh, funding from our federal partners to really rescue people uh, who who need it most. And your leadership here has, has been terrific. And um, I love partnering with you on that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other Comments or questions? Supervisor Salif. Thank you, Madam Chair. And also to uh, Thesia and Dr. Scorza, Sharon and, and Franklin Sierra, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I agree that the 18.5 million in ARPA phase one funding is gonna be really helpful for what we wanna do to really get people out of our emergency trauma centers and into better care. And, and assessment and keep them out of our jails, which I think is really in incredible and, and off of our streets so they get the appropriate treatment. Can't wait to see 988 uh, come to life in July. And I know that uh, that three digit number will serve us uh, very readily and help us when all these mental health crises will, will be coming to the forefront. And you're right, Dr. Sharon, we're gonna probably get a lot of calls, so we should be ready for that. I had, uh, a week ago, I was out uh, visiting the LA County Fire Department Station 4, where you have partnered with, uh, I believe we're setting up five different locations, and this one is already online. And it just so happened that morning that the unit that uh, is prepared to go out to list to hear these typical calls uh, of someone in distress, um, the unit was already out at 7 a.m. So they are 24-7. It was quite exciting to see the collaboration with the city fire department. There was even a detached trailer unit where our staff would be say, staying. So I do hope at some point that they, uh, that, that LA City Fire does take hold of the program and, and really integrate our staff there. I was also able to see a training exercise of mental health staff inside their facility. And I think there were maybe over 40 individuals that were getting trained on this special therapeutic transport van. And if, if members haven't seen it, I would urge you and the public to take a view in terms of what exactly they're able to do and the kind of training that they receive. Um, they have a van that is paid for by uh, mental health. I appreciate that. And they can do telemedicine as they are treating an individual. And I guess it, that morning uh, I heard from staff that they had treated a young man that was in his uh, late twenties, it was about to commit suicide. It was having a mental breakdown and they were able to dissuade him, but they were able to get him into an appropriate setting where he could be treated. So I really want to applaud, especially Miriam Brown, who's been assigned to, to push this out with our other uh, partners. And two, want to encourage um, us to seek more funding so that we can collaborate outside the city of Los Angeles. I know this model will work, and I agree that we need to get our, our other 87 cities engaged. And I'm sure that they would take hold of it too for those that have their independent 
fire departments as well, or to collaborate with ours, the county. So I want to thank you uh, very much for that. And I'm, I'm, I just want to ask a question. How are we going to get this information out to the public? Because we have such diverse communities and over 200 and something languages spoken. How will we be able to um, address the issues when they come in? If say someone from the Thai community or Vietnamese community calls in, how are we going to disaggregate and, and make that possible? Can anyone please share share with me your ideas or what the plan is? Well, I mean, I, I could just say, you know, at a, at a, at a general level, um, we're working on a marketing strategy uh, around 988 and the federal government and the state are also kind of coordinating because this is a, this is a national initiative. So there's work happening between a number of partners at a number of different levels. Um, one of the things that's really, really important is that we not lose sight of the fact that the people in the community can't be expected to know exactly uh, what to do at any given time, um, especially in the beginning. So that one of the key things will be 911 and 988 have to be well coordinated and have to do live handoffs in real time. I would actually ask Dr. Scorza, who has been participating in these meetings, his perspective on how uh, to uh, facilitate, um, you know, the marketing to across different languages and cultures. Thank you for that question, Dr. Sharon, and thank you, Supervisor, for your important question. As you are aware, um, here in CEO, we are working diligently to outreach to community partners as well as others to inform them about uh, not only our contracting and grant opportunities, but also uh, partnering with departments to inform them about the programs themselves. And so uh, we are incredibly excited about the opportunity to use the hyper ethnic local media strategies that County Communications is. Um, working with and our county comms team uh, has dedicated um, both time and energy to identifying um, strategies to to outreach on behalf of and with in partnership with departments. So at this time, there is an incredible outreach effort. I'm proud to say uh, that we are already meeting with community partners. Um, we have an upcoming meeting on Thursday to inform them not only about our contracting opportunities but to make sure that the public in general is aware. And we're more than happy to support what DMH is doing uh, to inform the public about their programs as well. And we'll continue to keep the, you and the board apprised of this progress. Thank you, Mr. Scorza and, and to the team. And just want to encourage our, um, our own county channel to go out and maybe ride along and see what actually takes place because it's quite remarkable. And the staff is outstanding. Was very impressed with them and they're very dedicated. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor. Any other questions or comments? Well, let me just say that today's update uh, showed that 47 of our American Rescue Plan programs are still in the design and development stage. And so I want to encourage departments administering those programs to continue to press forward with your work, because um, clearly there's still much work to be done to implement those programs. And so I appreciate the ongoing focus and attention from the CEO our departments to launch these important initiatives in a timely fashion. Um, I think this standing item is very helpful. We all learn um, every board meeting about the great that's being done um, with the ARPA dollar. So thank you uh, to the three department heads who presented today. We appreciate it. Thank you. So again, um, that was a report back and such will be the order. Colleagues, we're going to return to item two, the hearing on the annexation and levying of assessments for county lighting districts in the city of La Mirada and unincorporated areas of South Whittier and La Crescentia. We'll, we will hear um, the executive officer will present on the ballot tabulation results. Madam Chair and members of the board, after tabulating the ballots, a determination has been made that no majority protests exist against the proposed annexation and levy of assessments for tentative subdivision territory known as Track 82127 in the City of La Mirada proposed for annexation to the County Lighting Maintenance District 10045A and County Lighting District Landscaping and Lighting Act-1 La Mirada Zone A and single lot territories known as L108-2019 
and L009-2019 in the unincorporated areas of South Whittier and La Crescenta proposed for annexations to County Lighting District, I'm sorry, County Lighting Maintenance District 1687. As a result, it would be appropriate for the board to adopt the resolution ordering the annexation and levy of assessments and the joint resolutions accepting the negotiated exchange of property tax revenues resulting from the annexation of subdivisions and single lot territories for fiscal year 2023 to 2024. Item two is before us, moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Supervisor Barker to approve the item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item two is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We'll move on to item 10, preparing for the closure of the Division of Juvenile Justice, Secure Youth Track Facility designation, and LA model expansion, which I held. As indicated on the supplemental agenda, Supervisor Solis submitted an amending motion that will also be considered with item 10. As you're aware, there are a few items on the subject of the county's juvenile justice system on today's agenda. Each item will be discussed and voted on separately. So with that, um, I'll begin my comments with regard to agenda item 10. Um, you know, it's, it's clear that for decades, many decades, there has been a core fundamental philosophical difference about the true role of carceral systems or criminal justice specifically. Um, a perspective of whether the role of a carceral system is to punish exclusively or whether a carceral system is to hold and create opportunities for rehabilitation. Um, their uh, probation department uh, in this county um, has also had varying different leaders who were across the spectrum of those different philosophical views around the fundamental role of the department. Forty years ago, we had a, a chief probation officer who was quoted in the LA Times as saying that probation should be a form of punishment. Um, if we can help offenders along the way, fine but primarily the client has to be the community rather than the probationer. I think the Board of Supervisors has, with new information, with research, with experience, transitioned the board's own view about the role of a carceral system and the role of probation. And I think that's evident in our effort to seek out and hire a probation chief who has a history of being a reformer. Um, this board, um, for a number of years now has made the transition based on experience, based on research, based on the engagement of people with lived experience. And we've transitioned from um, perhaps a more carceral punishment orientation to a cares first, care first, jails last concept and model that is woven throughout any number of board actions um, that we've taken. So coming forward to today and the action before us, it's been almost a year since the board delayed a decision on permanent facilities for the youth coming into the county's care that the state of California has characterized as secure youth track. There's been enough time, plenty of time in my opinion, for pretty exhaustive community engagement, which is appropriate. We've looked at the research and the analysis. Now it's time for this board to take the next step so that we can engage in a long-term facility planning and more importantly, programming aspect. I think it's important to address some of the things that we heard today and in past instances in public comment. When it comes to young adults who are charged as juveniles, this motion addresses a gap in services that has left our justice partners without developmentally appropriate options for meeting their needs 
and ensuring the public safety. Unfortunately, we've seen examples in media reports about how the delay in this board's decision on where secure track youth should be housed has already resulted in some young individuals falling through the cracks and not receiving appropriate services. That's on us. That's our responsibility. In addition, the credible messenger's pilot referenced in this motion will add to, not substitute or replace, current services in these, in these facilities to allow individuals with lived experience to mentor youth who need help with navigating their experience within the justice system. With regard to the timing of this motion, numerous public meetings over the course of 13 months have been held, and several reports and recommendations have been submitted on the topic of facilities for secure track youth. And the first facility recommendation submitted to the board last June, including Camp Scott and Dorothy Kirby Center, were supported by all five appointees representing each super supervisorial district on the Juvenile Justice Realignment Block Grant Subcommittee, which is chaired by the Probation Department. Additionally, some claim that young people convicted of the most serious charges can't be housed in a camp. However, our camp facilities do house this population, and it's problematic to assume that a prison-like facility is the only way to meet their needs, as well as ensure the public safety. The county has long committed to shifting the paradigm of its youth justice system from a punitive approach to a rehabilitative model. This kind of transformation is needed to enhance the well-being and safety of our youth and communities. We have a sacred obligation to provide the youth in the county's care, all of the youth in the county's care, with the appropriate services that meet their needs. Housing and developmentally appropriate services, which this motion advances, are a critical part of this. I continue to have serious concerns about the potential use of Barry J. Nidarf Juvenile Hall as a secure youth treatment facility. We must move with urgency, given that the secure track population will grow over the next few years. Every day that we delay the decision on where our secure track youth should be housed, we place their health and safety at greater risk. I remain committed to Campus Kilpatrick, Camp Scott, and the Dorothy Kirby Center as the best options for permanent secure track facilities. The JJRBG has worked tirelessly to rule out other options, and we must continue to reduce probation's footprint. We have urgent, complex, and countywide problems that this board needs to solve, and the reality is that necessary changes in or near neighborhoods will often resist. Structural racism is real. The board is in a position to help the young people that were failed by every other government system before they ended up in the county's care. Before I go to our presenters, I would like to read in a few clarifying revisions to agenda item number 10. For directive number two, in the first sentence, after the phrase, quote, support further exploration of the potential future identification of, end quote, add the phrase, quote, only the following facilities, end quote. For, director five, for directive five, after the phrase, quote, an, an implementation plan for a program that utilizes, end quote, add the word existing, then strike the words, quote, staff classified as, then strike the Roman numeral two, and then add the word, quote, staff. For directive six, in the first sentence, strike the phrase, quote, the CPO and, end quote. After the phrase, quote, the interim director of the Office of Diversion and Reentry, end quote, add the phrase and the CPO. 
We have the executive director of the Probation Oversight Commission and a representative from JJRBG subcommittee um, on, and I'd like to ask them two questions, if I may. First will be Wendy Julian. Just, uh, just unmuted. Thank yes. you, Supervisor. Thank Mitchell. you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Can you tell us about the process of what led to the Probation Oversight Commission's support for the Juvenile Justice Realignment Block Grant Facilities recommendations? I can. Thank you, Supervisor Mitchell. And uh, to be clear, on this issue today, I am speaking on behalf of the Probation Oversight Commission. Uh, the Commission has paid close attention to this issue of closure of the State Department of of uh, juvenile justice, the DJJ, and selection of the secure youth track site since the commission launched last February 2021. And as you said, the commission took its first official action on the item last week at our March 10th meeting, voting to support this specific motion. Uh, that decision was not taken lightly. It has been on the commission's regular meeting agenda over four times in the past year and spoken about in public comment at nearly every meeting. The POC also hosted two town halls and participated in two more town halls with hundreds of people in attendance. During these meetings, the POC heard from community members who serve on the JJRBG, that uh, Juvenile Realignment Block Grant Subcommittee, who initially were frustrated that those meetings were not public and came to the POC in order to bring those issues to light and allow the public to know what was happening and to give input. Once the JJRBG meetings became public, the POC continued to discuss the issue due to regular concerns that were brought up by the public about youth who had been dispositioned to the secure track after the July 1st, 2021 date, and that they were stuck in the compound at Barry J instead of being moved to Kilpatrick, as has been recommended by the JGRBG, even as a temporary site before this motion. The POC was built on the concept of public engagement, on listening to people with lived experience and by guiding the county's decisions based on how they impact the people served. In fact, four of our nine commissioners are people with lived experience. There was, a certain, there was certainly a common theme by the commissioners, the advocates, and dozens of young people with lived experience who addressed the POC over the past year that Barry J. Nidorf is not an appropriate long-term placement for youth. Commissioners also visited Barry J. Nidorf and all of the proposed sites, including Camp Scott, and made multiple visits to Campus Kilpatrick and Dorothy Kirby. So when the JJRBG made its formal recommendations regarding uh, Camp Scott, Page, or Afflerbaugh as the preferred, preferred sites for boys and girls, the POC continued to bring the issue to public comment in hopes that a final decision would be soon made. Many youth on the secure track have been incarcerated in the county for a long time already, and many more will be with us for a long time down the road because of their long dispositions. We need to provide them with a healing, restorative, safe living environment with strong programs and services that help them prepare to rejoin the community as absolutely soon as possible. So when Supervisors Mitchell and Chua presented this motion that gives clear direction, identifying Camp Scott and Campus Kilpatrick as the long-term sites, um, it echoes the JJRBG's recommendations, follows what the POC has heard over the past year, and that, in, that inclined the commissioners to take a vote to support the motion to help the county move forward. Thank you very much for that response. I appreciate it. And you actually are, are the only person that we've had um, asked to come and testify. So thank you. Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I have uh, quite a bit to add to what you said because I, as you know, have been rather hot under the collar about some of the ways in which our young people have been characterized and the people who have characterized them negatively. But let me first talk about the law. There are juvenile halls, and then there are permanent placements for our young people. Barry J is a juvenile hall. It is not a permanent placement. It was never meant as one. It is not designated as one, and it may not actually legally be one. And I think whether it was in perfect shape that would be the case. But the fact that it has become like an adult prison, especially with this so-called compound that sounds a little softer than it is when you walk through it, it is not a place where any of our young people should be kept for a prolonged period of time. What these halls are meant to be, and remember, they just transferred 
tons of young people from Central, which has closed, into Barry J just yesterday or the day before with very little notice. Um, these halls are meant, they have a courtroom in them, not next door, in them, because they are meant to be places where young people get their final disposition from the court and go to it. And in the past, it has been primarily our camps. So it is not an appropriate place for any kind of permanent placement, not just about DJJ. Secondly, you talked about the research, Madam Chair, and I think it has become really clear in the past 15 years about the ways in which young people respond to being seen with concern, to being treated like human beings, to being educated, to being helped. This is not soft-headed. And I'll tell you it's not soft-headed because it is actually in state law. Let me talk to you about Welfare and Institution Code, Section 875A3. That is the section of the law that governs the court in sentencing these young people who have committed serious crimes. And the criteria that must be met when they put anyone who's a minor on a secure track um, facility must include findings written on the record regarding programming available to them at that placement, rehabilitation available to them at that placement, and the delivery of services with a real plan. The court is supposed to write that in its findings. I love the court, but one wonders what they say about Barry J. They could not say that Barry J is a permanent placement because it doesn't meet the law. The Welfare and Institution Code Section 875 also sets forth elements in an individual rehabilitation plan, which is required for each young person, even the ones who committed serious crimes, that have to be sub submitted to the court by probation within 30 days of commitment at their permanent placement. So we're not making this up in terms of there needing to be rehabilitation and programming for these young people specifically. Now that the state has said, we're closing all our state facilities, you take them. They have asked us for a plan. The plan that we submitted January 1st was very, very, very general. In essence, it was, there will be a plan because we did not agree on where everything should go. I'm ashamed to say that our very own probation union took it upon themselves to send letters to our city councils, which I think is way beyond anything that would be acceptable, in order to characterize to the city councils in Supervisor Barger's district, in my district, in Malibu, where Campus Kilpatrick is, to characterize these young people as animals who cannot be rehabilitated, who are to be feared and might escape, although who's, who's letting them escape? Probation, I guess. Uh, and they haven't shown us any who've escaped. I mean, it's so outrageous. I, I have not really been able to speak honestly even today about how I really feel about it. The research shows that the reason the state law requires programming and rehabilitation is because minors, when they receive this kind of service and help, do not end up going to adult prison do not end up reoffending as much. Go back into their community. You heard from some of them today. You heard from a young man who was at Barry J and went to Campus Kilpatrick. Campus Kilpatrick was designed, I'm very proud to say, by my predecessor, Zev Yaroslavsky, to be a place with a new model for rehabilitation for young people. It is a good place. Now, let me talk. I mean, obviously, you know, I take this responsibility seriously. Kilpatrick's in my district. My Malibu council being ginned up by the probation union to fear these young people have voted, you know, they don't want them either. I love my city councils, but I have said to them, I don't care. You are wrong. You have been made fearful. And I think that courage should be infectious to everybody to say no 
to people that wants to characterize these kids as animals. Um, you've already heard it's already been opposed. Barry Jay's been opposed by everybody that was tasked by the state to make the decision. You know, it's actually not supposed to be up to us. It's supposed to be up to the people who were tasked to make the decision. And we, of course, like to look at everything and talk about it and should, because we're ultimately in charge. But when the research shows treatment is necessary, when all the people who had anything to do with talking about this recommended this approach, it's the only way to go. Let me talk to you about Camp Scott for a minute. Surprise, Camp Scott has always been a placement as opposed to Barry J, which has never been a long-term placement and couldn't be by law. Camp Scott already has single person rooms. Camp Scott is currently empty, which means that renovations and upgrades can be made without impacting a single youth or a single member of staff. Of all the closed facilities, Camp Scott is the one most recently that had been in use. It just closed in May of 2020, which means it's not dilapidated and more importantly, that it's licensed status is still active. So I really want to encourage everyone, all my colleagues, and I know that my esteemed colleague from the fifth district has an opposing uh, motion, which I am not going to support. I understand listening to the probation union seems tempting, but in this case, I remember, you know, Holly wasn't here yet, but the four of us were here when there was testimony about how horrible these children were four years ago and the members of the probation union sitting in the back stood up and cheered when they were called animals. So I'm not big fans of theirs at the moment. Still, we are the ones called upon to do what's right. And this is what's right. Dorothy Kirby for the girls, Camp Scott for the boys, Kilpatrick as the transition point. Uh, I can't see any other way that we will satisfy the state and get our block grant money, which requires a specific plan that comports with the law. So let me encourage you to seriously consider, and I hope you all are, supporting this motion. I'm not haranguing you, I'm really speaking for the audience as well, because I know you all very well. Um, and doing not just the right thing in a soft hearted way, doing the right thing under the law as required, doing the thing that we must do in order to make sure that these young men and women are not doomed to a life of adult crime. And that's what happens when you have bad treatment, you pass it on. We cannot house these young people at Barry J. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, and thank you for co-authoring the motion with me, Supervisor Kuehl, and your leadership in this area for years. I appreciate it. Uh, Supervisor Solis? Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and also to Supervisor Kuehl for introducing uh, the motion. And it's really hard to follow you, Supervisor Kuehl, because <laughs> You are uh, an immensely qualified litigator, and I'm glad that you gave uh, the public and all of us a history in terms of where the law is and what we as uh, elected officials need to be concerned with, because ultimately we are responsible and we do need to receive state funding, our, our block grant monies, to be able to implement this program that has been put upon us by the state, and we need to be ready for it. So. I, I want to just go over a couple of things and then and then talk a little bit about the amendment that I have. Um, you know, the process of getting our secure youth track facility out of uh, Barry uh, Nordoff into a permanent, more suitable location. Yes, I agree. It has been long delayed and put off. Uh, and I know that there have been some very negative impacts because of that. We've heard it from youth. We've heard it from our own commissioners and we've heard it from staff. We heard more of that today from those that called in. 25 of these um, secure track youth are in limbo currently at Barry Nordoff. And I'm really hoping that the board in collaboration with our probation department and our union partners can move quickly to get these youths housed with appropriate levels 
of services and programs that we have heard that they have not received. Um, I want to stress that while in limbo, these young people are not getting what has already been outlined as appropriate and even adequate levels of services and programming. The programming shouldn't wait until they have a permanent location to go, but should be happening this very moment. We have youth who want more education. They're demanding education, for God's sake, but it's not being offered to them. We have youth who want vocational training and opportunities because they can see also a future for themselves ahead. Instead, these youths right now are sitting in their dorms, watching television or playing video games. What are we doing to our young people? This is irresponsible and it is unfair, not only to our youth, but to our responsibility because we are supposed to be providing them with services. So as the motion lays out, I will be voting yes to support the efforts to identify Camps Kilpatrick and Scott to be the permanent sites for the secured boys and Dorothy Kirby Center to be the permanent site for secured girls. And I can tell you that the last time we had this discussion, this, the district I represented had Dorothy Kirby Center in it. And I wanted to make sure that our community in the surrounding area was well aware of what this proposal meant. And it is one of those individual places that has cottages already set up. And there are not very many girls that will be uh, placed there, which I think is, is also something that uh, the group overall that is helping us arrive at this decision took very seriously. I want to thank uh, both, both of you, Supervisor Mitchell and Kuehl, for accepting my friendly amendment. I saw the motion did not explicitly state what the future of Camp Page and Afferball, located in the city of Laverne, were. Therefore, I wanted to add a friendly amendment to make it clear that those camps remain as is, not for those secured youth and not to be used as a secured youth facility. We've heard that from many of the residents in the city of Laverne and the surrounding areas. Additionally, in my commitment to youth justice reimagined, the amendment would bring the newly expanded LA model to both of these camps. I think that's what we have been striving for. It's never been a doubt in my mind that LA, the LA model wasn't just going to be exclusively at one camp, Camp Kilpatrick, but it was supposed to be pull, pushed out to all of our camps and our halls in the county. So I hope that all of us will come to uh, agreement that we have to have a care-centered approach. So at this time, I too would like to ask for support on my amendment. Thank you for accepting it. And I support the motion moving forward. And let's find justice for our young people that are currently in our, in our care and also for their families who are also looking to us for that leadership. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Solis, Supervisor Hahn, followed by Supervisor Barker on item 10. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I want to start off by saying thank you so much. I know this has been uh, the, a lot of hard work, much of it uh, really trying to work out some differences. And uh, up front, I'm going to say absolutely, I'm going to support this. Uh, uh, this motion today by uh, you, Supervisor Mitchell, and you, uh, Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, my, my concern, I think Chief Gonzalez is on the line. Um, my concern is, uh, it's, I've been told that uh, Camp Kilpatrick and Camp Scott are not ready right now uh, for these youth and uh, wanted to know what still needs to happen to make these places ready, and uh, more importantly, how long that will take. There he is. I just saw him. Right, I did too. Good morning. Can you see me? I, I don't see I myself. I did briefly. We saw you a second ago, then you went away. Let me try it again. Okay. Maybe I double click. There we go. There you Maybe go. I double click there. Oh, yes, we got you now. Yes, you Thank are. you. So my question was, what, what would it take to get these places ready uh, for what I think is going to be, you know, the, the, the will of the board, and how long do you think that's going to take? Well, first, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I appreciate all the comments that I heard so far. And it was mentioned earlier, 
when I came from San Diego, this is what I envisioned. What can we do in Los Angeles to expand the, um, what we call the LA model? From San Diego, we came to Los Angeles and looked at Camp Kilpatrick, actually a couple of times to get ideas, and we created a new facility uh, in San Diego before I came up here to Los Angeles. In fact, when I got here, I invited um, members of the community, members of the justice deputies to come down there and see the construction. The facility was still in construction when we came uh, last year, but I'm told the facility is now complete and occupied by the young people there in San Diego that I would like to invite members of the board to come down there and take a look at uh, what's possible. Um, what would it take for, uh, or, and also what I did um, a couple weeks ago, not about a week ago, I sent a letter to the union, uh, advising the union that by May 1st, we're gonna be moving the young people to Camp Kilpatrick. Uh, and there were some uh, items outlined in there, the, the, the scheduling, uh, the services and so forth. Um, I, w I went personally to Barry J and spoke to the youth there in Barry J. Um, I even sampled the food when I was there and it was not very tasty or appealing. So I directed our staff to work with our nutrition and our food provider to enhance services and meal services for all of our facilities. Uh, I then went to Camp Kilpatrick myself and I saw that the fence had been damaged behind the cottages when we had the big strong winds, if you recall, uh, about a month or so ago, maybe two months now, uh, that were, were needing repair. So I asked that that be expedited and I'm told that the repairs have been done. And also there was another concern of safety with the um, a light pole running through the cottages that were identified for the secure use track, which are the ones closer to the swimming pool. If you've been there before, you know the one furthest away from the administration building. The, 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 the light pole was too close to the building and there was some safety concerns there. I'm told that had also been remedied and we're now getting ready the cottages to receive our young people. Uh, we're gonna go through the process of, of evaluating who should be ready to move on. Uh, interestingly enough, when I went to camp, camp uh, to Barry J last week, on, on Thursday, I spoke to a couple of people that don't wanna go to, uh, don't wanna leave Barry J. Uh, but I think once we talk to them, we can encourage them that it's the best thing to do. I was surprised why they, they wanna leave. Uh, we didn't get into uh, to the why so much. So, We're so, Chief, so you're, what you're saying is you think both facilities will be ready to receive uh, these youth based on the on the board's motion today by May 1st. O only Camp Kilpatrick will receive some youth at Camp Kilpatrick. Camp what, Scott, about Camp, what about Camp Scott? Camp Scott needs to repair. There was some strong wind damage. Uh, okay, I so what, I mean, give me a time. Uh, I'll have to talk to our, our, our public works folks to see what they're doing. What okay. I'm, what I mean, I'm, here's my concern, um, uh, colleagues, is uh, yes, we're going to do this. I'm going to be supportive. But we have been hearing uh, horror stories about Barry J, right? Everything from maggots in the food to no programming um, to just, you know, the, some of the uh, lockdowns. So I guess my point is, in the meantime, it's going to be important to me, at least. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about renovating or reimagining Barry J. But in the meantime, it, it, you know, we we could be several months away, uh, and things usually take longer than what we think. That these young people will be at Barry J. and and I don't think any of us feel good about even temporarily. Uh, you know, having our young people exposed to some of the conditions that we've been hearing about. So what can you do, Chief, in the meantime uh, to fix some of these uh, problems that we've been hearing about that are that are really uh, abhorrent, uh, in my opinion? Uh, again, we know we're going to move them, uh, but, you know, we got to meet them where they are. And uh, I can't imagine that we would feel good about even one more day with some of the conditions that we heard about. I mean, like no maggots in the food, right? I think we can all agree that that's uh, a bad idea. Right, that's what we're, we're already looking at the food that was concerning to all of us as well. Uh, what I'm told is that that was addressed right away when, when they spotted that and, and, the, and the, um, the fruit cups and they went to the provider and addressed that particular item. Uh, we, are have to, we do have a requirement from the Department of Justice to make the, 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 the modifications, uh, which includes uh, trying to make it more home-like, if you will. Uh, we can do that uh, relatively soon because uh, we have we to. Also heard, we also heard about programming, like the kids weren't getting uh, the programming that that uh, uh, they. I think Supervisor Solis talked about uh, right. the lack of, of that, and you know all they're doing is watching TV and playing video games. 
Right. I heard the same thing when I met with them and I spoke to the, the young people down there. Uh, we assigned a director, um, um, uh, um, Albert Banuelos, to follow the same model we had at Kim Patrick with the programming, and he's bringing that to Barry J and other places as well. I also reached out to um, uh, Scott, Scott Bunnick and uh, Sam, uh, Sam uh, Lewis from uh, anti Recipients Coalition. We're looking at expanding their contract so we can have more services for Barry J as well as a compound. I don't like the term compound myself. And the other thing I want to do is, as soon as we can, the, working with Public Works, can we remove some of the, the racer wire from the facility? Uh, I think that's, that's very disheartening. And when I was there on Thursday of last week, it, it was very depressing. So I agree with what you're saying, and we're going to do the best we can to get there. I need the support from a Department of, of, of Public Works and our Internal Services Bureau to make those things happen and not delay like we have in the past. Thank you. And of course, we're concerned about LACO and their inability to, um, uh, you know, uh, for the teachers to teach there right now based on uh, on some of the reports that I've gotten. So maybe it would be appropriate, um, Supervisor Mitchell and Kuehl, I don't know how you feel about this, some sort of, uh, I don't know if it's a report back or some sort of uh, status improvement uh, for for the young people uh, currently at Barry J with everything we just listed, physical, programming, food. So we really know, and again, not to alarm, uh, you know, any of the activists who, you know, think anything we do would in some way be uh, signaling that we're staying there or we're renovating it. But just just in, in terms of humanely uh, treating uh, these young people at uh, Barry J until we uh, move forward to Kilpatrick and Scott. That's what I would like. And it, it, it's important to me to know um, that we're not in, they're not in some limbo, some holding pattern uh, where we're not putting any uh, effort or resources to their well being. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisor Hanna, I appreciate it. I would just say that um, from my perspective, completely separate from this agenda item, that's my expectation of the department head, Chief Gonzalez, anyway. You know, we are clear that the BSCC has already determined like Central Juvenile Hall, that, that Barry J. Nidorf is unsuitable. And so from my perspective, it's Chief Gonzalez's responsibility to be taking immediate action to address those concerns. So I wouldn't uh, attach it, a report back to this motion. I think we can create a report back motion, but that's my expectation of the department head in the first place. It has already been deemed unsuitable and so I think he has to take immediate so, action to change we, sometimes that. Sometimes we have to tell our department heads what's, what, I, what uh, yeah, we, we expect. Happy to do so. You know, given the nature and the content of this motion, I would prefer that it not be connected to this motion because I don't want it to be perceived as any suggestion that we are delaying action on this motion. But I, I agree with you, none of us think status quo, including the BSCC, is appropriate. Hence, they've deemed it unsuitable. Supervisor Kuehl, I see you waving your hand. I wasn't waving. I was just <laughs> politely, you know, raising a couple of fingers, That's the right okay. ones. Yes. Um, I think that it's a more complicated issue for the halls and a report back separately, I think is a real, um, a really good idea. Remember, they just closed, I'm sorry, our, our esteemed department head and uh, just closed Central Juvenile Hall. I mean, and told LACO on Friday that they had to move. So they moved an entire school with over 100 students and 58 LACO employees over to Barry J. So work has to go on at Central, which, um, as you know, Supervisor Solis has another um, issue with and approach later on in our uh, agenda. But I think we have to see sort of the plan for these halls or if it's just going to be one hall and how that is going to operate. The vast majority of these young people are not these offenders that we're talking about that we refer to as our DJJ youth. DJJ youth are minors, but they've committed more serious crimes. And that's why the state used to take them, but doesn't anymore. Most of the kids at Barry J and at Central are moving through and they're not all going to a placement. Some of them are going to diversion and more and more of them are these days. So it's even worse that they're enduring this for a long period of time 
instead of being you know, diverted. So I think we wanna know in this area, just of these halls where the kids go stop one, you know, that's the report back I think we need. What's gonna happen at Central? When are we going back to Central or, or not, depending on what we decide today? Uh, and what happens at Barry J for this population, which is primarily not our DJJ youth, it's primarily lower offenders, and if they're going to be incarcerated, you know, sent to one of the other camps. So uh, I wanted also to give a shout out to um, LACO because they have really tried to keep going and tried to provide the education and insisted on it and to some extent have been stymied at Barry J. Um, but I know that our chief probation officer hears these concerns loud and clear, and maybe we can set a date certain to hear back exactly what's going on uh, in the not too distant future. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Hahn, anything else? Thank you. Supervisor Barger. Thank you. Um, to um, our, our Chief Gonzalez, can our halls serve as permanent housing facilities with designation changed by the BFCC? Because I know that was something that was brought up in one of the cluster meetings and, and you made it clear that in fact, with the designation change, they can be used. Right, BFCC can control based on Title 24, whether it's a, um, a, a placement or a detention facility. Okay, so I just want to clarify that. So the motion that I bring in today obviously takes into consideration that designation modification. So I do recognize that. And then I would say um, to the comment about the JJRBG giving been given the authority, they're given the authority to recommend. We as a board have the authority to make the decision. And the probation department is an extension of our authority. And so I say to, and I said this up in Santa Cruz when I was up there yesterday, my motion is not my recommendation. This is a recommendation that came from subject matter experts that we hired, that we, we as a board collectively hired to bring forth recommendations. And um, that is my position. And to um, the point made about the reference to these youth, I completely agree and I've said this as well. My objection is not to the population that's gonna be placed. My objection is to going against subject matter authorities who are telling us that they feel that Barry J. Nidor is the appropriate placement with modifications. Supervisor so Barger, if you could focus your comments on, on agenda item 10, we'll have the opportunity to hear your items. So if you could, well, actually, if you have questions respect, of the chief on 10, respect, that'd be Chair, appreciated. With all, with all due respect, Chair Mitchell, they are one in the same, even though you want to separate them and that's fine, but I, I, it's my time and I, I'm speaking, okay? And so having said that, I take offense to the, the allegations that, um, that are not even offense. I, I, I do not believe that it's accurate to say that Barry and Idar cannot be considered, okay? So I just want to say that, because that was said about the motion. But I also wanna say that, you know, during the, the past few years, this board has adopted an unfortunate trend of not listening to experts and shopping for answers. Usually the cherry picking of answers revolves around the closing of Men's Central Jail, having ignored three reports over multiple years, highlighting the need to replace with a secure facility. Today's vote, in my opinion, has come down, come down to picking the report that serves opinion versus fact. The facts are the board has committed to lowering its juvenile justice footprint, not reopening closed facilities. According to a financial analysis submitted by the probation department over the weekend, it is less expensive to renovate Barry J. Nidor to meet the standards of youth justice imagine, reimagine. Despite the millions of dollars invested in campus Kilpatrick, an additional $30 million will be required to serve this population without undertaking day, the, day, the DJJ population. The probation department recommends the use of Barry J as a permanent housing facility, which was what the majority of counties in California are also doing, converting their juvenile halls into secure youth facilities. 
the JJRBG subcommittee did in fact rank Barry J. Neudorf as a feasible location for this population. These are the facts. What is also a fact is that the board is being asked to vote on a motion when while simultaneously not being presented all the available options at hand to continue in the trend of cherry picking when it is convenient. Instead, we are ignoring the very expert that this board was responsible for bringing to this department. Everyone on this board was a part of the hiring of our probation chief. We selected him and charged him with employing his expertise in making decisions about the department, the youth, and his department's impacts. The implementation of the values of youth justice and reimagine is not contingent on those whose values are practiced, but rather on how many young people we can impact, something we all agree on. The county was already required to make transformational changes to Barry J well before the discussion of DJJ even began. This is an opportunity to impact the lives of most of our incarcerated youth, but pre, both pre and post disposition at Barry J. It is the only facility that can ensure continuum of care from the moment they are there until the minute they exit our system because they will not need to be transferred after disposition. I do not support this motion, as you can tell. I believe Camp Scott is not suitable for non-DJJ youth, let alone for young adults ages 18 to 25 with high needs and that are high risk. Thus, this motion, so this motion passed. I want to make it very clear that the investment inside and out, including extensive security upgrades, must be made. With respect to the amendment by Supervisor Solis, I want to thank her for hearing my constituents in Liveron. They have been engaged tirelessly on this issue since the town hall I requested and held months ago. That said, my office has received calls from community members asking what an expanded LA model means. And to my constituents, I say, consistent with my commitment to always be collaborative and transparent with my constituents, we will be holding town halls so that they have a full briefing and understanding of what is being proposed and how it impacts them. And last and not least, but let me just say the irony today is as we speak about increasing about this, the concerns about Barry J, we are increasing the population at Barry J and Idor by 120. So we have moved youth from Central Juvenile Hall to Barry J and Idor, doubling the population. And if the uh, action today under 56B occurs, we will close Central Juvenile Hall and ensure in perpetuity, per per perpetuity that in fact, these youth remain at Barry J and Idor. And let me just quote from 56B. The plan includes a timeline and budget modifications, reconfigurations, and upgrades to create a quote, home-like environment com uh, compliant with the California Department of Just Settlement Agreement at Barry J. Nidorp. So this motion is asking that we do what actually the motion that I'm bringing in is asking. And including the demolition of the compound, something that I agree with, to become the only probation facility in the county to hold pre-disposition youth. What is the difference? What is the difference? And so, you know, on one on one hand, we're we're talking about how horrible it is, and I agree with you, Supervisor Mitchell. The buck stops with us. We shouldn't be waiting to 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 debate this. The fact that that we all know, and and the, the and the the probation officers put us all on notice that the youth that are coming in right now, the level of violence in our facilities, specific to youth on youth violence and assaults against staff, continues to escalate. And by the way, this is not unique to our camps. We've been put on notice that in our group homes under DCFS, we've had the same problem. This is a debate we should be having separate from the fact that the state is transferring or transferring their responsibility down to us to hold these youth longer. But I feel that this has become um, something more of a political game. And the future of our youth depend upon the decision we make for generations to come and I will not support it, and I will hold all accountable moving forward because I feel a responsibility to these youth. And again, it's not about it being at Camp Scott because I actually, and I, I don't know how many of you all have been to each one of those camps and walked them and have taken Gonzalez up with his offer to go down to San Diego. 
I have. I've gone to, I, I, I've toured Page and Aprabaugh with, with uh, uh, Chief Gonzalez. I've gone up to Camp, Camp Scott. I've been to, uh, to um, Kirby. I've gone out to Kilpatrick because I want to know what I'm voting on. I'm not going to simply take, take the word of a piece of paper, what's written on a piece of paper. I want to know what my decision is going to, to um, be made on and, and what exactly we're talking about. So um, while we're not going to take up my motion when we're talking about 10, um, fasten your seatbelt because I will continue to talk about it when it's my turn on the green sheet motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are you finished speaking, Supervisor Barger? Well, I said thank you, Madam Chair, so I think that means yes. Okay, so let me just clarify. Um, it is within the power of the chair in following past practices of this board about when agenda items are taken up. And while I didn't interrupt you, I made it very clear that the discussion for the moment was item 10. There's plenty of opportunity to address agenda item 56A. So with all due respect, I would hope that in the future, as I have as a board member, would follow the culture and habits and policies and practice of the board, as well as following the item and the order of the agenda items. With that, Supervisor Kuehl. Madam Chair, I, I, that, Supervisor that Kuehl had her hand up. No, that Supervisor Kuehl. Madam Chair, you did interrupt me, and no board member ever tells another board member what they can or cannot say at a board meeting. You control what is heard, but you do not control the content of what anybody says at this board. But if you're out of order with regard to what's being discussed at the time, well, I think it's appropriate ladies. to acknowledge that you were out of order, but I did stop and let you finish speaking, so... With all due respect, Ladies. we'll now move on, move on to Supervisor Ladies. Kuehl. Supervisor Thank Kuehl. So Thank you, Madam Chair. Everybody take a deep breath now. Here we are. Um, I wanted to correct, if I may, respectfully, one thing that uh, my colleague Supervisor Barger indicated. Um, I, I totally accept that in her opinion, the subject matter experts are the probation department and those who work there. However, when the state decided to close their facilities for these young people and delegate to the counties to make a plan, each of the 58 counties, to make a plan about how we would handle this population, they specifically did not look to probation for the plan, specifically. They specifically said there would be constituted an advisory body in the state that would do the work that our group did and come back with what they thought the best plan was for the counties in each of the 58 counties. In Alpine or Lake or some of the smaller counties, they do not have camps. And so they have asked the DSCC for permission to use their halls, a portion thereof, as permanent facilities. Most of the counties that are large, however, have not. They have separate facilities. Um, I happen to be very good friends with the presiding judge of the Sacramento Juvenile Court. Actually, I'm even related to her. And we've had long talks about what's going on in her county, my county, and also uh, she's, um, she chairs the group that talks about juvenile law in the whole state. Uh, and, you know, in other counties. So simply to say that, yes, probation is an expert of a type, but the state specifically did not look to them for a plan, but rather outside of probation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments on the item? Seeing none. Item 10 is, um, as amended is before us. I will move, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl, to approve this item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 10, as amended, is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. No. Supervisor Barger, no. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries four to one.
Thank you. We'll now move on to item 13, proclaiming Women's History Month in 2022. It was held. We wanted to create an opportunity for everyone to acknowledge who their honorees are. So I'd like to begin by thanking the LA County Commission for Women for their work in serving our entire county. A special note of gratitude to President Carrie Ann Farrell Hines for leading the commission during these unique and challenging times. I'd also like to recognize the commission's commitment to the Resilient Scholarship, which provides financial assistance to young women who are preparing for college. I held today's proclamation because I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge this year's Women of the Year honorees for all of us to have the privilege of doing so. The second district honoree is Bridget Coulter. I'm delighted to honor the second district's Woman of the Year. She holds multiple titles, including mother, wife, entrepreneur, designer, activist, and philanthropist. Most notably, in 2018, Bridget founded Blackbird Collective, a private global collective for women of color and other allies. In 2019, Blackbird's Pilot House launched in Culver City to foster a balance between productivity, well-being, creativity, and advocacy rooted in community with values that include authenticity, positivity, access, and inclusion. Some of her other philanthropic work focuses on climate change, racial justice, political decency, women's equity, and increasing access to education for marginalized communities. So we want to thank Blackbird and Bridget, and we value your work and are proud to recognize you as our 2022 Woman of the Year. At this moment, I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues who may wish to recognize their honorees. We'll start with SD1, Supervisor Solis. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to also wish everyone a happy Women's History Month. And I am delighted to recognize, in my opinion, a fearless leader and relentless advocate for the first district. I've known her for more than, I want to say, 20, 25 years. Rosa Soto. Rosa is a first generation Latina from a very humble and hardworking Mexican family. She grew up in the first district in East LA and later moved on to the city of El Monte and saw firsthand how systemic injustices impacted her family and communities. She became a leader for children's rights and community health. Rosa helped launch and now leads the Health Innovation Community Partnership, a health equity table established in 2017 through a motion by our board. The HICAP group has advocated for the passage of more than a dozen county policies, including transitional and permanent supportive housing, the restorative care village, local and target hire programs, and the reuse of our very own general hospital, and a comprehensive community benefits policy that includes arts and culture and requirements to improve community connections in development projects. And Rosa, many of you know, has been at the forefront of all of these efforts. She also runs the Prometoras program, which this board has championed out of the Wellness Center at LAC USC Medical Campus. Throughout her distinguished career, she has created women empowerment programs to encourage young women to seek higher education. She has been recognized as an organizational leader and a policy expert by state and national foundations, foundations such as the California Endowment, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and Kaiser Permanente. She was recognized as the 20, 2003 recipient of San Gabriel Valley's YWCA Women of the Year in Children's Health and for her work in childhood obesity prevention with First Lady Michelle Obama's Drink Up campaign in 2014. Rosa has been a mentor and advisor to more than 50 young women throughout her career, guiding them through college decision-making, career opportunities, and community advocacy campaigns to improve access to health for Los Angeles communities. On top of all of that, Rosa is currently my appointee to Measure J, the advisory committee, advocating for the equitable distribution of county resources to our most burdened communities. I am so deeply honored to know and recognize her and to work with her on behalf of our residents in the first district. May she continue to be blessed and for those many blessings that she's given so many of us in the county. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, and SD3. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to do this. I think the broader audience doesn't always uh, get to hear us introduce our honorees at the luncheon, so this is great. I am very, very proud to say that this year's Honoree from the third district is Stephanie Klasky Gamer, who is the president and CEO of LA Family Housing. Uh, really, honestly, one of my sheroes. 
she, you know, we can have an idea, but then we say, oh, everybody else, please carry out the idea. That's what Stephanie's doing on affordable housing and especially housing with services. She's been the CEO of LA Family Housing since 2007. And under her leadership, LA Family Housing has transformed into one of the region's largest homeless service providers and a premier developer of environmentally sustainable affordable housing in Southern California. The nonprofit agency has grown exponentially under her leadership. They now own 30 affordable interim and supportive housing buildings across the county with an additional 700 units in various stages of development. Last year, LA Family Housing connected almost 12,000 people with housing resources and supportive services. And of those 2,400 were placed in permanent homes. She's a passionate advocate and considered an expert in the field of community development, serving in many leadership roles that shape and promote housing and homelessness policy. She has more than 30 years experience in social and economic justice work and her initiative to evolve and grow, make her one of the best leaders in community service. She's a shining example for women who are business leaders, who are advocates, who are organizers on how one can do well and still do good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, SD4. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you, uh, Supervisor Mitchell, for holding this item so that we can highlight Women's History Month here in LA County. Uh, I wanna talk about my honoree for the fourth di district, and that's Christina Lujan. It was last fall um, that I learned about the strike taking place at the John Denaire Bakery in Santa Fe Springs. And I think Supervisor Solis, uh, you came out there a couple of times as well. And Christina was one of the many women who went on strike for over 100 days for better pay, better working conditions. And most of the women and most of the workers that we saw out there were women. Um, and most of the workers at this John Denaire uh, Bakery are women. And they were on the picket line every day in the cold, sometimes it was raining, um, through Thanksgiving, uh, through Christmas. And many times their kids uh, were with them. Many of them were little, and so they were with them uh, all day, but some of them came after school. That's where they did their after school uh, homework was on the picket line with their moms. This was extremely hard for these women, but they stood their ground and they were successful. They got a new fair contract and a pay increase. And Christina is one of those who was so strong and who really showed leadership out there. Um, I went out there several times and I got to meet her and I was inspired by her um, as well as all the fellow strikers. And that's why for me, uh, Christina was a clear choice to be my honoree for the woman of the year. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and SD5. Thank you. Um, it is my honor to announce that the woman of the year for the fifth Supergovernmental District is a successful business owner who gives back to her community. Beatriz Betty Porto, co-owner of Porto's Bakery. She is the eldest daughter of the Porto family, helping to run and expand this business empire. Porto's is one of the most successful and popular bakeries in the Southland. Porto's Bakery is iconic, a family business that serves a community, offering affordable bakery options for everyone. It was started by her late mother, Rosa Porto. The Porto family are the perfect example of the American dream. The family left Castro's Cuba with nothing but Rosa's love of baking in 1973. Their can-do spirit built a bakery chain that is a loyal clientele both here in Los Angeles County and quite frankly, around the world. During this pandemic, Porto's reopened while following health orders, allowing outside pickup at their stores, and they began to mail frozen bake at home options for several of their most popular items, their cheese rolls, potato balls, and more. This way, their businesses were able to continue to employ hundreds of employees that otherwise would have been on unemployment. During the pandemic, 
Porto's Bakery has made countless donations to first responders at local hospitals. Porto's Bakery also honors our service veterans, providing them with delicious meals. Betty Porto is not just a role model, she truly gives back to her community. Betty Porto and her siblings have been increasingly involved in the community by supporting many organizations, including the Glendale Healthy Kids, the American Red Cross, the Glendale Police and Fire Departments, and the Alex Theater. For the past several years, Betty Porto, a La Cunada Point Ridge resident, has been a supporter of the Union Rescue Mission, don donating the remaining food from Porto's Bakery and Cafe at the end of each day. She is a remarkable woman who has been honored in 2005. She was named the Latin Businesswoman of the Year by the National Latin Businesswoman Association. The same year, Porto's Bakery was named the Na nation's Retail Bakery of the Year by the prestigious Modern Baking Magazine and Business of the Year by the Glendale Kiwanis Club in 2007. I can't think of anyone more fitting to receive the honor of Woman of the Year for the 5th District. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you and thanks to all the supervisors for recognizing these amazing women who contribute to the fabric of LA County. The commission is also proud to announce the Dr. Barbara Ferrer as this year's recipient of the President's Award. Lastly, again, the commission um, makes six at-large selections, honorees, for their contributions in the areas of education, health, arts and media, business, labor, law, public safety, women veterans, and this year's at-large honorees include Kelly Dillon, founder and director of Back to Basics, an organization tackling social problems through community empowerment and education. She's helped lead the fight for justice for survivors of forced sterilizations across California. Cynthia McLean Hill, co-founder of Strategic Council and one of the state's most sought after policy strategists. Dr. Lourdes Ramos, the first Latina president and CEO of the Long Beach Museum of Latin American Art. Kelly Todd Griffin, convener of the California Black Women's Collective and champion of all things related to health, social, and economic justice for black women and girls across the state of California. Lauren Trusclair Duncan, executive director at Healing California and co-chair of both the Women Veterans and the Families and Children Working Groups of the LA Veterans Collaborative connecting veterans and military families with a range of resources from healthcare to resiliency training. And Cindy Wu, she came to the US without speaking English and is a trailblazer with, only, with over 20 years of experience in education, business, and real estate, including teaching art for an after school program. She was recently elected as president of LA County's School Trustees Association and is a guest lecturer at Citrus and Glendale College. Again, those are the six at-large me members and the president's award recipient that the commission votes on. I look forward to celebrating all of our honorees at the 37th annual Women of the Year commemorative celebration. Congratulations to all of you. Are there any supervisors that wish to make any additional comments? Hearing none, item 13 is before us. I'll be happy to move. Seconded by Supervisor uh, Kuhl as pro tem to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 13 is before you. Supervisor Solis. Yes. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuhl. Aye. Supervisor Kuhl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, I motion carries five to zero. Item 14, ensuring the equitable decarbonization of buildings, which is held by Supervisor Kuhl. Supervisor Kuhl. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I believe my colleague, Supervisor Barger, has a friendly amendment, which I am accepting and which I would uh, ask uh, that you call on her after we talk about the motion in chief uh, to explain to us if that's okay. Uh, but I wanna say I'm really excited to bring this motion today. Um, I don't know whether you guys all know, but I am your representative on the South Coast Air Quality Management District Board. And those of you who serve like Supervisor Solis know that you become increasingly aware of the significant air pollution impacts that the use of fossil fuels uh, causes. But we didn't really have a lot of understanding about what kind of pollution is caused by the use of fossil fuels inside our buildings. because. Indoor pollution significantly raises the likelihood of childhood asthma. We've seen a number of quite recent studies, and I found that kind of surprising. 
Uh, we know that ambient air pollution like ozone uh, are at unhealthy levels during the region, but we just are seeing that new studies show that children in homes that burn gas for their cooking are 42% more likely to experience asthma symptoms and have a 24% higher chance of being diagnosed with lifetime asthma. Uh, additionally, just a couple of weeks ago, this board passed a motion to establish a climate resilience initiative, which is about how we take care of ourselves in these changing uh, situations. So I hope that will help direct us in terms of the critical work we might need to do to protect our communities from the effects of climate crises, extreme heat, wildfires, drought, and flooding. But as we talk about resilience, we need to do everything we can to reduce emissions of all kinds. So this motion begins the process to look at how we might phase out or reduce the use of natural gas in new residential and commercial construction and develop programs to help folks swap out if they choose their existing gas appliances with electric appliances. Uh, residential and commercial buildings are the second largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the county. Ozone, uh, particulate pollution, et cetera. Also want to say that um, people sometimes say, well, we shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket, meaning the electric basket. But I want to point out that while older models of stoves and hot water heaters and gas space heaters might work during a power outage, most of the new models actually have safety features that shut off the gas flow when there's a power outage. So they can't even be lit by a match. So we need to look at kind of how things are changing. And what this does, it's not a mandate. It is not imposed on our residents. What we're doing is stakeholder engagement, engaging with agencies, looking for funding to begin to develop the kind of plan that might help us help our residents reduce their reliance on um, gas-driven appliances. There would be tremendous benefits for air quality and climate issues. We can't meet climate goals without it. 50 cities in the state have already required zero emissions for new construction, and uh, I think we would do well to join them. I'd like to thank uh, my co-author, Supervisor Mitchell, and all of the department staff that have helped us, and I ask for your I vote. Supervisor Barger, you have a amendment? Yes, thank you. First of all, I want to thank you, Brother Kuehl. Um, this motion is, is important, and, and as you know, um, we voted on February 8th to address this issue on a larger scale, and I know that your office was interested in doing just what we're doing today. Um, policymakers nationwide and worldwide are aggressively pursuing equitable transitions to renewable technologies through efforts such as decarbonization. As a result, increased legislative efforts to pursue decarbonization and electrification to reduce environmental impacts in communities have become more prominent. Environmental justice efforts have made evident the need to ensure that vulnerable and underserved communities are not subjected to as policies that will perpetuate historical inequities. Over the last few years, we've seen an increase in wildfires statewide. And we talk about how wildfire is no longer a season, it is year round, which have consequently resulted in utilities increasing their use of public safety power shutoffs. When faced with the PSPS event, when the utility company preemptively energizes their infrastructure, these regions are often left without access to communications compounded by the distinct climates where weather patterns can often be more extreme. For rural, less dense communities outside the basin, many of which are located in mountain passes, high desert, or mountainous regions, their electric redundancy is almost non-existent. This is in part due to the lack of historic underinvestment in the infrastructure of these communities. Utilities such as Southern California Edison are now investing in hardening their infrastructure to ensure the reliability of the power supply. The risk can be mitigated through robust uh, policy planning and decision making that accounts for the needs of our communities and the implications of how our actions affect them. I would like to offer a friendly amendment that considers decarbonization efforts based on 
local feasibility, a modification to directive two, and it would read um, uh, at the end where it says substantial renovations where feasible to add the language and in consideration of the varying climate, geography and infrastructure challenges that rural communities face starting in 2023. And again, that's a friendly amendment, accepting what you're saying and just recognizing that part of it. So again, thank you for um, this motion. Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl and Mitchell for introducing the motion. You know, living in a clean environment is really essential to our health and well-being. And the effects of pollution on physical health are extensive and, as you know, well-documented. We already know that outdoor air pollution is having a serious threat, with five out of 10 Americans living in areas with unhealthy air. But indoors, as was stated earlier, air pollution is largely unregulated. Despite the number of risks associated with emissions from the combustion of gas in buildings for cooking, heating, water heating, methane leaks throughout the gas distribution system. And we know that studies have shown that the indoor environment, where we spent a considerable amount of time during the pandemic, may be more, may be more susceptible to pollution as gas combustion can result in a spike of nitrogen and carbon monoxide to levels that would violate outdoor pollutant standards. We also know that certain populations are more susceptible to the risks of increased emissions indoor. Children, as you know, are more vulnerable due to several factors, including their developing lungs and smaller body size. And especially low-income communities of color may also be disproportionately impacted with risk factors, including increased exposure due to smaller and older homes and higher rates of asthma. These low-income communities of color must be prioritized when designing policies to support a transition to reducing or phasing out fossil fuels in existing residential and commercial buildings. I understand the greater impact that buildings have on our state's greenhouse gas emissions and that the state building standards have required buildings to be wired for electrical appliances starting in 2023. I recognize the new jobs that will be created by such policies, but also recognize that this may not be an easy task for our current workers. I'm glad that this motion sets out a comprehensive engagement process with the city of Los Angeles that includes such workers, environmental justice advocates, housing advocates, unions, and others on approaches to decarbonize new and existing buildings while also supporting utility customers and our workers, preventing unintended consequences to housing affordability and availability, and ensuring the resiliency of our energy system. We may also need to explore more in-depth examination of other policies, including pairing training programs with job placement services and requiring companies receiving public funds to pay appropriate wages and hire from underrepresented groups to ensure that the utilization of highly skilled and qualified workers is maximized across our investments. That too will help reduce emissions. I'm happy to uh, support the motion and congratulate uh, both the author and the co-author. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh... Again, uh, Supervisor Kuehl, today's motion ensures that equity is actually baked into our building decarbonization process and policies from the beginning through a robust stakeholder engagement process that intentionally seeks the input of our communities most disproportionately impacted and too often excluded from um, policymaking processes across the board. So thank you for the opportunity to co-author with you, um, and I look forward to supporting the motion. Any other questions or comments on this item? Hearing none, item 14 is before us. Moved by Supervisor Kuehl. I will second to approve this item as amended. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 14 as amended is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Item 17, support for Governor Gavin Newsom's Community Assistance Recovery and Empowerment Care Court Proposal. It was held by Supervisor Hahn. Supervisor Hahn. Uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Mitchell. Last week, uh, Governor Newsom introduced a new framework to address the mental health and homelessness crisis here in California. He calls it the CARE Court which stands for Community Assistance, Recovery, and Empowerment Court. 
The proposal will use the courts to connect people with severe mental illness to the support that they need by assigning them a community care team who will develop a treatment plan specifically for them. This will be an upstream model that gets to vulnerable people before they come in contact with the criminal justice system or need a conservatorship. So colleagues, the motion before you today will officially throw our support behind this idea by sending a five signature letter to the state and directing our legislative team to advocate in support. But I also know there are a lot of details that still need to be worked out. I'm sure many of my colleagues have questions about how this program is going to be implemented and funded. This motion also directs our county departments, like our Department of Mental Health, our Office of Diversion and Reentry, and our public defender to collaborate with the state to help design the program because it's important that we have a seat at the table. And I know Supervisor Mitchell, uh, you actually already met with the governor uh, last week at a care court round table, along with Dr. Ochoa from our Office of Diversion and Reentry. And I hope this motion will encourage more of those conversations with LA County stakeholders. I personally think this care court has a lot of potential because of the experience I had, and we heard people call in this morning um, with our Redondo Beach homeless court that uses a similar model to connect unhoused individuals to service and housing. The Redondo Beach Homeless Court is an example of how courts can be used to support instead of punishing, and it's helped permanently house 22 people since it began a year and a half ago. That's why I'm particularly hopeful about this care court proposal, because I've seen similar models work already. I think the care court will give us an opportunity to help our most vulnerable residents. Status quo is simply not working. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Barger. Thank you, and I wanna thank you, Supervisor Hahn, for inviting me to co-author this motion and for your partnership in addressing mental health services in this county, something that is near and dear to my heart. For years, this county has been calling on the state to remove barriers that limit our ability to serve our most vulnerable residents. This new care court model is a step in that direction. It creates a process for the county to come alongside those most in need. And I say alongside those most in need and provide them with the resources to make decisions to care for themselves. The care court also builds a framework for helping those who may at first be hesitant toward treatment that they critically need. I'm looking forward to working with the state on implementing this and ensuring our county service providers have the opportunity to collaborate with state partners on how this can and will be most effective. But again, I wanna thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Um, I think this is an exciting um, opportunity for us to really be at the forefront of helping those that are the most vulnerable on our streets. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. Uh, I know you have proposed amendments and you'll be followed by Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor Solis. Thank, thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you, Supervisor Hahn and Supervisor Barger for introducing the motion. Like so many of our residents, I'm also concerned with the cycle between our emergency rooms, homelessness, and our jails, which we are seeing in real time on our streets every day. We've invested significantly in addressing these issues while we are helping more than ever. The pandemic, as you know, has resulted in more people needing mental health assistance than ever before. We need new creative solutions to get people the care and treatment that they need. That's why I'm voting in support of today's motion. The governor's proposed care court framework is the type of bold action needed to help those who need it the most. The proposal gives our families, our providers in the county, overall more tools to bring people into care. But as we all know, a program is only successful if it has the resources and funding available to back it up with. That's why I've introduced a friendly amendment to this motion, and I thank Supervisor Hahn for accepting it. I agree with the motion's director that we should be supporting the proposal, but I also believe we should advocate for the funding and resources needed to ensure the successful implementation. That's why with this friendly amendment, at the end of the first directive, I'm adding while advocating for the necessary dedicated and ongoing funding to ensure its successful implementation. And additionally, at the end of the second directive, following 
framework for the CARE Corps program, I am also adding, as well as for the necessary dedicated and ongoing funding to ensure its successful implementation. I am very grateful that the governor uh, has made this uh, investment uh, and thus far has done so much in the mental health arena, um, but we do need to have funding for these programs. But to ensure success of the program, the court, the public defender, and oversight will require new and ongoing funding. And I wanna make sure that we're avoiding a situation in which funding from other initiatives we're investing in, like the alternative crisis response and mobile response teams we discussed, isn't diverted away from what those funds were intended for. The need is so great, we need to make sure that we have dedicated funding to support this initiative. And additionally, I wanna raise an issue of self-determination that other stakeholders like the ACLU and Disability Rights California have pointed out. I recognize that the state is working with these groups on their concerns, and I hope that we can also help the state with the implementation of the plan. We too have a lot at stake and we need to come together and work with all of our stakeholders. So thank you again, Supervisor Hahn and Barger, and especially for accepting my amendment. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, initially, I was tempted to abstain on this. I think you know that I have been very, very concerned about kind of forced medication and the kinds of things that have been talked about in the past. Um, but I will vote in favor of this uh, for a number of reasons. One is the green sheet um, uh, amendment that says that all we're saying here today is that we will encourage or tell our advocates in Sacramento to advocate in support of the framework that has been presented because we, we don't see any details yet. And even asking you know, or advocating for funds doesn't necessarily mean that we would get them and we don't wanna be stuck giving a blank check essentially. Because one of the concerns I have is that the, under the proposal, counties cannot opt in or frankly out. Um, and so we're, it will be imposed on us to do this. And the original concept was within your own money. Good luck, guys. So it, it's great. I mean, a couple of us actually were up at the state and loved devolving some of this responsibility down to counties. But now that we're here, we're going like, whoa. Um, and especially this notion of voluntary, being voluntarily, you know, getting service and, and the referral to shared decision-making. Uh, any of the people who went to Trieste saw this model actually in a small town, not so small town, but medium-sized town setting where there really was shared decision-making in uh, pursuing help, but it's really staff intensive. So I think we need to understand how much personnel would really be engaged to make this a success. And we certainly don't want to be a failure at it because we're big um, and, and everybody watches us. So I will vote in favor of um, advocating in Sacramento and proposed for the proposed framework, knowing that we're also telling them, keep an eye at every committee, you know, on what's kind of being added on in terms of what the county is supposed to do and, you know, good luck. Um, so thank you very much for bringing this. I think it's really exciting. We have mental health courts. We have trauma courts. They're, they've really done some good. And I look forward to uh, seeing this develop in a very positive way. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisor Hahn. Yeah, thank you. And thank you so much, um, uh, Supervisor Kuehl. I, I, I was pretty much uh, uh, prepared for you to... Uh, abstain because I do know that you've always had um, such a keen uh, concern uh, for those particularly most vulnerable uh, among us. But I also think the other thing I just think is worth pointing out again is, um, yes, we're supporting the framework, but right, this motion also tells our public defender, our Department of Mental Health, um, our Office of Diversion and Reentry to get up there and help design this with many of your concerns in mind um, as we ultimately see this program, uh, you know, uh, materialize. So I think that's the other really important part of this 
is not that we're just supporting the framework, but we want to be there and help design it and maybe um, uh, highlight some potential pitfalls and uh, trying to to avoid that um, as this program, as you said, becomes something that we kind of have to uh, be a part of. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And thank you, Supervisor Hahn, for bringing it forward. And you acknowledge that I was at the round table. Yes, I was uh, privileged to have been invited by the governor's office to attend the round table because it took place in the second supervisorial district. Um, and we were joined by um, one of our judges from our county mental health court, representatives from the Office of Office and Diversion Reentry and the fire department, as well as a number of critical service providers. In fact, the one that actually operates the 30 plus bed mental health treatment program that he did visit where the round table took place. Special services for groups. The residents there, just to report back to you all a little bit of what the governor heard and learned. The residents really expressed their gratitude, quite frankly, that their dignity had been restored through the program. Uh, that was something that the governor really keyed in on. The ODR program serves as an example of how individuals can stabilize, begin healing, and exit homelessness with a court-ordered care plan that includes clinical prescribed, clinically prescribed interventions with supportive services, medication, and a housing plan. The governor really focused because one of the uh, graduates of the program that was there who talked about his transition into permanent supportive housing. The governor asked him about the job he has and what kind of supports he received in that facility that are helping him with his successful transition. The governor himself was very clear that all of the details of the care court proposal still need to be developed. So that was, quite frankly, music to my ears. I told him about your motion, Supervisor Hahn, and that we'd be watching it very closely and would have input to meet the needs of LA County. For example, I think the required level of services and the source of ongoing funding for services need to be identified from the state level. Trust and believe I leaned in hard on that message. We should also ask the state to build an entitlement to housing so we can sustain our own programs like ODR um, that the board had the vision to create long before he came up with this idea. We need to address staffing shortages in programs that Care Court will utilize like Department of Mental Health's home program. And we need to prioritize which individuals we will target. You know, I was proud that he came to the second district to view um, one of our ODR facilities. And I have to say that while I fully support the concept, um, the details will be critically important. And I'm really conditioning my I vote today on our commitment to create care court beds countywide. What the judge, what the service providers, what the residents all said to the governor was, we've got a great model here. Care Court really kind of expand the population we have to serve, and it can only be successful if we have the beds for people to go to. The judge was very clear. He thought more judges, even those that operate outside of the mental health court, would be happy to send people to programs as long as there was a place to send them. And so I think that we've got to make sure that we've got resources from the state, as you all have stated, to make sure we expand beds, and I hope that they really are countywide as a result. I think the, the vast majority of the ODR beds are currently in the second district. That's great, but we need to make sure that these spaces are available all across the entire county. Um, so with that, are there any other questions or comments? Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I wanted to also uh, make a kind of distinction from ODR because ODR is doing great work, but I, I think everybody knows, but I want to um, repeat that in order to get services from the Office of Diversion and Reentry, you actually have to plead to something, which creates a criminal record. Now, it's not a fault of ODR. It's just that their population are those who are being sentenced to diversion instead of jail. And that was a great start that we made. But the, the good thing possibly about this care court is that you wouldn't have to plead guilty to anything. Right. And it's have upstream. A criminal record. You know, it's more upstream. Um, the, the downside might be, though, where we've seen judges just decide how the county should spend money. So we want to see in the law that we are required to develop these resources, but not 
you know, just out of someone's imagination. And I think that's why we want to watch it as it goes along, but it could be absolutely great. So thank you, Madam Chair. Excellent, seeing no further questions. Item 17 is before us, moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Supervisor Barger to approve this item as amended. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 17 as amended is before you. Supervisor Solis. Uh, aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item 18, proclaiming Transit Operator Appreciation Day, which was held by Supervisor Hahn. Supervisor Hahn? Yeah, thank you, uh, Supervisor Mitchell. I brought this motion forward along with you uh, to take a moment to acknowledge our transit drivers with Transit Driver Appreciation Day uh, this Friday, March 18th. Uh, all of us collectively sit on uh, as board as directors uh, of the board of directors of uh, Metropolitan Transit Authority, and we know uh, up close and personal. Uh, the role that our transit drivers play. And through the, out the past two years of this pandemic, transit has been a lifeline, providing no fewer than a half a million, million boardings a day in LA County at the lowest period of ridership, and now back up to over a million boardings a day across all of our transit services. In fact, LA County saw the smallest drop in transit ridership of any of the nation's big cities, which just goes to show how many people here in LA County depend on transit and what a critical service this is for our region. And throughout this pandemic, our transit drivers have continued to ensure that workers can get to their jobs, children can get to school, see their parents, and that students um, all over uh, at any level of school can get to class. Our transit drivers have also been suffering through COVID, having to take care of loved ones, get to the doctor, still feed their families, and that is why they deserve our gratitude more than just this one day a year, but every single day, because transit drivers are central to our economy and to our residents' ability to meet their most, most basic needs. I hope that all of our LA County transit drivers know that they have our full support and our gratitude for what they do day in and day out. And with that, colleagues, I'd like to thank uh, Chair Mitchell for co-authoring this motion with me, and I ask for your support. Thank you very much, Supervisor Hahn, for reminding us how critically important transit uh, operators are and that we should appreciate them not only Friday, but every day. Um, I took a moment yesterday to throw a little tiny party for one transit operator, uh, Ms. Tanisha Smith, uh, and we brought a drum line to the bus stop and celebrated her on behalf of all of her colleagues. Yesterday was her 20th anniversary operating the bus for Metro. Uh, and we had a really healthy conversation about what they need from all of us um, and, and how she's going to help us recruit the 500 bus operators, Supervisor Solis, um, that we know we need to make the system on time and safe and reliable for every LA County resident. So thank you for the opportunity to co-author this with you. Any other comments from supervisors? Seeing none, it's before us, item 18, moved by Supervisor Hahn. I'll be happy to second to approve the item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 18 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item 26, assistance to new arrivals from the Ukraine was held by Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. As you know, uh, as of last week, more than 2.5 million people, mostly women and children from Ukraine, have fled the country because of Putin's senseless war. Millions more have been displaced and will eventually seek refuge in neighboring countries. This board remains in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. And I support the president's actions in regard to sanctions and applaud his decision to grant temporary protected status to Ukrainians who are currently here, which this board requested thanks to the motion by Supervisor Hahn. The president 
also said that the United States should welcome Ukrainian refugees with open arms. And I agree, as we have done time and time again, most recently with Afghan refugees and unaccompanied children at the border, the Los Angeles County should support the federal administration's effort to resettle new arrivals from Ukraine. Many Ukrainian refugees have fled to neighboring countries and may want to remain in Europe in case there's a chance to return to their home in the future. And countries in the European Union are providing Ukrainian refugees with short-term residency and other benefits such as work authorization. The United States should do the same, provide humanitarian parole visas to Ukrainians who have family members in the United States and want to reside here. My motion directs the CEO to coordinate our, de our departments and work with the Office of Refugee Resettlement, the California Department of Social Services, and many other relevant agencies to provide assistance to new Ukrainian arrivals and to provide information on obtaining temporary protected status and affirmative immigration relief to Ukraine Ukrainians who are already here. As the largest county in the United States, we must do our part to support Ukrainians who are fleeing this devastating war. When I was in Congress as a part of the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, also known as the U.S. Helsinki Commission, I had the honor of traveling to the site of the Chernobyl nuclear plant in Ukraine and spent some time meeting various individuals representing that country. Now my heart breaks at, as the images of Ukrainians, particularly women and children, suffering at the hands of a violent dictator. It's a reminder to all of us that refugees deserve our support, no matter where they come from. With that, I honorably ask for your I vote. Thank you, Supervisor. Any other comments? Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Supervisor Solis. Uh, I mentioned my grandparents at the last meeting about their coming from Ukraine, but I was always sort of uh, stunned at uh, various kinds of work here in LA County where you come in contact with people who are activists, who are leaders, who are organizers. Uh, and in the Jewish community, I was uh, sort of amazed at how many were from Ukraine, uh, their grandparents or their parents. And I think it's uh, due to the settlement efforts in the Fairfax area because it had been quite intentional to not only welcome, but really attract and help try to keep families together. And I think it's very important when we do that. We have sort of a mixed record about welcoming immigrants, uh, certainly even here in the county, uh, one that we have worked very hard to turn around in the past several years, taking a number of actions on this board to help immigrants do better, thrive, be safe, and grow. And this is definitely in that line, but uh, it's also a little more personal to me. So I thank you very much for this. And I look forward to the efforts that we might make to help. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. Of course, any other comments? Item 26 is before us, moved by Supervisor Salis, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl to approve this item. Executive officer, please call roll. Item 26 is before you, Supervisor Salis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item 30, report on the progress of the Women and Girls Initiative Governing Council. Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very, very much, Madam Chair. Last meeting we talked about thanking all of those who had participated on the Governing Council, uh, and um, they have issued their final report. So with your permission, I asked Abby Land if she might wrap up in no more than four minutes um, some of the recommendations or the ideas or the experience, whatever she wants to say. This was very important to, to me, of course, but to, I think to all of us to take a look at how the county uh, was uh, doing with its women and girls, uh, with the women who work for us, with the women and girls whom we serve, and in the broader communities, just taking gender into account in the many, 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 many policies that we put forward. So with your permission, Madam Chair, uh, and after anyone else wants to make comments or before as you choose, 
uh, I think Abby Land should be on let's, and able to talk to us. Yeah, let's have um, Ms. Land um, speak first and then if there are questions after. Okay, let's see if she's there. Hello. Oh, good. There I am. Oh, there she is. There you are. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Supervisor Kuhl, and thank you, uh, Chair Mitchell and, and all the Board of Supervisors. Before I tell you about our final report and all the work that we've done in four minutes, I just want to thank each and every one of you for appointing the most amazing group of women to be the um, Women and Girls Governing Council. Your appointees really drove this work, and I want to give them all a big shout out, uh, led by B. Stotzer, our current chair, and our vice chair, Wendy Gruel. But I want to also acknowledge Araceli Campos and Sharon Shelton, who also served as chairs. We couldn't have done this work without that group, and so thank you very much. So in four minutes, um, the WGI has spent um, a lot of time really trying to understand the inequities that women and girls face working for the county, the services that they get, and sometimes when we work in partnership. And I think that we have learned a lot. Um, as you read our final report, you will see that during this time, we were able to accomplish a lot. Uh, we issued the first employee climate survey to really get a good sense of how our employees here in LA County were feeling about issues, especially issues that impact women and girls. And in our second survey, we've had over 43% turnout, men and women answering so we really can understand. We've issued reports around the issues of having more women in the sheriff's department. We've done uh, reports on how to really stem the uh, school to prison pipeline for girls, especially girls of color. We've done reports on economic resiliency to try to understand the impact of COVID and how it's going to impact the um, ability for economic mobility for women and girls. So we have certainly done a lot, but I think as we have done our work, we've also found some barriers because we know, and I think you all know from your many motions that data is key. And if we don't have the data, we actually don't have the ability to not only be accountable, but we sometimes can't figure out are our programs really meeting the needs. And um, I'm happy to say the county, all departments are very eager to look at how they can be collecting more gender data um, because that's critical. We've developed a tool, a gender impact assessment tool that will help county departments do that. And in the midst of COVID, in the midst of, you know, the biggest pandemic we've ever faced, county departments have stood up and really want to be part of this. So I think as you read our final report, you will see that there is a um, theme about the need for us to look at innovative ways to collect data, to make sure we are collecting gender data. And when we say gender data, we really mean that intersectional lens. We want data so we can look at the impacts on women, women of, uh, who are older, women of color. We want to make sure that we really are looking at um, sexual orientation, that it's, it's clear because even though we're all women and girls, the impacts are very different. I mean, today is equal pay day, equal pay day for some women, but not for all women. So um, on, on behalf of the Women and Girls Initiative, I really thank you for this. We are eager for phase two where we will continue this work, continue um, with the gender impact assessment, looking at how to implement CEDAW that you all just approved a couple of months ago, plus a number of other initiatives. But we certainly couldn't have done it without your support. And on behalf of us, I say thank you so very, very much. Abby, I want to thank you on behalf of the whole board. Um, you were just the right choice and really, really made it happen. Um, and it's it's very important because we we did not elevate women to be more important than others in the community, but we wanted to make certain that they also weren't really on the back burner uh, because there were still a lot of invisible barriers and uh, things that we just didn't think about. I mean, requirements to be in the sheriff's department that were so outdated for modern policing that we needed to look at post standards, for instance. Um, and the way our own HR looked at just the descriptions of jobs 
that sounded like, oh, I, that sounds like a man's job to me. And it was just in the language and it wasn't, uh -huh. you know, meant to be that way. So this has been very, very useful work. And though I will not be serving on this board after the end of November, I will be committed along with you to seeing what we can do to keep implementation of these recommendations going, whether it's locally or in Sacramento or even uh, in the Fed, the federal government. I think it's going to be make a big difference for our women and girls. So thank you very much. Thank um, you. Is the chair on? The okay, chair of the, the board? Bye. Yes, I am. Oh, good. Back to you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, I didn't see your picture. Like, on yeah, my gee, who's she talking about? Yeah, here I am. Uh, Back to you. <laughs> thank you, Supervisor Solis. I think I saw Supervisor Han's hand. Yeah, Supervisor Han, and then Supervisor yeah, Solis. Yeah. And by the way, Supervisor Mitchell, we can't see you for some reason. Um, we see a picture of the boardroom, but I don't, don't know see. why, because I see myself, and in the hearing room, okay. we can see me too. So I'm not sure what's okay. happening. Okay, um, well, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, wherever you are. Um, and thank you, Supervisor Kuehl, uh, for holding this item, because I know you certainly were the impetus behind us even doing a Women and Girls Initiative. And thank you to Abby uh, for um, you know leading this effort. Uh, and I agree, I think we're going to find nuggets in here that hopefully will change the trajectory for women and girls in LA County for a long, long time. And I know now we're moving to implementation. Uh, it's not gonna be Abby. We've, we've gone out for a new uh, person to actually implement these recommendations. And I think it's gonna be important uh, that we see how this initiative strategy will continue to help us uh, recruit and retain women within the fire department. I know that was a big uh, um, issue for me. Uh, I think it will help us focus more on what parental leave actually looks like for our families. And I think it will create more affordable and quality childcare in order for our mothers to stay in the workforce. So those are the kinds of things I'm hoping that uh, this implementation phase will bring to fr fruition. I will say I would be remiss if I didn't channel one of my um, appointees, Dr. Carmen Shea, who you probably know what I'm going to say, um, and express a little bit of our disappointment that um, the uh, report uh, did not prioritize older women as much as I know she wanted. And I think me too, now that I'm getting older and older, um, the report um, said that uh, the Women and Girls Initiative is going to work with uh, WEDACs to help women over the age of 55 with career services job training, career development, but it didn't really, it was very vague in, in my opinion. And I was hoping that maybe after five years of work, the plans for older women in the county would be more concrete and more prioritized because of course, uh, we're the fastest growing demographic here in LA County. But having said that, I, I really did wanna thank you for, for the work. Um, I wanted to thank my appointees, Dr. Carmen Shea, Jane Templin and Dr. Perla Hernandez uh, for helping to elevate the voices of women and girls, uh, not just in the fourth district really, but for the entire county. So again, thank you to my commissioners for their advocacy, for helping to shape this work. Thank you, Abby, uh, for your leadership in getting us to this point. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you. you. Can, can you all see me now? You, am I still not there? No. If you can see the boardroom, can you see me waving at you, the big board? Okay, well, I can see all of you. I mean, we're not sure why that is happening. So, uh, okay, great. So, first we'll go to Supervisor Solis, followed by Supervisor Barbara. Supervisor Solis. Thank, yes, thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you, Supervisor Kuehl, for holding the report. Um, and I really want to give a big shout out to the leadership of the Women and Girls Initiative. Abby Land, you've been tremendous. You helped to motivate so many people to really do all that they could and not just come up with problems, but with solutions, whether it was on homelessness, lack of childcare, workforce opportunities, domestic violence, all of these things, I believe the governing council brought to bear, but they took these issues head on. And I really want to thank you for that. I especially want to thank also the chair of the governing council, my commissioner, B. Stotzer, who has always constantly brought up some great ideas about making sure that we collect the data do a better job of collecting the data from our departments as well. 
And also want to uh, thank Kath, uh, Kathy Spiller, who also is one of my commissioners and a friend to many of us, I believe, who really uh, brought up the uh, challenges of hiring women in not just the fire department, but the sheriff's department as well, and trying to make improves, improvements there, especially with respect to post-training. So I think that we have a ways to go. This is a good template for us. And I look forward to working with all the women and all the appointees. And even though Supervisor Cooley, Kill, you may not be here after November. We know we're still going to hear your voices loud and clear. So thank you. It wouldn't have been possible without your leadership too. And I want to thank Abby and all the staff for the Women and Girls Initiative. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Barger. Thank you, and and I, I first want to acknowledge you, Supervisor Kuehl. This was a vision, and I know this is something that was near and dear to your heart, and um, this is for you, I know, a passion, and I want to thank you for allowing this board to um, be a part of this, but I also want to thank Abby. I can't think of anyone better suited to be at the lead of helping us um, shepherd this through, and I want to acknowledge my appointees, Alice Petrosian, Angela Underwood-Jacobs, and Jennifer Kwan, for their work on this. But I just, you know, everything that's been said, I agree with 100% um, in terms of what, what really where this is gonna make a difference. But, you know, something that struck me, and I think it's important for us to remember as we implement the recommendations um, in the looking forward, it says girls and women are inherently strong, intelligent, driven, and capable. Uh, they deserve communities, work, workplaces, healthcare, schools, and government, the respect, their dignity and invest in their talents and well-being. And then it says that um, while the Women and Girls Initiative has both a list of significant accomplishments and even more robust list of recommendations, true success will be measured by whether this work is embraced and institutionalized at this county. And I, what I'm hearing today at this board meeting is that we will carry on that and make sure that it is. So again, Abby, thank you for your leadership and doing this. Um, you've been incredible. Um, and I look forward to seeing what comes out of this um, as we implement the recommendations. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Any other comments from uh, members? Let me just give a shout out to some SD2 powerhouses, Anita DeFrance, Araceli Campos, and Sharon Shelton for serving and representing all the residents of the second district and doing this important work. Seeing no further comments, report is, oh, Supervisor Kuehl? I'm sorry, I wanted to thank my commissioners as well, which I did last week, but, um, you know, Wendy Gruel, Kathy Blumenfield, Chris Hershey, uh, who, um, everybody who put in all this work, it's been very, very important, and I thank them all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The report is received and filed. Hearing no objections, such will be the order. <laughs> Item 39, purchase of Taser 7 model tater, tasers, which I held. And I held it because while there should be a less lethal option for probation, pro, for, for probation officers that carry firearms, there must be a specific policy and training plan to ensure that tasers are not abused or misused. This board letter authorizes the purchase of tasers by the probation department for the first time and for tasers to be assigned to armed probation officers. We have seen too many instances where policy and training were inadequate, like in the murder of Dante Wright in Minnesota when then Officer Potter claimed she mistakenly fired her handgun instead of her taser. I want to ensure a policy and training plan that is created and actually does its job and that it's reviewed by the oversight entities before these tasers are considered for use. I'd like to read in an amendment to item 39 as follows to instruct the chief probation officer to draft a policy governing the use of tasers and a plan for appropriate training and submit the draft policy and plan to the Probation Oversight Commission and the Inspector General for their review. Sub A, 
In addition, instruct the PLC and the IG to submit any feedback in writing to the CPO and the board. This policy shall not take effect and TASER shall not be used or issued to personnel for at least 30 days after the PLC and IG have completed their review. This policy shall clarify whether tasers will be used to personnel with fire, issued, excuse me, to personnel with firearms only. Any other comments on the item? Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the original um, motion is to authorize the purchasing agent to proceed to buy 150 Taser 7 model tasers. So I'm not certain where does the training, is the purchase put off until the plan is developed or does the purchase go through but they're not to be deployed until the plan is developed with your amendment? It would ideally, from my perspective, be that the purchase doesn't go through until we actually have a county policy and a training plan that has been reviewed by those two oversight entities. So my concern would be if they are, they're purchased, that then creates a slippery slope that we won't be able to um, uh, halt their distribution um, waiting for a policy and training. Well, I, I applaud the amendment, but I still cannot support this item. Um, I don't really approve of the purchase of these tasers. I wanted to draw the board's attention to item 47, which we approved uh, on consent which was a settlement for $3,840,000 in a case from the Sheriff's Department where deputies used a taser on an individual uh, significantly longer than recommended and that individual died. And so this award was to the minor child of that individual as a wrongful death. So yes, the training might have avoided that, but to call them a le less lethal, it is true. It takes longer to kill someone with a taser than with a gun. But I'm still, I have me doots, as um, a good friend of mine used to say, and so I cannot support this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And just to clarify that I won't be supporting it without the motion language. Um, I agree with you that they are lethal, but from my perspective, recognizing that I think there are about 110 probation officers currently who carry firearms, um, really trying to create another option, as you said, less lethal is questionable, um, but without the uh, amended language that says we have to have training and a drafted policy before they're even purchased, I won't be supporting um, the item either. Questions or comments? Well, I, mean, I was no, no on the amendment. I mean, I was a no on yes, the Yes, I understand. I was just clarifying for you. Um, any other uh, Madam supervisor? Chair, and just to clarify, right, this, these are only going to those that currently carry a firearm. That was my understanding, and I restated that in my in my amendment yeah, as well, just, just to be to very for clear. For the public who is listening to this conversation, yeah, so yes. these are only going to those who are already carrying a firearm as a as an alternative. Uh, um, uh, the amendment language I just read, sub B, it says this policy shall also clarify whether tasers will be issued to only personnel who are already authorized to carry firearms. That was my understanding, but we felt we needed some clarifying language. Madam Chair? Supervisor Solis. Yes, just to clarify then, um, we are not going to move forward in purchasing these tasers until a training plan is in place? That's my desire through the amendment I read in, a training plan and a crafted policy. So that can take up to how many days? 30 days or more? No? I'm not clear on that. Uh, I, I, the amendment doesn't stipulate how much time. What the amendment does stipulate is that it has to be reviewed by our oversight entities. Maybe we should put specific language in that the, uh, that the allocation is not approved until the plan is presented to the board or to yourself or whatever? We, I'll accept that as a friendly amendment to the <clears throat> amendment. Okay. That really is my intention, so if we want to stipulate it, happy to. The allocation will not be approved until 
um, training policy is crafted and has been reviewed by the stated oversight entities. Okay. Like that. Better. Madam Chair. Any other questions or comments? All right, seeing none, hearing no other comments, uh, item 39 as amended is before us. Uh, I will move, seconded by Supervisor Solis to approve this item. Executive Officer, can you call the roll? Item 39 as amended and to clarify that the purchase will not occur until a policy is in effect. And has been reviewed and has uh, been by reviewed. the uh, Probation Oversight Commission and the Inspector General. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Abstain. Abstains. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, <laughs> aye. Motion carries four to zero with one abstention. Item 44, County Code Title II Administration Amendment, um, which I held as well. <clears throat> Exempting guaranteed income payments from determining eligibility for general relief is essential if we are to realize our goals around truly disrupting poverty. Guaranteed income programs have proven to improve educational outcomes, support full-time employment, and improve health outcomes. If the county is to break the cycle of poverty, we can't continue to turn to our same historically underfunded safety net programs to do that in isolation and expect a very different result. On March 31st, LA County residents can begin applying for our county's guaranteed income program. I am proud that the board's vision and commitment has served as an impetus for Breathe, LA County's guaranteed income program, which is on track to being the longest running guaranteed income program in the country. The county will provide 1,000 qualified residents with $1,000 a month for three years after meeting the qualifications, recipients will be selected at random. Guaranteed income provides participants with resources to make important life choices. Where to live, how to invest in a better future through education or starting a small business, and how to best support their children based on their desires and wishes. I look forward to welcoming applications to our county program on March 31st, and for more information, County residents can visit the website, breathe.lacounty.gov. Would anyone like to make any comments about this item? Bless you, Supervisor Hahn. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, I'll, uh, item 44 is before us. I will move, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl, to approve the item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 44 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Item 56A, adopting the probation department recommendation to use Barry J. Nidorf as the permanent location for Secure Track Youth, which was held by Supervisor Barger. Supervisor Barger? Thank you. Um, I, I just had a couple of questions for the department. I don't know if um, Chief Gonzalez is on or Adam. Adam, I see that you're on. Um, why did the department feel the use of Barry J. Nidorf was more the most suitable option for the secured track youth? Thank you, Supervisor Barger. Uh, thank you, Supervisors. Um, just really quickly, um, there was a there's a few different reasons um, that we that we looked into this. Um, Part of it really has to do with um, the location itself. Um, it is more centrally located, um, so it makes it easier for our families to come and visit um, our young people. Um, it, it also um, creates space for our county partners who are already there on site. Um, we, we know that you know we have our mental health providers there, we have LACO there, we have other community-based organizations who are already providing services there. Um, so, so that that was a, definitely part of the calculus. We also have some concerns about capacity. Um, we we know that uh, this morning, as of this morning, we have 25 young people who have been ordered. 
we anticipate that there will be some front front end growth to this population over time. We also um, know that approximately 100 to 120 young people will be returning to Los Angeles County from the Division of Juvenile Justice prior to their sentence being completed. So DJJ plans to close its doors, we hope, in July 2023. We've heard rumors over time that they may do that sooner, which means that, that some young people would be returning to Los Angeles County prior to their sentence being completed. We do not know for certain that they would require secure youth treatment facility, but we, we don't know for sure. Um, and a lot of this is based on the judge's discretion, right? So probation can make recommendations, others can make recommendations, um, advocates can make recommendations, court appointed advocates, but we don't know if they'll need a secure youth treatment facility or not. And so there may be some back end capacity issues that we're, we're starting to see. And so it is likely that over the next several months, as we, as we seek to continue to, to prepare various sites, that we're going to see a growth to this population that one facility, um, you know, one camp uh, likely will not be able to contain. And so we do have some capacity concerns for sure. So it's going to go beyond the 150 that you estimated is what I'm hearing. No, we don't know that for sure. Now, if, if the other services and supports working together, um, you know, so again, so much of this has to do with judges discretion, even when we talk about the population we have today. So there is a notion, a hope that we can start to shave time off of some of these sentences based on recommendations that we may make to the bench, but we don't know that for sure because it is the judge's discretion. So some of our young people are being sentenced um, in order to, to um, kind of a juvenile max sentence. Um, some of them may do seven or eight years with us, unfortunately. Now the good news is that they won't go to state prison, but the notion that we will be able to shave time off of those sentences, uh, we do not know if that's going to if that's actually going to happen. And the other part of it, right, is attrition just looks different with this population. We know that our hall and camp population now moves through the system a lot quicker. Um, we're going to have these young people for many years. So we do think between 100 and 150, um, but we cannot really anticipate all that well. Um, what this pop, how this population is going to grow over over the years? Because again, it's new policy. We haven't done this before. So, and, and I don't know if you can answer this, but what is a timeline and process in order to achieve a home like uh, renovations at Scott Kilpatrick versus Barry J? Do you have an estimate? So we have some rough estimates. The other, you know, the the cost, the estimates that that we've shared with your offices are also a little bit rough right now. So. One of the things that we absolutely do not want to do is create a Los Angeles County version of Division of Juvenile Justice, right? So we do not want to be in the business of warehousing these young people. If we take a look at camp, let's take Camp Scott by itself as an example. Mm -hmm. That is an old camp, right? It was built in, I think, 1959 or 1960. It is a large barrack style living unit we would really want to make some renovations to that space because again we don't want to throw a bunch of young people in in a space that's not therapeutic that's not conducive to to a program that we really um, are imagining here and so it will take some renovation when we talk about timeline and time frame depends on a lot of different things um, we were quoted roughly uh, around the barry j project that we're looking at between 24 to 30 months because it really is a massive renovation to that site. We are not envisioning that that site look um, anything that, like the way it looks now, the way that we see it now. And so it will take some time. It will also take significant capital investment, um, whether we whether we focus on Barry J itself or we focus on uh, Camp Scott, um, even Camp Kilpatrick, there's some, there's some renovation and enhancement that would need to be done over there as well. So on 56B, um, it's, a plan that includes a timeline and budget modifications for a home-like environment at Barry Nydorf Juvenile Hall, including the demolition of the compound. Is that similar to what you're proposing at Camp Scott? So we would not want to demolish anything at Camp Scott. We would use existing structures because that'll that'll speed the work up, right? So we have a living unit that we know we can work with. We have dining quarters we know we can work with. Um, Camp Scott does have the benefit of individual rooms um, 
we know honestly, and this this is coming from our advocates more than it is coming from our own staff. We have some young people right now who have been ordered to uh, secure youth treatment facility who are not ready to work a program. So they're causing a lot of, of different issues right now in the compound. We've had to, in fact, separate them from um, part of the other population so that we can actually try to, to run some programming. So the use of individual rooms is going to be really beneficial. We also know in talking to young people that they prefer some privacy. So again, we're not proposing at Camp Scott or, or frankly at Barry J that we would be building new structures. The idea would be to renovate the existing structures because we think the bones are good, um, but we really do need to do something serious inside those buildings um, to create a much softer, less carceral environment. Because I, I was actually quoting the motion that says demolition of the compound. So that, that's where I got that thought process. So um, whether we demolish it or we use existing buildings, we believe, probation believes the the fencing needs to come down, that we need to absolutely rebrand it, the serpentine wire, all of that needs to come down, and, and that will come down regardless of, of what's decided around security treatment facility. So what was the population of Barry Nidorf last week, and with the addition of the Central Juvenile Hall, what is the population now being housed at Barry Nidorf? So we moved, I believe it was 130 young people from Central Juvenile Hall to Barry J over the weekend. Um, so our population prior to that, I think today the population is is about 290. Um, don't ask me to do math on the spot. Um, so the population uh, almost doubled. Um, so we would have been at you know 160 last week. We added 135. Now it's it's closer to, to 290. And with the closure of Central Juvenile Hall, that will make Barry Nidorf the permanent um, placement for these youth. Correct? Should Central I mean, Juvenile Hall close. Aside from moving out to the camps, but you just talked about the camps capacity and then the long-term uh, uh, individuals we're going to have. So, so should we close Central Juvenile Hall? It would make it would make building any SYTF site at Barry J pretty complicated. But we know that Barry J's rated for closer to between 500 and 600 young people. And so the rated capacity of Barry J is far higher than what we have even today. But uh, there, it certainly would create some operational um, concerns for us as we, as we would seek to sort of do the renovations in a modular fashion, meaning move young people out of one unit, renovate it, move the young people in, and then go to the next building. So it would create some operational concerns for us. And then my last question is, what is the projection of, I mean, are we seeing more youth coming in? Um, so right now we doubled the um, population. What is your expectation or what are you seeing in terms of trending um, of the youth coming into our system in the halls? So there's still a lot of really good work happening um, to divert as many young people as we possibly can. Um, so the notion that we're taking in low level offenders um, which I've heard floated about, it just isn't the case. Um, our youth that are coming to us are coming with significant needs. Um, these are high risk, high needs youth. Uh, we have seen a little bit of an uptick um, in the last couple of months, but not significant. R remember, we were over 500 prior to COVID. As I stated today, we're under 300 at the moment. We sincerely hope that the population does not continue to increase, but, um, as we've seen, you know, historically here, we, we don't know exactly what will happen. And again, probation is, is receiving these kids from local law enforcement through the courts, all of that. And so we're hoping that the population remains low because it, it affords us a lot of flexibility to do uh, better work by our young people. Um, the other issue that may be caused is, you know, a couple of years ago in the Saddle Ridge fire, we had to evacuate Barry J. So in an instant, we had to move at the time, 300 kids out of there. Um, and so when we, we are committed to decreasing our footprint, when we start to lose flexibility um, in some of the other locations, we, we do have concerns that should we have to evacuate for earthquake or fire or some other natural disaster, it limits our ability to do that safely. Right, and I know Supervisor Kuehl remembers having to do that up at Kilpatrick. I mean, I think that all of our camps are located in areas that are up against the mountains or in in areas that are at risk of fires. And so I do know that that's something that's not unique to Barry J or even Kilpatrick. It, it, it's, you know, at Afrobot, Page, and even Scott. So I appreciate that. And then I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it with this. Um, 
you know, in this motion, I, I feel like this validates the vision for the future of Barry J. It says it can be transformed. And um, and I, I find the language interesting because that's actually very much what I'm saying. And now that we've transferred um, and doubled the population at a facility that quite frankly today with public comment and the advocates and even some of my colleagues um, being so critical of Barry Nidorp and it should be torn down, it's just interesting that now we're having a discussion about the fact that we just doubled the population and are looking to flatline um, a facility um, that that actually um, takes some of those youth that are now going to be um, housed at Barry Nidorp. But you don't have to answer that, Adam. Um, but I just want to thank you um, because I know that you've gone out um, into the community and taken a lot of heat from especially my constituents in Laverne, but also in Santa Clarita. And you have always conducted yourself as a professional, um, providing the facts and educating the constituents. As I said earlier, my issue is not with the individuals being placed, but where they are being placed. Um, and I just appreciate so much um, your professionalism and, and the job that you're doing. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor. I appreciate that very much. Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Adam, I also want to get, uh, show you my gratitude. I think um, everybody's kind of struggling to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the facilities are not cooperating in, in, a, in a way. So, but my question is, uh, Barry J is not actually approved for permanent placement. That's, is that correct? Because what Supervisor Barger said was that we would need to ask the DSCC Mm -hmm. to approve it for permanent placement. Is that correct? So the, you get into some Title 24 regulation issues. Should we should we change, um, you know, mixed populations or, or change the purpose of the facility? It is something where we would simply notify them. I think a lot of other counties are doing exactly this because, again, it's new, right? And, and Unfortunately, other counties don't have the, the option of using existing facilities or empty facilities. And so a lot of folks are mixing populations, unfortunately. Um, it is simply a notification. So, so let's say, for example, we were to move young people to Kilpatrick tomorrow, we would be mixing those two populations and we would have to notify BSCC that we're doing that. So it has, it has more to do with just our notification to them that, hey, this is something that's happening now. Uh, BSCC is aware that we have young people who have been ordered to see your secure youth treatment facility in Barry J. Um, and so it's, a uh, again, it, it, it creates operational problems, certainly, but in terms of regulatory but, problems, as long as we're communicating clearly, I think we're okay. I, I think you're mixing apples and oranges, if I may respectfully say, uh, notifying them that we're mixing populations at a site appropriate for permanent placement is different than notifying them that we're going to do permanent placement at a site that is not supposed to be, that is a hall, that is, that's a different function for Central and Barry J than for the camps. Other counties don't have the same kind of uh, options. Uh, the other thing you said about Scott is that it already has individual uh, rooms, but um, Barry J in the plan that was presented by the chief, uh, that I believe is what uh, Supervisor Barger wants to approve. It was just one big, like, bunk bed house. I mean, it was one. It wasn't separate rooms uh, at Barry J for the DJJ youth. Am I no, actually, it is. It is the proposal is to have individual rooms for for our young people at Barry J. So you would take a living unit um, and essentially convert it. What what the idea would be to shrink the living unit so you don't have quite as many beds. And that creates an option to create more living space. And then you can have behavioral health, credible messengers, other community-based organizations housed right there in the unit. So it limits the, the but, but rooms. Has DSCC already said that we're out of compliance in a lot of ways? I mean, it sounds like, okay, T.S. Eliot said, between the idea and the action falls the shadow. And it seems to me there's a major shadow in the possibility of what's going to happen, what could happen at Barry J. So, um, I think getting the permission to do permanent placement there, it wouldn't really have to be granted. I mean, I've talked to DSCC leadership uh, uh, just to get a sense, you know, of what generally they're looking at in the state. Um, so those were my two questions. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Of course. Any other questions, comments? 
One question, Adam, I have, you know, I think it's alarming that an institution could be um, in a, a state, that a state agency, you know, issues warnings, we knew it was unsuitable, but then comes in and over a weekend directs the immediate removal of children. And I know Barry J is on the unsuitable list too. What do you think the timing is, since we're already uh, on the in trouble list in the eyes of the BSCC, that they could come in and say the same thing about Barry J? Um, we think, honestly, that Barry J is in much better shape. We've done um, some internal analysis of, of uh, some of the things that were under corrective action at, at Central Juvenile Hall. So we, though, we had some serious concerns about what was happening at Central Juvenile Hall. Uh, we do not have the same concerns at Barry J. Uh, they're there. Uh, we have folks uh, visiting this week, in fact, so we should have some, some more information shortly about how we're doing, but we do believe um, we believe that moving the young people to Barry J and doing the review at Barry J was the right move. We're hoping to get back to Central as soon as possible. Um, we, we hope to do some, some renovation to the site and, and, and do some, some training for some of our staff there to, to get them prepared to have young people back at Central. Um, we've instructed staff 90 days. We hope to do it much sooner than that. And again, the BSCC will have to opine whether or not uh... Central Hall is um, safe and appropriate to return children to? That's correct, Supervisor. Once we move young people back, they will come out at that time and do another review. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Seeing none, item 56A is before us. Moved by Supervisor Barger and seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve this item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 56A is before you, Supervisor Solis. No. Supervisor Solis, no. Supervisor Kuehl. No. Supervisor Kuehl, no. Supervisor Hahn. No. Supervisor Hahn, no. Supervisor Barger. Absolute yes. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. No. Supervisor Mitchell, no. Motion fails, one to four. We'll move uh, on Madam to- Chair Yes. May I just say, I think it, we could represent, represent Supervisor Hahn's second as a courtesy second, um, just for the record, so that there could be a vote, because she did vote no. Certainly. If, if that's okay. That's fine with me. Because otherwise it would have died for lack of a second, and, you know, I, at least we took a vote on it. Uh, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Of course. Item 56B, Future of Central Juvenile Hall, Feasibility Study and Plan, which was held by Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Solis? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I'd like to also thank uh, my co-author, Supervisor Kuehl, for supporting this motion. It, it's a very important um, motion, and it's so timely to come before us right now, since we know that our juvenile halls, especially Central Juvenile Hall was uh, evacuated uh, in the last, what, 48 hours. Uh, we know that this, this is going to impact Barry, uh, Barry J. We've already heard that, but I hope that it's only temporary. And that's why I thank Supervisor Kuehl for agreeing to be my co-author on this. I wanna be clear though, that this motion is about a separate population of youth. Items 10 and 56A were about our secure track youth who are likely to stay in a facility for a longer period of time and perhaps for some years, unfortunately. The youth who we're discussing in this motion, item 56B, are our predisposition youth. These youth can only be placed at our hall per law as Supervisor Kuehl clearly articulated earlier, not a camp. And as it stands, there's only two halls in the entire county, Central Juvenile Hall and Barry J. Also, I want to, <clears throat> I want to, uh, Note that the DOJ settlement that the county has entered into was due to a lack of programming and educational services and poor treatment of predisposition youth. It was not to improve permanent placements like secure youth, track youth, but for temporary housing for our predisposition youth. And I can confirm what they found because I, on several occasions over the last seven years, have had countless visits to Central Juvenile Hall many, many times. And there are simply no repairs that can improve the well-being of our youth who are there. 
Additionally, the motion before you should not come as a surprise to the board or to probation department, because over the years, even as far back as the 90s, there's been discussions and even potential plans for the closure of Central Juvenile Hall. And I also wanna say the closure of certain camps and halls are not new to this board. As the motion preamble lists, many of the supervisors on this board have closed and repurposed camps and halls in their respective districts, such as, as an example, Camp Gonzalez, which closed in 2017 to soon become a fire camp for formerly incarcerated youth. And I'm happy to work with Supervisor Kuhl on that effort to bring new opportunities at, for our youth at that camp. Los Padrinos Juvenile Hall and Supervisor Hans District closed in 2019 after serious allegations of low staff morale and staff abusing incarcerated youth. In the fall of 2020, a portion of the facility was converted into a crisis bridge housing program for young women who were experiencing homelessness. Camp Challenger and Supervisor Barger's district was closed in 2019 to be converted into a residential vocational center for young adults ages 18 through 25. Seeing these closures of the juvenile hall and camps and knowing they will be repurposed to provide better opportunities for our residents and vulnerable communities in LA County rather than incarcerating youth is something that I'm proud to be a part of. Given the board's attention and involvement on almost all the probation camps and halls over the last several months, and especially today, it was incumbent on me to bring to the table a study on what the future of Central Juvenile Hall should be. This hall specifically has been the center of criticism, lawsuits, consent decrees, failed inspections, and subject of grand jury reports since 1999. The solution isn't, in my opinion, to throw more money at it, uh, put more coats of paint on the walls, or even continue with Band-Aid solutions, but a more permanent plan. Our youth deserve more, and so do our staff that have to work there. The timing of the conversation is ideal right now because of the recent BSCC inspection and the BSCC's expectation of their probation department. Unfortunately, the probation department again failed to meet the BSCC standards and in response, currently all our youth from Central Juvenile Hall were transferred to Barry J over the weekend. This transfer was done without advance notification to some staff and the parents largely because of how quickly BSCC wanted probation to be responsive to, pend to a pending inspection. And I'm especially grateful to our friends at the Anti-Recidivism Coalition that showed up to alleviate anxieties with the youth who had no time to acclimate to this transfer and to assist staff with the confusion that resulted. I heard that the executive director and his team were there from eight in the morning to almost three in the afternoon providing help and assistance. Colleague Central Juvenile Hall has been around since 1912, when it was the county's first permanent juvenile correctional facility, and it has only turned into an unfortunate blight on our county's history. But now that its cells have been emptied and the youth transferred to Barry J, we're presented with, I believe, an opportunity. And this is an opportunity to reimagine youth justice and look to Central Juvenile Hall through a feasibility study to see how we can shift it away from being used to incarcerate youth to turn it into a real asset for the residents of LA County. Central Juvenile Hall, as you know, is located near the campus of our LAC USC hospital, a place associated with healing, but Central Juvenile Hall could not be farther from a place of healing. So let's change that, let's reimagine it. Colleagues, I humbly ask for your I vote. Thank you, Supervisor. Any comments or questions? Supervisor Barger. Thank you. Um, so, 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 I don't know if this is for um, uh, Chief Gonzalez or for you. Your motion asked for 120 day, correct? And Chief Gonzalez is saying 90 days move, moving out of the central jail or central juvenile hall. So what happens between the 90 and the 120? I would, I would say that the central, I'm sorry. No, I would say that I believe just hearing from our probation department that they are trying to move quickly because they are, they are obviously going to be meeting with uh, the SCC staff to, to make sure that things are accommodated there appropriately at uh, Central Juvenile Hall. My, my sense is that um, they are making some adjustments 
but I want to make sure that they're done correctly. And I think that our chief should help to respond to that. I hope he's on board. Chief sure. Gonzalez. Uh, Supervisor, so yes, I'm, I'm going to call. I, yeah. I don't think I'm on the screen. Can you hear me? That's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, we're hoping to be able to come back and make those repairs that we identified uh, from the April, I think, 15 meeting with the POC. There was some areas that we needed to address, for example, the plumbing, the electrical, some areas of concern regarding uh, um, mold that was supposed to be identified, uh, and then make some, some repairs to the facility um, to be able to bring the, the youth back before the 90 days. And during this time, I think we can do the uh, feasibility study that's due in 120 days uh, thereafter. So, the so basically, is, Chief, right. you're saying that um, we don't intend on having these these uh, youth at uh, Barry J for 120 days. It's going to be right. less than that. Is that is that what you're articulating? Yes. Okay, and you can continue with you can begin the feasibility study and and make those uh, arrangements, repairs, and anything else that's necessary. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Okay, that, that was my clarification, because if he's moving the children back in 90 days, that tells me the feasibility study may take 120 days. I just I was trying to get a clarification because my my understanding of this motion was that you want to permanently close um, Central Juvenile Hall, correct? It's a feasibility study that will direct us. It will tell us what to do. And well, you have to keep in keep in mind feasibility means what does that mean? It could mean shrinking the footprint since we don't have that many youth coming back down in that manner. And think about it. These are predisposition youth. These aren't the, these are, these are a different population. It was never meant to be a place where people should be more than a month, more than six months or even two years. And I found on several occasions when I, when I have visited that facility, we've had some cases where children have been there for two years. It's incredible that our system is broken. So I'm not surprised that the state is looking at us and saying, hey, wait a minute, we all have to work, we all have to work from the same page here. And I think it's about time. It doesn't mean displacement of our staff either. It means that we have to prioritize and do a better job of how we spend our taxpayer dollars, and especially when we're charged by law to take care of these young people. So that's simply what my motion is. When we had a previous uh, probation officer there who left Terry McDonald. We were already looking at a feasibility study for this particular site, but we didn't, we, we weren't able to move quick enough at that time and she left. But I was already on that trajectory to start to look at that because it's a big campus. We can do so many other things. It's underutilized right now. I'm looking at potential possibilities to create housing there for families that, that are impacted, uh, not just by probation, but are, are impacted by uh, homelessness, domestic violence, and what have you. So there are opportunities. We're doing that now with LAC USC and other properties around the county where many of us are looking at how to repurpose our assets. So it's okay. again reimagining. That's all. Okay. And I appreciate it because that helps me because in the motion it says successful closure and demolition of Central Juvenile Hall. But that you're not talking about the entire hall. You're talking about possibly shrinking the footprint is one of the feasibility well, studies. The so feasibility it's not about demolishing Central well, Juvenile the, Hall. The feasibility study will help inform us. And as you know, the population has been shrinking. It, and it's, it was built in 1912. My God, if you go in there on any given day, it, it horrifies me. When I think about uh, the time I visited Men's Central Jail and then go into our East Lake facilities, I, I, I can't see necessarily the difference in some places. To see some of our children having having had to sleep on cement. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't even say they're cots because they're not cots. I agree. Uh, and, and I agree with yeah, that. It just, I just have to tell you, those are, it's, right. it's something that has, has been on my mind for the last seven years. Yeah, and I agree with you, and it's unacceptable as we sit here to even have that taking place now in the current system. And it's something that is deplorable across the board. So I, I don't know that, that a motion should force us to have a department do what's right. But I, I agree with you. I just wanted to get a clarification because it does talk about demolition. And then Chief Gonzalez, what is the average length of time that the youth are spending in our jail pre-disposition? As you heard uh, with um, Supervisor Solis, and we've been there to the house together. She and I have been uh, talking to some of the youth, and they have been there, unfortunately, for a couple of years. Uh, the average time is between 21 days and 31 days is what should happen. Uh, but you know, when, when COVID hit, everything got delayed. 
Uh, we try to keep kids out from coming in. Uh, the course we're going virtual. I think now they're opening up a little bit more. So we're hoping to be able to process the, the use through the judicial system as quickly as possible. Ideally for me, I would say 30 days will probably be like the average. Uh, sometimes when, when the youth needs to have additional work with the public defender, it, it takes a little bit longer. Uh, I have a good relationship with our public defender here in Los Angeles. I think we can work together to make to make that expedited. Uh, so I, I think we can make we can make an enhancements. And I agree the facility is, is so dilapidated that, that it's even bad for the youth, but it's bad for everyone who works there, the doctors and nurses, the officers, our staff, our teachers, every visitors. I mean, it's, just, it's, a, it's a bad place altogether. What, okay, so that's for the predisposition, but what is it for the DJJ youth? Well, that's going to depend on the DJJ use on their commitment and how old they are. It could be, for example, seven, eight years, depending on the age when they committed the offense. That's said by the courts, depending on, on their um, prior prior um, convictions or sentences or commitments, they call it for juvenile commitments. Okay. Um, thank you. And I, I, Adam did say that about the seven to eight years, so I should have caught that. All right. Well, I mean, I, again, I'm just going to say it again. I, I on one hand, we discuss an item where we've got advocates calling in and our board talking about how horrible Barry J is, and now we're going to vote to um, uh, put a home-like environment compliant with the California Department of Justice settlement agreement at Barry J and IDORP. So I guess I guess it's not the message; it's the messenger. And um, I just find it really too bad that we can't be consistent with our message. If we don't like Barry and IDORP, then shut it down. Um, we don't like central, then shut it down. But at this point, it sounds to me that it is um, a foregone conclusion that this is the direction the board's going to go in. And, you know, I, I for one, um, have serious concerns and will continue to object to them. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? On item? Madam Chair, yes, I would just want to say that um, my message has always been clear. <laughs> I think that we should have opportunities for our young people to thrive, even when they are in our care. And I've seen so many countless thousands of young men and young men mostly and young girls too, that we have provided treatment with and seen many of them uh, actually want to to turn to turn a leaf to get into something different. And thank goodness that we have at least staff and, and outside support mental health counselors and some very good instructors too that really care about our kids that are giving them opportunity to think outside beyond the walls that they are confined in. That's what gives me hope. That's what I'm going to be doing as long as I'm here on the board to help provide that and to create a good environment that's healthy, not just for the young people, but for our staff and for their families that want to come visit them and know that they're being cared for adequately without due harm. So thank you very much. Ask for your I vote. Are there any other additional remarks on agenda item 56B? Seeing none, moved by Supervisor Solis, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. 56B is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? No. Supervisor Barger, no. Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries four to one. At this time, we have uh, two offices that would like to speak under specials. First, we'll hear from Supervisor Barger uh, with regard to introducing a reward motion. Supervisor Barger? Madam Chair, go ahead and go to the next one because I'm waiting for it to be handed to me. Okay, got it. Supervisor Hahn will make remarks regarding the Paralympics. I know we have a picture we want to put on screen. There it is. Good. Oh, that's great. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to just take a moment to celebrate something that happened over the weekend. You know, with everything going on and all of us focusing, uh, you know, on what's happening in Ukraine, I think a lot of people miss this. Um, and so many of you know, my scheduler, Tina Quebec, um, and in 2012, her son, Ralph, which is where the arrow is there, um, lost both of his legs in an IED explosion while he served in Afghanistan. And in the years since, he found sled hockey 
and was recruited was recruited to the U.S. men's Paralympic sled hockey team. And on Saturday night, Ralph and Team USA beat Canada five to zero for the gold medal in Beijing. Uh, this is Ralph's uh, de Quebec's second gold medal. He is such an incredible person. He makes his mom so proud, and all of us here uh, in the fourth district office. And we all had so much fun cheering him on this weekend. And you know, all of the members of Team USA have overcome so much in their lives to get to this point, both physical and mental challenges. And it really is inspiring uh, watching them on the ice. And I just wanted to take this moment to congratulate Ralph, uh, all of Team USA, and the uh, incredible victory that they brought home uh, for Team USA. And I also want to give a shout out to Delta Airlines who flew these athletes, uh, all their equipment, uh, and their family members to the watch party uh, in Utah for free. So thank you, Delta Airlines, as well. Go Team USA. Beautiful. Thank you for that, Supervisor Hahn. Supervisor Barger, under special. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm doing a reward establishment in the murders of Andrew Chavez and Cloti Reyes. On Saturday, September 30th, 2017, at approximately 1.46 a.m., 18-year-old Andrew Chavez and his girlfriend, 19-year-old Cloti Reyes, had just left an impromptu birthday party for a friend in East, in the city of uh, Lancaster. As they stood outside talking with friends on the street, a black sedan drove northbound on 6th Street East. Gunshots were fired from the vehicle into the crowd. The vehicle fled northbound away from the scene. Tragically, both Andrew and Cloti were mortally wounded. Both families who have been helpful during the investigation remain in contact with the investigators, to say the least, are devastated by the loss of these young lives. To date, investigators have received no viable clues regarding this tragedy. The L.A. County Sheriff's Department detectives believe there was witnesses in the neighborhood that may have seen the suspect or suspects leave the area and know their identities. So um, the $20,000 approved reward approved by this board on March 27, 2018, expired June 24th. LASD detectives are actively investigating this case and hopeful that the reestablishment of this award reward will bring forth witnesses who may have information on this tragic double homicide. I therefore move that the board reestablish the reward offering the amount of 20,000 in exchange for information leading to the arrest and or conviction of the perpetrator or perpetrators involved in the heinous murders of Andrew Chavez and Cloti Reyes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And uh, this is uh, an item that we'll actually vote on today. And so uh, again, it's the reward reestablishment in the murders of Andrew Chavez and Clody Reyes. It'll be moved by Supervisor Barger. I will second it. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. 58A is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Uh, now's the time it would be appropriate for us to hear adjournments. Uh, based on our cycle, um, I will begin this week um, representing the second district and we'll proceed in numeric order. Uh, and Supervisor Solis will round us out. I move that when we adjourn today, well, first of all, let me just say that we received a request from Asian Americans Advancing Justice actually reminding us that it was a year ago tomorrow where we experienced a horrific mass shooting uh, in Atlanta, Georgia that took in Atlanta, Georgia that took the lives of eight people, six of whom were um, Asian American women. And I think we all remember that really sort of launched the anti-Asian hate kind of movement across the country. And so tomorrow is the one year anniversary and we want to acknowledge that we don't stand for hate of any type. When we adjourn today, I ask that we adjourn in memory of Gwendolyn Green. Ms. Green was born on April 22nd, 1925, and passed away February 4th, 2022, in South LA at the age of 96. She will be remembered 
and revered as a dedicated civil rights activist who worked as an administrative assistant at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. She planned rallies, speaking engagements, and fundraising events. She was also selected by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to help his trusted aide, the Reverend Hosea Williams, with an ambitious voter registration project. She helped to coordinate voter registration events in 1965 and organized community members in the Western region for the historic March on Washington, the largest gathering of civil rights activists of its time. She also worked as an assistant director for the Summer Community Organization and Political Education Project, where she continued to apply pressure on Congress to pass the historic Voting Rights Act and to raise awareness and garner support for the African-American right to vote, registering an estimated 49,000 voters by the end of the summer of 1965. She worked with Ophelia McFadden to establish the Home Care Workers Union, SCIU, known then as Local 43B, and of course known now as Local 2015. She was a proud member of the New Frontier Democratic Club, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and SCIU. In addition to her immeasurable contributions to the civil rights movement, she will be remembered for her sweet spirit, her fierce advocacy, and wisdom. She is survived by her daughter, Robin Green, as well as a host of extended family, friends, SCIU members, all of us who will miss her tremendously. When we adjourn today, I move that we adjourn in memory of Nuni Obalusi. Ms. Obalusi was born August 9, 1954 in St. Louis, Missouri and passed away unexpectedly on the 1st of March at the age of 67. She discovered a passion for art while she was a student at Horace Mann Middle School and after graduating from high school enrolled at LA Southwest College where she later graduated with an associate in fine arts degree in 1976. She was socially conscious and wanted her artwork to reflect the history and lived experiences that African Americans faced during that time. Olabisi was known for her powerful style of expressive figurations of blackness. Her mural, Freedom Won't Wait, featured close-ups of black faces winced in pain to reflect a community desperate to be heard after the 1992 civil unrest. Her most notable painting, To Protect and Serve, was unveiled in 1996 and was one of the first paintings to address the history of police brutality in the city. It is also an homage to the black radical organizing embodied by Huey Newton, Angela Davis, and other members of the Black Panther Party. Ms. Olabisi believed that, the art, that art was a tool for connecting people with different backgrounds and experiences. She enjoyed how her artwork brought communities together and sparked difficult conversations regarding race and injustice. She was a winner of the coveted California Community Foundation Visual Artist Fellowship, and she will be remembered as a well-known, as a well-renowned artist and muralist in South Los Angeles who had over 30 years of experience. Ms. Olabisi leaves behind to cherish her memory her son, Oradande and grandson Jabari, as well as a host of extended family, friends, and fellow artists who will keep her memory alive through her artwork. I move today that when we adjourn, we adjourn in the memory of Eleanor Simmons Wallace. Ms. Wallace was born in 1952 in Detroit and passed away this past February here in LA at the age of 69. She began her career at Frank D. Parent Elementary School in Inglewood as a volunteer in 1981 and later in 1993 became their first African-American algebra teacher. Ms. Wallace was committed to her students both inside and outside of the classroom. She served on the student's site council, attended PTA meetings, and coordinated summer and after school programs such as the Summer Bridge Program and the Algebra Club, which provided tutoring services. She often said, if students don't learn the way I teach, I will teach the way they learn a model that truly encompassed her style of teaching that was tailored to meet each child's individual needs. She will be remembered for her 41 years of services as a passionate and dedicated educator who left a lasting impact on students, family, and staff at Frank D. Parent Elementary School. She will also be remembered for her beautiful smile, positive spirit, compassion for others, and her heart for community service. She leaves behind to cherish her memory her loving husband, Olden, 
two children, Akilah and Hakeem, and a host of extended family, friends, colleagues, former algebra students, and her proud soars of the Mu Lambda Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, who will all miss her dearly. Moving on to SD3. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Ellen Jimenez, who worked for our Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services for more than 40 years. And uh, if it is to your liking, perhaps all five of us might join in since she was of such great service to our department. She began by working with abused and neglected children, continued her career in Children's and Family Service in Dependency Court, and as a court officer with judges and hearing officers to ensure the safety and protection of our children. Ellen's love of classical and other music knew no bounds. The Music Center was her second home. For many years, she and her husband, a Oaxacan folk art expert, sat on the board of the Gene Autry Museum, enabling the acquisition and display of native arts. She survived by her husband, Federico. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Alan Ladd Jr., producer and movie executive who died on March 2nd. Son of actor Alan Ladd, grew up in LA, later served in the US Air Force, spent a number of years in London working in the British film industry. On returning to the US, he became an executive at 20th Century Fox, where he fought for the studio to make Star Wars. Can you imagine having to convince someone to make Star Wars? And was one of its most enthusiastic supporters during production. He later founded his own production company, The Lad Company, as well as working as an executive at MGM United Artists. He produced films including Braveheart, for which he won an Academy Award, Police Academy, The Brady Bunch Movie, and The Man in the Iron Mask. Many hit movies were released during his tenure as an executive, including Moonstruck, Thelma and Louise, Blade Runner, and The Right Stuff. He was an extraordinarily creative man. Survived by his daughters, Kellyanne, Tracy, and Amanda, and his brother, David. And I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Nora Ross, who died on March 11th. At Valley Cultural Foundation, where she held the title of CEO, Nora's work and the staff she trained and collaborated with brought her great joy. She was a pillar of the community, an innovator, and the driving force behind all the community service programs that Valley Cultural Foundation brought to our San Fernando Valley. During the pandemic, she made strides in bringing programs to the community when the community needed it most. She survived by her husband, Jay, her daughter, Meredith, and her niece, Erica. And finally, I ask when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of actor Mitchell Ryan, who died on March 4th. He began a stage career, including work on Broadway after serving in the US Navy. And after several small TV appearances, he broke out with a role on Dark Shadows. Some viewers knew Ryan best for his starring role on the sitcom, Dharma and Greg, and for his role as the villainous general, Peter McAllister, in Lethal Weapon. Other notable TV appearances uh, were on Wings, LA Law, West Wing, Star Trek Next Gen, and The Golden Girls. He also served as president of the Screen Actors Guild Foundation. He survived by his wife, Barbara, and their stepdaughter, Denise. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Christopher Castillo, who was only 23 when he passed away. He was a senior at Tebro College in Hillsboro, Kansas, and was majoring in criminal justice. Christopher was a member of the Tebro football team and will be remembered as a dedicated and positive teammate and fierce competitor on the field. He will always be remembered for his positive can-do attitude, his smile that lit up a room. I worked very closely with Christopher's mother, LAPD Deputy Chief Amada Tingridis, um, and his stepfather, retired Deputy Chief Phil Tingridis, when I was on the Los Angeles City Council. 
They were both part of the creation of the Watts Gang Task Force. My thoughts and prayers are with them and their family. Christopher is also survived by his father, LAPD officer Jesus Castillo, sister Amaya, stepmother Maria, stepsisters Jamie, Madison, Brianna, Ashley, and Corey, and stepbrothers Nicholas and Grant. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Giovanni, Chef Gio, uh, Del, Rosa, Ari, Del Rosario. Uh, Chief Gio was a beloved member of the LA Harbor College community. Chef Gio was the founder and director of the culinary arts program at Harbor College and a great force in the universe. He stayed at teaching just a few cooking class. He started uh, teaching just a few cooking classes and turned it into a full-time degree granting culinary program. He was a gifted and inspiring educator and mentor and zealous community partner. He received many awards for his work in education including Vocational Teacher of the Year in 2001 and Educator, Educator of the Year in 2004. Chef Gio's influence continues to motivate all those whose lives he touched and he will be greatly missed. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Jack Orr, who was a longtime Lakewood resident uh, and he passed away at the age of 100. Jack joined the US Army Corps Air Corps in 1942 and served as a pilot in World War II. After the war, Orr worked at McDonnell Douglas in Long Beach, helping build planes and working on Rockwell International Space Shuttle programs as an engineer. In retirement, he spent his time as an amateur radio operator, volunteering on the Queen Mary. Jack was preceded in death by his wife, Margaret. He is survived by his daughters, Dorothy and Diane. And I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Joyce McCracken, who was 89 years old when she passed away, and a mother of one of my best friends, uh, Marilyn McCracken. Uh, she was, as a young, she was born uh, in um, Reno, Nevada, uh, but as a young adult, she moved to Sacramento to attend Sacramento City College nursing program and received her nursing degree. She spent over 40 years working for Mercy General Hospital on J Street as an operating room nurse. And there she developed a training program for graduating nurses interested in the OR. She was active in her professional organization, Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses, serving at least one year as their president. And while her family, while raising her family and working full time, she went back to school to study at Sacramento State and received her BA in Humanities. She loved teaching not only nursing, but she was a beloved Sunday school teacher who wrote curriculum for Bible lessons and taught adult Bible studies for many years. She was a requested Bible lecturer and was known as the Bible answer lady. Uh, she was knowledgeable and a scholar of God's word and was ready to answer it as it was written on her heart. She was an accomplished writer. Several of her spiritual articles were published in Christian magazines. Um, and after retirement, she volunteered at her time at church and also reading to elementary age children at a local school. She traveled uh, as a nurse to Guatemala on medical missionary trips, still utilizing her skills to help and heal. She had a heart for service in all she did. She is survived by her three daughters. All three of them are dear friends of mine, Marilyn McCracken, Kathy Jeffries, and Laura Brothers and also her sister, Peggy of Portland, Oregon. May she rest in peace. I was lucky to know her. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Supervisor Barger. Thank you. I move that when we adjourn today, we do so in memory of Gary William Andrews, a longtime resident of Glendora, who recently passed away on February 18th at the age of 75. He operated the long established business, Andrews Inc. in Glendora. Gary was merchant in the Glendora Village for almost 49 years, where he was a board member of the Glendora Village Business Improvement District for many years. In 2019, Gary and his wife, Connie, were named Glendora Citizens of the Year. Gary proudly served in, Cal in the California National Guard for 38 years, retiring in 2006 uh, with the rank of uh, uh, Command Sergeant Major. 
He always considered the Army his family. He survived by his wife and business partner, Connie. Also, that we adjourn a memory of Sarah Nell Floyd, a longtime resident of Saugus, who passed away at the age of 90. She was born and raised in Mississippi during the Great Depression. She attended Millsaps College in Jackson to pursue her bachelor's degree in education. She married and moved to Downey, California, where she earned her master's degree in education from Cal State University, Long Beach. After a short time in Alabama, she returned to California and settled in Saugus, where she taught third and fourth grade in the Saugus Union School District. She retired briefly, then returned due to a shortage of teachers. She was an active member of the Santa Clarita Methodist Church and volunteered at the Santa Clarita Valley Food Pantry, Hart Park, Henry Mayo Newhall Hospital, and the Santa Clarita Performing Arts Center at the College of the Canyons. Sarah is survived by her sons, Obery and Kip, and her brother, Sam. Also, we adjourn a memory of Donna Gibbons, a longtime Burbank Unified School District teacher who passed away at the age of 63. Donna began working for Burbank Unified at Bret Hart School uh, Children's Center in 1979. And in 1982, she moved to the log cabin at Roosevelt Elementary School and started an institution that continues today. Donna made sure that every child was acknowledged, valued, and respected. She set strong boundaries that kids appreciated because they were fair and respectful. Her creativity was endless. She would read Little House on the Prairie books and afterwards have the children make their own butter. She taught them the value of charity and service by teaching the kids how to sew so they could make stockings for patients at the children's hospital. She <clears throat> imparted her lifelong love of books by choosing great ones to read at story time. She was a teacher not only to the children, but also to the parents, fellow teachers, and friends, and she will be missed by many. Also, we're gonna adjourn in memory of Katie Meyer, a Burbank native who passed away at the young age of 22. Katie was a senior at Stanford University majoring in international relations and was a goaltender and captain for the university's women's soccer team. She was fiercely competitive and her friends described her as a larger than life team player. She survived by her parents, Gina and Steven, older sister, Samantha, and younger sister, Sienna. May she rest in peace. Also, we adjourn in memory of Rudy Pavini, a longtime resident of Santa Clarita who passed away at the age of 87. He grew up in Worcester, Massachusetts, where he attended elementary, junior, and high school. He enlisted in the Naval Reserves, where he served before being called up to active duty. He attained the rank of third class petty officer and served on the USS Coral Sea. During a humanitarian mission in 1956, the USS Coral Sea picked up several thousand Hungarian freedom fighters and refugees who were escaping the Soviet forces and brought them to safety in France. During their next mission, they helped evacuate Americans fleeing Egyptian borders after Egypt tried to nationalize the Suez Canal. After serving in the US on the USS Midway, he was honorably discharged from the US Navy, completing six years of service. He was a natural artist who studied at the Boston School of Fine Art. And then as moved to Southern California, he began taking classes at what is now the California Institute of Arts. He married and he and his wife taught art, music, and drama in schools throughout the Santa Clarita Valley. After his wife passed away, he continued drawing and teaching and even painted an intricate mural at the Placentia County Center. Another passion he pursued was dancing, and it was through dance that he met his fiance, Tommy. They became dance partners and for the last decade could be seen dancing at the Santa Clarita Valley Senior Center and social and church events throughout the valley. Rudy survived by his four children, Amado, uh, I'm sorry, Amadou, Jaina, Kitty, and Nicholas, and his fiance, Tommy. And last, I move that we adjourn in memory of Anna Mae Robinson, affectionately known as Kiki, who was a longtime resident of Santa Clarita, who passed away recently at the age of 94. She was born in Orange, New, Zer New Jersey. She graduated from New Jersey State Teachers College with a BA in history, business, English, and secondary school education. She married Wallace Arthur Robinson on June 21st, 1952. They met on the boardwalk, each walking with friends. When Anna Mae told the story of how they met, she said they had eyes for each other, and that was that. Together, they raised 10 children. She began her teaching career in Bakersfield before moving into Santa Clarita Valley, where she ended her career with 25 years of teaching at the William S. Hart Union School High School District. She was a substitute teacher for years while still raising her young children 
and then taught at Placerita Junior High and Sierra Vista Junior High. She was a teacher and lecturer at St. Clair's of Assisi Church in Canyon Country, as well as a parishioner. She traveled widely, filling her dreams of seeing the world. She was also considered the Dodgers' number one fan and never missed a game. Anna May is survived by her 10 children, Robert, Charles, Wendell, Anne, Nanette, Jeannie, Lisa, Scott, John, and Holly. And then my last is that we this I move that the Board of Supervisors adjourn in memory of the following individuals who were identified as indigent veterans by the Los Angeles County Medical Examiner and were subsequently buried with dignity and honor at Riverside Natural Cemetery in the last month. Steve Martin Crachado, Marine Corps, Daryl Leon Brunson, Marine Corps, James Capas, Army, Charles Lee Clark, Marine Corps, Randy Reed Collard, Navy, Timothy Allen, Admister, Army, Ferdell Edmondson Jr., Air Force, Suleiman Edmondson, Army, Vincent Anthony Belzola, Army, Martin Gerardo Finley, Air Force, Michael Renard Gibson, Marine Corps, Harvey Lee Hadley, Army, Tobin Embry Hardwick, Marine Corps, Hans Horderman, Army, Alfred Ray Johnson, Marine Corps, John Patrick Carlson, Army, Dennis William Litwin, Navy, Robert Marks, Army, Dennis Joseph McClellan, Navy, Timothy David Morgan, Navy, Charles Ike Morris, Army, William David Ortiz, Marine Corps, Stephen Charles Cazola, Navy, Percy Frederick Pletch, Army, Dick Russell Richardson, Air Force, Christopher Rivera, Army, Jesse Scott Jr., Air Force, John Shorts Jr., Army, Taylor Lee, I'm sorry, Terry Lee Taylor, Navy, Bernard August Williams, Army, Desmond Edgerton Williams, Army, Thomas Gerald Wilson, Navy, and Alfred Zavela, Army, may their contributions and sacrifices in service to our country never be forgotten. Thank you. Madam Chair, all members on that? Indigent veterans? Absolutely. It's customary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supervisor Solis, your adjourning memory. Yes, thank you so much, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Emilio Delgado. For 44 years, he played Luis Rodriguez, the fix-it shop owner on Sesame Street, inspiring generations of Latino children who saw and heard themselves on one of television's most popular shows. He became a symbol of hope at a time when Latino actors, in his words, were largely consigned to playing bandidos, gang members, low-life characters, and sleeping Mexicans under a cactus. He passed away at the age of 81 after a year-long battle with cancer. Emilio advocated for language access when he became the coordinator of the Sesame Workshops Bilingual Task Talk Force, where he helped add bilingual content to the show. In addition to teaching children about love and family through his character, he introduced millions of people to Spanish words and Latino culture. Emilio holds the record for the longest running role for a Mexican American in a television series. Emilio was born in Calexico, California, and as a boy, he shined shoes and worked at his uncle's bicycle repair shop. He studied theater at California Institute of the Arts, while performing as a guitarist and singing traditional Spanish boleros with Mexican trios. In his early years, he was the artistic director of the Barrio Theater in East LA. He went on to make appearances in many shows other than Sesame Street, including Law and Order, House of Cards, Hawaii Five-O, and Lou Grant. He's survived by his wife, Carol, his daughter, Lauren, and his son, Aram. May he rest in peace. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of David Jesus Godoy. He was a longtime leader in higher education. He spent 35 years as a college educational administrator and director at California State University, Los Angeles, most notably as the assistant vice president for student affairs. Throughout his career, he managed various educational outreach programs, such as the Educational Opportunity Program, known as EOP providing higher education opportunities and resources to first-generation students. He was always the life of a party and never met a plate of food he didn't like, and you could always hear his voice from across any room. David was an incredibly loving and devoted husband to his wife, Maria, of 42 years. She was the love of his life, his best friend, and they are now reunited, dancing again in heaven. 
He's survived by his two children, David and Sonia Godoy, and his five grandchildren, David, Data, Julian, Marcos, and Uriel. May he rest in peace. And lastly, Madam Chair, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Domingo Leon. Domingo was a one-of-a-kind colleague, a loyal friend, advocate, and trailblazer for LA small business community. He was a Peruvian immigrant who earned his master's degree at the University of Texas, Austin, and a doctorate degree at Sp uh, Spain's distinguished National University of Civil Engineering University, Colegio de Ingenieros de Caminos, Canales y Puertos. After spending 12 years working with Bechtel Corporation on major projects, including the Caracas Valenzuela subway and the BART San Francisco subway project, among others, he started De Leon Consulting Engineers. Under his leadership, the firm has played a role in the development of numerous major public infrastructure projects in Southern California. Aside from his passion and dedication to civil engineering, Domingan Domingo was one of the first to knock on doors in the early 90s, demanding equity on behalf of small minority owned businesses. He served on various boards and committees, including Caltrans Small Business Advisory Council and Professional Liaison Committee, the Society for Hispanic Professional Engineers and the Society of Military Engineers, the City of Los Angeles Department of Water and Power and Wastewater Integrated Plan for Year 2020 Committee and the Structural Engineer Association of Southern California. Domingo's son is someone who we all know on this board, Borja Leon, and he's known to many of us and my heart goes out to him and his family at this very difficult time. May his father Domingo rest in peace. Ma Madam Chair, I'd like to ask for all members to, to join me. Thank you. Thank you for that opportunity to join in, Supervisor Lease. Thank you very much. Um, we want to thank you all. We'll uh, take all the motions as seconded. And if there is no objection to a unanimous vote, such will be the action. Executive officer, will you please read us into closed session? In accordance with Brand Act requirements, notice is hereby given that the Board of Supervisors will convene in closed session to discuss item CS1, Department Head Performance Evaluation, as indicated on the posted agenda. Thank you.